All right, uh, good evening everyone. It is August 3rd, 2021, and we are gathered for the monthly voting meeting at the athens Clark County Mayor and Commission. Welcome everyone who is here in person, uh, who's joining us online or via uh, cable television. I'm going to go ahead and ask Clerk Spratlin to call the roll. Here. 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 Present. Here. 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 Handy. Here. We have a call. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right. Uh, we need to approve minutes of meetings of Tuesday, June 1st, Tuesday, June 8th, Tuesday, June 15th, Monday, June 28th, and Tuesday, July 20th. May I have a motion for such approval? So moved. All right. I have a motion from Commissioner Myers. Do I hear a second? Second. All right. I have a second from Commissioner Davenport. All in favor of approval of those minutes, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. All opposed? Same sign? 
All right, hearing none, minutes are approved. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any written communications this evening? No, we have none. All right, thank you. Uh, moving on, we are gonna have several opportunities for resident input. Uh, the first of those will be on the consent agenda in just a couple of moments. The next of those will be on old and new business, and then individually on planning and zoning items. And then at the conclusion of the evening, we have input on any item that is not on tonight's agenda. Uh, uh, when you uh, come to the podium, uh, please be prepared if you could hand your input card to uh, Attorney Drake with the red hair in front of the podium. We appreciate that very much. Um, your, limit, your comments are limited to three minutes. There is a light on Clerk Spratlin's desk that will turn green when it's time for you to begin, yellow when you have 30 seconds remaining, and red when your three minutes have concluded. So uh, the consent agenda tonight are items one through 18. Would any commissioner like to remove an item from consent before we begin? Um, can I remove items eight and 18? All right, uh, we're gonna go ahead and remove eight and 18. All right, let me go ahead and get that. Commissioner Parker, thank you. Uh, any other items, commissioners? Yes, I'm just making sure I have the right one for you, man. And I, I'm sorry, I don't. Um, the, the classic center one, uh, that's 18. That's 18. That's 18. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, uh, we are removing eight and 18 to, uh, old and new business. Um, uh, at this time we'll take resident input on the consent agenda. So those are items one through seven and nine through 17. If anybody would like to speak to one through seven or nine to 17. Now is that time. We, we have agendas that are both online and then on the table uh, outside in the hallway. All right, uh, one through seven or nine through 17. All right, uh, I'd uh, entertain a motion for approval of those items, the consent agenda by any commissioner. So moved. Second. All right, have a motion from Commissioner Wright. Uh, apologize, who was the second? Second from Commissioner Hool for approval of the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, any opposed, same side? All right, consent agenda items are approved. All right, uh, we will now have resident input on old and new business. So those are items eight. Oh, uh, I apologize. Uh, Attorney Drake, could you read the ordinances for those uh, consent agenda items? Yes, Mr. Mayor. It's uh, one through five. Ordinance one. An ordinance to amend the Code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, with respect to all-way stop control at the intersection of Atlanta Avenue and Savannah Avenue and for other purposes. Ordinance 2. An ordinance to amend the Code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, with respect to all-way stop control at the intersection of Boulevard and Hiawassee Avenue and for other purposes. Ordinance 3. An ordinance to amend the Code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, with respect to all-way stop control at the intersection of Barrow Street and Child Street and for other purposes. Ordinance 4. An ordinance to amend the Code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, with respect to sidewalk cafes and for other purposes. Ordinance 5, an ordinance to amend the FY 2022 operating capital budget for Athens, Clark County, Georgia, so as to provide grant funding if awarded from the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, and through the Georgia Department of Transportation, GDOT, for expenses related to rehabilitation and overlay of the taxiway and connecting taxiways, phase two at the Athens Ben Epps Airport and for other purposes. All right, thank you, Attorney Drake. I appreciate you covering those. All right, we're gonna move on to uh, resident input on items eight and 18 through 44. Oh, excuse me, it's uh, eight, 18 through 33, 43 and 44. So again, eight. 18 through 33, 43, and 44. So now is that time you'd like to provide input on any of these items. Again, we just need to know your name, your place of residence, 
And you have uh, three minutes again. The, the light will go on when you begin speaking. Good evening. My name is Joseph Carter. Um, we're out of cards, so I don't have one to... I live at 231 Nakuchi Avenue, Unit 1. I'm here to speak on Item 28, <clears throat> the Unlawful Discrimination Ordinance. <clears throat> According to Section 3 of the Unlawful Discrimination Ordinance, the county manager would be authorized to develop policies and procedures as to its enforcement. However, <clears throat> given the recent allegations of, manager <clears throat> of the manager's racial and gender discrimination against the internal auditor, Stephanie Maddox, as well as a pending criminal complaint against Manager Williams for the interference with the auditor's 2018 <clears throat> lawful open records request. I find it deeply troubling to see that the manager should be empowered to develop policies and procedures for an unlawful discrimination ordinance. <clears throat> Remember, the unified government is subject to the very ordinance for which the manager would develop enforcement policies and procedures. But based on the recent allegations, it appears that the manager has a clear conflict of interest in any development of such policies and procedures regarding non-discrimination. It would be more appropriate for the administrative, for the hearings officer, or even the commission itself to bear that responsibility. If the unified government is to be subject to the same policies and procedures as all of the parties as to the enforcement of this ordinance, then it must create those policies and procedures without even the appearance of conflict of interest and impropriety. Given the recent allegations of the manager's racial and gender discrimination against Auditor Maddox, it is in the best interest of the unified government and all citizens of Athens Clark County to amend section three of this ordinance to remove the manager and all departments under his authority and then designate an independent and impartial party to develop such policies and procedures as to enforcement. Should the commission adopt the current language in section three of this ordinance to retain the manager in any capacity, either directly or indirectly, I will seek emergency injunctive relief to halt the implementation of this ordinance until either all internal and external investigations against the manager are completed or section three is amended to remove the manager and any departments under his authority <clears throat> from the development of the policies and procedures for the enforcement of this ordinance. Thank you for your input. Um, again, any resident who would like to speak to 8, 18 through 33, 43, or 44. So we just need uh, your name and your place of residence. Sandra Metz, Athens, Georgia. On Sunday morning, I came to City Hall with a small group of people to pray for Athens Clark County. I was encouraged to sit wherever I was drawn. I was drawn to sit in the place where the individual who led the Black Lives Matter group stood during the first Back the Blue rally. I felt called to this spot because that person spewed profanity and hatred for hours from that spot. My purpose was to cover the steps with prayers filled with peace and love. I say this to let you know where my heart is. My heart is heavy with an ever-growing concern of what is occurring and may occur in Athens, Georgia. I understand there is a need for assistance during some point in, person, in a person's life. Saying that, I do know that we have a number, numerous nonprofits that assist the homeless. I believe Athens is currently capable of assisting the individuals who are homeless in Athens that want assistance. What concerns me is the number of individuals that have come and will come if we continue to make it such an inviting place for the homeless to live. I know that other counties are paying to transport their homeless individuals to Athens. Did you know there's apps for the homeless? 
Yes, you can research an app on their phone which cities had the most available resources for the homeless, which includes shelter, medical clinics, food pantries, rehab, domestic violence, and more. You, as our city leaders, are constantly attempting to recruit new businesses and growth to our community. How will a massive number of homeless people encourage them to come to athens Clark County? Why would a person want to buy a home here? You're inviting poverty and crime to our community. How can I say that? If you look at the data, you know that the individuals that make up the largest part of the homeless population are drug addicts and alcoholics who do not want help. We want everybody to be happy, right? How many times have you heard people say, if I only had a little more money, if I didn't have to go to work today and I could stay at home, the government has sent money to every person this year, the past year for COVID. The government put an eviction moratorium in place. Guess what? Was everybody happy? No. We have seen a spike in crime, suicide, and domestic abuse, etc. You are enabling these individuals. You are continuing to allow these individuals to continue their self-destructive patterns of behavior with, with this proposed encampment. They will not be held accountable to the same rules and, reg and regulations of Section 8 housing. If you move forward with this bill, the people who can leave athens clark County will do so. People do not want their tax dollars to fund an initiative that we already have nonprofits in place established to do so. Parents will stop enrolling their children in UGA and fans will stop coming to the games because of the impact of the homeless encampment. In the draft resolution, you cited several cities who have unsuccessfully established homeless encampments. These cities have more money, people, and resources than we do, and they have been unable to successfully sustain them. Can you name me one city where the homeless encampment has been successfully sustained. Just one. Thank you. Thank you for your input. If, uh, if members of the room would refrain from clapping, cheering, or other demonstrations, I'd appreciate that greatly. Thank you. All right. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Commission. John Gurley, 140 West Huntington Road, uh, Bogart which is Clark County, uh, 50 of my 68 young years have been here in Athens. Jesse, I'd love to sit down and talk with you some more. You're my commissioner. Uh, I think I've emailed you before, but uh, I've got a little bit of experience with homeless. Uh, probably need to get connected. I'm pretty much retired now, so I can do a few more things in my community. We've got kids and grandkids, five of them here in the area, three kids, five grandkids. And uh, this time last year, I was working with... Uh, as a volunteer for Motivation Forward on Auburn Avenue, we handed out 3,000 meals. It was li life-saving. There was the food supply had been shut down in downtown Atlanta, so whatever you felt about the homeless, it really didn't matter. There was people that were desperate, and and I was able to um, were they phoning a friend? I was able to um, <laughs> I was able to speak with so many who had no desire to come off the street, and I was I was shocked because I didn't have a lot of experience. I've got 1,500 miles hiking on the Appalachian Trail. That's homeless by choice, so I know what it's like. I have, you're going to hear from some really wonderful, smart people. I'm just an old grandpa. I love Athens. Uh, my theology is pretty simple. God judges, Jesus saves. I'm here to love you. I can't judge you because you get to judge me. I can't save you. I'm not empowered to do that. I am going to love you, but love doesn't mean just anything. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to have to hustle out and put some more money in the machine. Uh, why aren't we giving free parking to Athens? There's reasons for that, okay? I don't want a $25 ticket, but I firmly believe Sunday night, I, I'm diving into this issue. I went over to Barber Street on Sunday night, 830. It was pretty hot. It was pretty stinky. The decibel noise was pretty loud, okay? One of my careers, I was in safety and training and different things. I was actually part of the original Clark County Police Force uh, that Judge Lawrence was the chief. Um, so I, I'm, I'm aware of a few things. I don't think anybody's going to want to live over there, however this shakes out. I really don't. Uh, there's some legal issues that I would like to not uh, delve into, but I'll pass this over to the attorney. I think there's some points that are being missed that could cause some issues if somebody did want to seek injunctive relief or something that's going to stall it off. So I have no problem with the heart of the issue. I just think there's unintended consequences that need to be weighed carefully and measured. Uh, and that's just my opinion. I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you for coming this evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. 
My name is Gordon Roden. I live in Athens, Georgia. Uh, I'd like to read uh, something to you. On August 3rd, the mayor and commissioner vote on an Athens location for a sanctioned homeless encampment in athens Clark County. The recommendations surrounding this decision make it clear that this encampment is not one and done. There has not been transparency regarding the multiple, uh, multiple and complicated issues that threaten the health and safety of our town. And it is negligent of elected officials to fail to make the laundry list of these hazard, hazardous issues public in a transparent manner. Falling on hard times can happen to anybody. We realize that. We support second chances and assistance when hardworking Athens residents who through no fault of their own find themselves without a job or without funds to weather an immediate crisis. There are legitimate and reasonable situations where being without adequate shelter is an opportunity for the community to enthusiastically support next steps to get work and or assistance to an individual or family to get, regain stability. The crisis in Athens Clark County is not the scenario above. The crisis has to do with the transient people who prefer a nomadic lifestyle rather than the confines of a traditional brick and mortar dwelling that comes with restrictions and responsibilities. When Athens becomes a haven of easily accessible and plentiful carte blanche resources without accountability, it presents an unsustainable number of problems. When systematic homelessness presumes upon a compassionate society showing contempt for following rules and regulations that require accountability, changes have to be made. When other, um, when other neighboring cities in, are transporting homeless people to Athens, rather than dealing with the social ills of chronic homelessness, we have a systemic problem. The petition I'm gonna give you tonight addresses the crisis and compa uh, that compassion without accountability has created in athens Clark County in cities like Seattle, Portland, and San Francisco. Uh, we need to be caring citizens of Athens and tonight, I'm going to give to uh, Judd, I guess. I have a petition for each commissioner that has been signed with right at 500 signatures of athens Clark County residents and a few surrounding, uh, one for the clerk as well. I, I really would like to know if you commissioners are going to read this. Sometimes we give you things and it goes right in your trash can. There are comments that people took time to write on here, and we encourage you to read the comments of the citizens of athens Clark County. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming this evening. You're retained. Yes, good evening. Well, we're on number 32, am I out of line? Uh, no, 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 this, okay. is, this is uh, all new and all business. Okay, we want to make sure. Uh, my name is Richard Boone. I live at 430 River Bottom Road here in Athens. I am one of the original founders of the food bank about 28 to 29 years ago, and I'm the interim executive director right now. Uh, what I'm here for tonight is we were in the process of getting a grant to build a storage warehouse. We're out of space. I had to turn down food this past week because I had no place to put it. And when you start turning down food and people are hungry, it don't set real well with me. That's for darn sure. What I'm here tonight for is to thank city manager, his department, regional, what is it, regional commission. I apologize for the work they've done to help us through this. This was a new one for me. I've been through grants before. I've never been through one where a grant comes down and I have to get somebody to kind of manage it for me. And what we hear for tonight is like, we did th over 13 million pounds of food last year. With this grant and with the help of the people in this room, we'll be able to distribute a lot more. And that's what, you know, I just wanted to come here and say thank you to all of you, okay? Thank you for coming down this evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening. My name is Daryl Goodman. Uh, my address is 1111 Creek Shore Drive, Athens, Georgia, 30606. Um, I'm the acting board chairman of the Food Bank. Uh, I'm here with Mr. Boone tonight to just come to you and say uh, there is a need for additional space for the Food Bank. Uh, the pandemic brought about a lot of generosity in the community, and it brought about 
uh, a need because there's a lot of food insecurity in our town, in our community, and uh, I'm here to voice my support behind this for this grant because I think it's going to help the food bank to strengthen its goal and its mission to feed people who are in need. Thank you. We appreciate you coming down tonight. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Alan Corley. I live uh, at 450 Seagraves Drive. And I think I should start just by reading a couple excerpts from your own proposal about the homeless encampment because I think they're actually quite damaging against it. Paragraph number six, uh, speaking about, no, as noted in the history section, this is paragraph six, ACCPD has experienced an increase in call volume of crimes involving the homeless, including rapes, assaults, and thefts. ACCPD has responded to these incidents and provided necessary services to victims while working to identify offenders. There has also been an increase in complaints from property owners and businesses regarding homeless individuals trespassing and damaging property. Go to paragraph 10, speaking about two previous unofficial homeless encampments. Sorry about that. These two encampments have generated a great deal of refuse, most often through the donations of well-intentioned residents and nonprofits. Because these encampments generally lack access to restroom facilities, they result in untreated human waste that is at high risk of introducing fecal coliforms that are capable of further impairing our local river streams and drinking water sources. Go down to paragraph 22. As of June of 2021, there has been a 46% increase in the number of cases requiring athens Clark County Police uh, response when compared to the same time frame in 2020. ACCPD has seen a 64% increase in the number of homeless individuals involved in incidents when compared to the same time frame in 2020. These are excerpts from your own proposal, which can be found on the AAM, athens Clark County website and is available for everyone to read. My own thoughts on this, uh, it's noted in the proposal that we are already helping and assisting nonprofit organizations in helping the homeless. Uh, this is the first instance of the county government directly providing assistance to the homeless. My question is, why don't we just keep helping these nonprofit organizations? Why does it have to be done directly by the government with $300,000 of taxpayer money? The nonprofits know what works and what doesn't work. If we do it ourselves, we'll be learning from step one. Uh, many of these homeless people, I don't discount that there are legitimate conditions that lead someone to be homeless, but if you want to get a job, you can get a job. Every business in the city is hiring right now. You have no excuse to not have a job. And these people who stay homeless for long periods of time often do not want help. They enjoy being homeless for whatever reason. It's a completely backwards mindset. And establishing such a encampment would already place a severe strain on an already understaffed police department. I just read you the statistic about increases in crime. Uh, what kind of business do you think would want to move right next to a homeless encampment where there's piles of human waste? What kind of residents do you think would want to live in a city? Thank you for joining us this evening. Good evening. Good evening. Steve Middlebrooks, uh, 274 Mossside Drive, Athens. Um, uh, this page is exactly what this gentleman just read, so I'll put it to the bottom of the However, um, in our business, we hauled off five loads of, of debris from an encampment, as well as two weeks ago, uh, when I got to work, a young gentleman, a homeless person, was in one of our cars uh, sitting there. So it is a concern, and I have empathy, just like most everyone that's going to be speaking here today. I would call your attention to a program that has been successful. Mr. Mayor, I think that you are familiar with it, called Built for Zero. Uh, I'm not sure if all the commissioners are. but. It is a successful program. Uh, it's successful in several cities, one of which is close by, and that's Greenville, South Carolina. And briefly, it says, Built for Zero is a program designed to end chronic homelessness. It is supported by the national nonprofit organization Community Solutions and funded by numerous partners. This report includes a Built for Zero program and how it benefits athens Clark County. The components for Built for Zero methodology case conferencing, community level measurement, and creation of a by name list of homeless people would be integrated into the existing care providers in the field, as mentioned previously. 
In addition to the description of various organizations in Athens Clark County that currently work with a chronic homeless popula population, this report offers two other strategies that some communities have implemented and describes the unforeseen challenges that have achieved function zero for one homeless population. The two co key components of the Built for Zero, one, prioritize families and veterans who otherwise had a good record of stability and responsibility. And like probably you and I, uh, we all want to be held accountable and we all are held accountable in anything we do each and every, every day. We follow rules and regulations. We follow policies and procedures, and each and all we do. We're doing it tonight. We're following rules and policy procedures. We adhere to the law. Uh, the current proposal, in my humble opinion, does not address the increase in our homeless community. Rather, it promotes it. Please take it into consideration. Thank you. Thank you for coming this evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Shanice Allen. I live at 130 Meredith Ridge Road, Athens, 30605. I'm speaking of a lot of stuff on the agenda. With millions of dollars that have been allocated in athens Clark County over the last weeks, months, and years, I have grave concerns. We still have persistent poverty, inadequate housing, increasing homelessness, serious education divide, same nonprofits getting hundreds and thousands of dollars, yearly and the same folks getting help. Good old boys club getting their backs scratched with nice contracts. No formal process for sub submitting sub projects for splash projects that have been voted on by the public. CEOs of nonprofit organizations embezzling money and still receiving funds from athens Clark County. Inadequate health care, no oversight for inadequate HUD reporting over and over again. We need internal auditors to hold our government accountable. They follow the money that makes sure communities are well funded and secure. As always, our communities are locked out of resources. This happens when public officials interfere with the auditor's job and can't follow the money. Auditor Stephanie Maddox needs more independence. She needs more staffing and freedom to do her job. I'm asking you to listen to the community and please continue to follow the dollar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allen. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Charlie Barrow. I live at 211 Morton Avenue. I'm here to address item 20 under the old business. That's the Morton Avenue parking prohibition. Um, obviously, I live on that street, so I have a concern about this um, proposed ban. Uh, Morton Avenue is used as a cut through from uh, people on millage going to agriculture and heading to the east side. It's a residential street, but people really uh, speed through there. Um, the proposed ban is based on uh, the idea that these cars that are parked in this particular point in the street pose an obstruction to drivers coming down. Um, they probably do create some kind of obstruction, but the real obstruction is because it's right in the curvature of the road. So placing this parking ban there is not going to solve the problem. Um, <clears throat> what the parked cars do do, though, is they uh, create um, sort of like a... a traffic calming device. They slow the cars down. If we put this ban here, I think it's just going to speed up the traffic going down Morton, create a more dangerous situation for either oncoming vehicles or pedestrians, residents of the street. Um, so I would ask the commission to deny this proposal. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Krista Weidman. I am an employee of athens Clark County would like to speak to uh, item number 44. So I just found out about this being on the agenda tonight, I mean last night, and uh, it was by accident that I found out. I was a little shocked that you were considering this as a mandate because of the nature of the vaccine is being, it's still an investigative 
uh, drug and it has only got emergency use authorization. So it's being called a vaccine even though it doesn't prevent the disease or prevent you from spreading it. This is coming to light more and more every day. The CDC director even pointed this out a couple of days ago on the news. Uh, that does not meet the legal definition of a vaccine. A vaccine is supposed to prevent you from getting a disease and prevent you from spreading it. Uh, this is only designed to reduce the symptoms of the COVID-19 disease that is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this has not even been proven that it'll do that yet. It's just now coming to light that vaccinated people are getting coming down with the disease. So we don't know the answers to all these questions yet. Uh, whatever you want to call it, a vaccine, a, pr a procedure, you will be uh, requiring employees to take this medical procedure without knowing how it will affect them or whether uh, it will even work for them. You will be taking away their right to informed consent and exposing them to coercion to keep their jobs by getting this vaccination. Both of these things are against the emergency youth authorization under which this um, procedure is authorized. Uh, a mandate will also require employees to give up their medical privacy and to forgo, forgo the advice of their doctors. Before you decide to mandate this on all of your employees who work hard for you every day, please do a lot of research. Please look into this and see if it's the right thing for athens Clark County. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good evening. Hey, good evening. I'm Joe Block, and I live on Millage Terrace here in Clark County. I'm a father, I'm a husband, and I'm a concerned citizen. I'm talking about item number 30, uh, the homeless encampment. I think this has been really pushed quickly. I think there might be a reason for it since the homeless have been pushed out of the uh, railroad area. But I think we need to do a lot more homework um, before we make rash uh, decisions. I would ap appreciate the commission taking more time and diligence, getting some input. There's many folks in this community. I was on the board of Interfaith Hospitality Network Family Promise for 10 years. I've done a fair amount of work. I also handle Medicaid in a lot of different cities in the country for the company that I work with, and we work with the managed care organizations. This is a big, big task, and when you start to go after it <clears throat> single-threaded, that's a problem. It has to be unified. So I would ask that the commission really take its time here. Let's not squander the funds. We just heard a young woman come up here and speak to funds being given to the same things over and over again. I think uh, Einstein may have said that was the definition of insanity, and we expect a different result. So I think that in this case, if we take our time, I'm not saying I'm totally against it. I don't think it's a good move in terms of my opinion, but I do think we could bring the charitable organizations and the churches in this community and the temples and bring them together and be able to come up with a cohesive answer to what we're doing. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks for joining us this evening. Good evening. Um, good evening, Broderick Flanagan, 243 Sunset Drive. Uh, I want to speak to several different items on the, on the agenda, but I only have three minutes, so I'll try to keep my comments succinct. Um, especially item 30, 26, uh, 28. I believe there's one more. But um, I definitely uh, was a part of the steering committee for Envision Athens in 2017. One of the things that was alarming to me throughout that process was learning that when the consultants gave a report that Athens had a 4.7% unemployment rate. But when you look deeper into the numbers um, and break it down by race, it showed that in the African-American community, unemployment was 13.4%. And so when you think about things of that nature and, and the disparities that exist in our community, um, we need to have more robust labor practices um, when we're thinking, thinking about labor, especially for marginalized communities. Um, in my day job, I work with the um, homeless populations from time to time through neighborhood leadership. And I've visited encampments. I've even helped uh, a family of eight get in, into the Interfaith Hospitality Network program and get off the streets. One of the key things in helping that family get stabilized was getting them a job, getting their, one of their sons a job. Um, and so I'm not totally against the encampment either, but I would, love, I would be more jazzed about the encampment process if it was tied to some type of labor standards or labor production 
um, or opportunities for, for people that want to go into those opportunities. Um, they have an awesome program out in Austin, Texas, uh, where they um, have uh, people experiencing homelessness doing uh, minimal tasks for the city. Uh, cleanups, uh, removing invasive species, things of that nature, and they pay them $15 an hour. Um, and so I, I feel like whenever we have an opportunity to involve labor practices, good labor practices in this process, we need to explore that through whatever tools and mechanisms that we can so that more people aren't falling into homelessness or despair or committing crimes to take care of their basic needs. Um, and then finally, uh, I do want to speak in support of the auditor's office, making sure that we audit these SPLOS programs um, because I don't think uh, uh, SPLOS has never been audited. Um, and also the manager's office needs to be audited as well. Um, and and uh, making sure that her office is fully staffed as well as the inclusion office. Uh, attended the, the training, the DEI training. And many of the commissioners weren't even there for both days. And so that was alarming in itself because diversity, equity, and inclusion is important. You yourself, Mayor, uh, mentioned in your first day in office that we're about to experience a great era of equity in Athens. So making sure that we're on the same page as a body, as a governing body, making sure that we're looking at all these processes through an equitable lens, will we'll address some of these things that we're, we're talking through, that we're paying lip service to for right now. Um, hoping that we uh, can work together collaboratively to shore up some of these things and these processes. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good evening. Hey, how are you? Hey, my name is Steve Everett, and I live at 120 Fortson Drive. I've lived in Athens for six years. My wife and I, Nancy, moved here six years ago from Alpharetta, and uh, we came here because Athens was a great community, allegedly. You know, in 1989, there was a uh, movie that came out. It was called The Field of Dreams. Anybody remember that? And anybody remember what the most famous line from that movie was? If you build it, they will come. Well, let me tell you something. Athens has a reputation within the homeless community of being a magnet. It is a regional magnet for homeless people around the southeast. And people are coming here every day because the social services we have in place are far superior to the other areas within the region, including Atlanta, which has a whole hell of a lot more money to, to, uh, to deal with the problem than uh, Athens does. The goal is to discourage homelessness. It's not to encourage it. And the program that you've laid out, the $2 million that you're talking about spending on that, is nothing but a magnet to bring more people here and put them in a position where we're going to foot the bill and have to be in a position where uh, potentially future labor uh, uh, conditions are going to deteriorate. And in addition to that, property values are going to go down. You know, there are other solutions out there. There's a Houston solution. How many people here have uh, researched that and looked at that and seen what Houston has done, you know, to, uh, to deal with their homeless problem? You know, take some time, think about it, go through it, and think about what, what it is. I got sick when I read that whole, uh, you know, the outline of where they chose that one site. There were 90 options. One option became the one because of sexual predators and having them be involved in it. Give me a break. What are we thinking about? Where is common sense in any of this? And I fail to see it anywhere in what's happening. You know, anybody remember what the name of Athens is? It was America's greatest college town. You guys are ruining it at every step along the way. And, you know, we came here for a reason. And it makes me want to walk away from this town and put us in a position where we have to go someplace else because we are thinking more about the homeless and the people who aren't providing money and providing tax revenue to this, to this uh, organization than we are. And I want to ask each one of you before we finish up here tonight, if you're so hell-bound on helping the homeless, it's a worthy cause, how many of you are willing to sit there and take 10 or 15 people into your homes and support them with your own dime in your own neighborhood and your own person? And I'll wait. How many? Raise your hands. then don't ask us to spend our money and our time and our effort doing what you won't do. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good evening. Hey, I'm back. Okay, I timed it. I don't think I've got three minutes, so I'm, I'm almost good. But don't start me yet. I, I need to get organized. This is for you, Mr. Drake. That's from the HUD document I spoke to you about earlier today. Did you get a response on that? 
Uh, Naming, go ahead and begin. All right, I'm going to begin. Okay, I still have the questions out that you haven't answered yet, um, Kelly, but I'll, I'll wait for an email. HUD doesn't recommend camps. I just need your uh, name and place of residence. Oh, I'm sorry. Susan Monteverdi, I live in Athens for 10 years from Northern California, where San Jose is. And they, by the way, just voted no on an encampment. Um, if you can't hear me, there you go. All organizations are not on board on this. Three have said no. One said they would help with services but not run it. And this is why a lot of the coalition said they want a joint venture because they can't find anybody to volunteer yet. No one has come up to the plate and volunteered to do this in terms of an operator. The problem is a low barrier criteria with no accountability. No drug testing, sex offenders allowed, no criminal history check, no separation of adults. This means kids, uh, no kids, 18 and up. This means that the Barber Street location is the only lawful place that you could come up with because it'd be more than 1,000 feet away from kids, but it's only 1,720 feet away from three different kid programs in the Chase condominiums. Low barrier is wanted by some on the coalition because you're afraid you won't get, to come, get them to come. You were worried about getting 40 out of 90 people to come there. Coalition members have also said they will st um, still be in downtown Athens. They won't stay there. What are you going to do when they come to fill their water bottles, charge their phones, and take off back into town or wherever they want to go? You have an organization that require accountability in this town. They could easily expand from 70 to 145 beds. They have told you this in public. The 2015-2020 PIT data shows flat or decreasing numbers. In 2021, the, the numbers you just did on Friday, they doubled to 128 instead of 67. Half of that number is probably the people that have been around here for a while. In the survey that you conducted, they, you said half of the number had been homeless for more than four years. That's probably the increase that you're looking at. I mean, that's not the increase you're looking at. That's the people who've been around, but it's the 50% who are come. Where are these people coming from? They're coming from outside Athens. Sheriffs from other towns are dropping them off. They're being given bus tickets. They come in and they stay homeless. Athens is better than where they came from, like New York City. And when you did the survey, why did you leave out the question, where are you from? That's a normal HUD question. Blaine McDonald told me that they didn't ask it because they were making this for you guys here to see what you wanted to do about the encampment. OK. so. You have spent $4.5 million already with the recommendations. <laughs> $1.5 billion total nonprofit assets are in Athens, Georgia. $1.5 billion. How many transit homeless people can Athens absorb? That is a question that this community has to answer, not 10 people on this commission. Why does it, why do you do it this way? You're rushing because you want to get the people off the railroad tracks. And you're using it as an excuse for no public input because you said it in the recommendations. Yeah. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm not done. I have one more thing. I handed it to you. And I'll quit after that. But there are two mandatory requirements in that HUD document that apply to the American Recovery Act, March 2021. They state, no permanently registered sex offenders are allowed. Anyone convicted of drug-related criminal activity for the manufacture or production of meth on federally funded assisted housing. Those two are mandatory for, for COVID funds. I suggest you go and get a clarification from HUD whether or not you can use those funds legally. You need to slow down, you need to involve the community, and you need to fund the Salvation Army. Thank you for your time. Good. Good evening. Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Scott, and I'm the director at the Sparrow's Nest. Thank you all for having me today. And uh, I like to start off by saying I'm a person in long-term recovery, and what that means to me is that I haven't found it necessary to use the drug of my choice uh, over a period of 13 years. I speak out about my recovery openly like this because it was the instrument, the vehicle, the uh, uh, tool that got me reconnected back with God. Now, during my time of darkness, I've been incarcerated several times. I've been to prison several times. I um, was in an extremely dark place. I know what it feels like from being uh, a lived experience of being homeless. I know what it feels like of being addicted. I know what it feels like to carry shame around, so on and so forth. So when I began to uh, and, uh, take on the role at the Sparrow's Nest, I had volunteered four and a half years before then. I've been on staff, it'll be six years uh, this December, and I've seen all kind of people come through our doors. I've laid my life down for this ministry of the, the least, the last, and the lost 
and I will continue to do this. But one of the things that I found challenging that comes through our doors daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, is people bringing different people from out of town, uh, whether it's the out-of-county uh, police, um, whether it's uh, people bringing them from the hospital, people bringing them from out of town and saying, get out, here you go, here you go, Jamie. And I'm like, well, what do I do with this? So. I understand that even when we talk about homelessness, it's not an easy task. It's something that takes a village. It's not a just a one cookie uh, shape approach that fits all. It's not something that we can just say, okay, here's the funding, here's the building, do it. Of course those things play a role in it, but and this type of ministry is an extremely, extremely uh, pressing uh, ministry that we do. And homelessness is it's pressing. We see people die daily. I have people coming up to me uh, telling me, okay, such and such just got robbed or a person telling me they raped me last night, Jamie, or a person telling me, um, well, you know, they just found such and such dead. I know that we have several unsolved murders in this town, right? Uh, that happened in the homeless uh, encampment. Some was uh, may have been overdoses or what else. So I speak from a place of, of experience, but I didn't want to just come up here, I'm not here for any grant funding. Let me repeat that. The everyone in the commission, I'm not here for any grant funding. I'm here because I'm a concerned citizen. I'm part of the community. And if we do this, I just hope that we do it right. And I think one of the first things that we needed to do was bring the nonprofits in the room who are already doing the work and ask them what's working, what's getting in the way, what are the next steps, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that some of the things that are in place aren't good things that are in place, but I visited every home. Well, you can't visit them all because they pop up everywhere. There's so many. But I visit five homeless camps, and in visiting those camps, I began to realize one thing through my observation is that 30% of the people don't want to move. 30% of the people uh, uh, are mental health, and 30% just don't know what to do. Thank, Thank you for uh, the time. Thank you very yeah. much. Hi, um, my name's Laura McHugh. I live in Athens, Georgia, and thank you, Mr. Mayor and commissioners for letting me speak. I just want to speak a little bit about the cost of the encampment, and this is, I just want to bring up some of the Seattle numbers because I know that's been used as an example. And um, anyway, the Seattle annual budget in 2018 for the homeless programs was $90 million. Um, by 2021, it was 165 million. This equates to 25 million per year, or a 27.7% per year increase. When the former leader of the Seattle Human Services Department, Jason Johnson, was asked about this, he said, obviously, the problem has not gotten better. So I think it's a legit, legitimate question about whether we're fixing anything or just providing survival services. So Seattle is spending 13,750 per homeless person. Seattle should receive economies of scale when budgeting for services, certainly more so than athens Clark County. Let us just assume that a new encampment would provide management and services for the 67, I understand now it's 128, but this is based on the 67, unsheltered people surveyed in the 2020 PIT data. That would mean a recurring budget of $921,250 in one year. This doesn't include any capital land expenditures or other one-offs such as permanent structures, utility supply lines, etc. To compare, it should be noted that here in Athens, a two-bedroom apartment can easily be rented in athens Clark County for 800 an occupant or 1600 a month. That is an annual amount of 9600 per occupant, occupant compared to that 13750 um, that Seattle's currently spending on their homeless people. Um, some questions about um, some questions about the homeless encampment that I don't think have been answered yet was whether or not it would be for solely Athens Clark County residents. Um, should the services be more focused on the families at risk that we know about through the athens Clark County Schools? And what are the costs to accomplish goal for athens Clark County residents? Um, what would they end up being? Anyway, um, 
It's being suggested that some of the 60 million in COVID-19 relief money be used for this project. Exactly how much do you suggest spending? Capital expenditures, annual budgets. When considering using 16 million in COVID-19 relief money, should not the government consider return on investment, which would benefit all of Athens residents, including potential homeless populations in the future? Would finite financial res resources be better spent on job programs? Does the city offer minimal experienced jobs? Okay, thank you. Good evening. I'm Suzanne Yeager. I live in um, 195 Tipperary, Athens, Clark County. I've lived here for 38 years. I've also worked downtown for 22 years. I um, work with college students. I've seen just in the last week, I've had two instances in front of my store where homeless people had a fight, disrupted everything. They've come in my store, and they've scared my employees. I've called the police, and thank God they came when they came in the store. But I've seen this get worse and worse. I mean, they harass the shoppers. It is just not okay. And it's not okay to do that to our college students. And I just, I, I'm disgusted, totally disgusted with everything going on. I mean, there are jobs out there. People are asking me every day for jobs. I have a full staff. I have hardworking people working for me, and there's no excuse for laziness. And we are just entitling people, and we are not big enough. We are not Seattle. We are not Austin, Texas. I just had a college student come back from there and complain about it. She said it was horrible. And my sister and brother-in-law live in Seattle. So it is a mess. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Commission, Ms. Auditor. Thank you all so much for having me today. Um, I'm going to speak to item number 28 this evening regarding the non-discrimination ordinance. Homelessness is a very important issue that continues to be rampant, but so does discrimination in places of businesses and places surrounding athens Clark County. You know, the reason this issue is so important to me is because if you'd ever thought that I'd be standing, or if I ever thought that I'd be standing in a chamber like this, proudly, openly as a gay man, I probably would have told you that you would be wrong. But then something changed when I came to a little city in North Georgia called Athens, and I met people that were just like me, and I met people that accepted me just as I am, and many of those people I'm looking at right now I've sat in your, on your porches. I've sat in listening sessions in this chamber with you. And I know in each of your hearts that, dis that anti-discrimination and protecting the most vulnerable among us is at your core. So I am here today not to point fingers, but to say thank you. I want to also say that my faith teaches me to love my neighbor as myself. That means my gay neighbor, my straight neighbor, my black neighbor, my brown neighbor, my immigrant neighbor, my impoverished neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. And unfortunately, sometimes people of faith and not of faith forget to love their neighbor as themselves, and that forgetfulness leads to harmful actions against people like me and people like some of you. And when our populations fail to love their neighbors as themselves and endanger the lives of residents of this city, I believe it is of utmost importance for you as a government to respond. So tonight, I want to say thank you for the work you've done on this ordinance. I know it's not perfect. Policy never is. There will be things to iron out. But the intention that's been shown by each of you to protect our most vulnerable and most marginalized does not go unnoticed. The last thing I want to say, not only to the commission and to people, but also to people in this room, is that when we talk about discrimination, when we talk about loving our neighbors as ourselves, children everywhere are listening to us. They are listening, they are watching, and they are looking to us for affirmation and support of who they are, who they love what they look like, no matter the dollar they make. 
And I encourage you to pass this tonight with a great emphasis on bringing us to the table because this needs to happen not just during Pride Month. It needs to happen not just during a special time when an ordinance is up. These conversations need to happen often. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good evening. I didn't have very much time to prepare, so my thoughts might be a little scattered, but my name is Marilyn Emerson. I'm an employee of athens Clark County, and I'm here about number 44, the vaccine mandate. Um, some of my concerns are, I guess we'll start at the top, it's um, at what point does a medical mandate continue to slide down such a slippery slope? Um, will I have to, at some point, disclose my dental history? Well, I have to disclose my gynecological history. If we're already asking you, you know, you're asking um, for me to disclose if I've been vaccinated for something that's not even really, really showing good science. Um, and I know that that sounds a little shocking, but that's the truth. That's where it could end up if you're asking for something as basic as a vaccine, um, proof of a vaccine. Um, that kind of walks into the next topic of you can't undo a vaccine. So um, is the county prepared to compensate employees when they're requiring employees to take something that doesn't have solid science and data to support that it's not going to harm us in 10 years or it's not going to change our current medical status? You don't know what it's going to do to a woman's fertility. You don't know what it's going to do to a man's fertility. That changes drastically a person's life. So if you're asking somebody to take a vaccine that's uh, essentially unfounded, it's really hard for people to bite off on. Um, and if something were to happen to these folks that are being required to do that, is the county going to step up and, and take care of the medical expenses for people that go through something that's an unknown right now? Um, especially when it's something that's too soon to really have a full, full concept and full grasp on what we're talking about here. Um, I think it's really important for you all to know that I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I've walked down a gauntlet and been vaccinated once a year with God knows what. We're very rarely disclosed what we're getting vaccinated against, but it's policy. Um, at, I mean, I have the ability to choose now, and you're asking me to give that choice up. I've already signed a contract with our government. I'm not here to sign one with y'all. Um, so that means, you know, why should I have to disclose my medical history to earn my paycheck? Um, especially if I'm going to, I'm happy enough to wear the mask every day. I mean, it seems like that's something that's beneficial for everybody. If that's what, you know, you all want, then I can do that. But I cannot put something in my body that is not founded yet. It's not fully FDA approved. That's really scary for a lot of people. Um, so I'll close with saying um, when employees are required to be vaccinated and they choose not to, um, how do you expect to remain fully staffed and functioning in a county that's already, my office is at 50% um, staffed right now. I'm pulling the workload of three people. If I choose not to be vaccinated, how are you gonna replace four people in one office now with just me leaving? Um, I like my job, I'm good at my job. Please don't make me choose between feeding my family and getting a vaccination. Thank, Thank you. you for coming this evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jill Helm. I live at 320 Best Drive. I am the executive director of AthFest Educates. I'm speaking tonight in regards to number 29 on the agenda. Um, this is in regards to the changing in alcohol serving policy for special events. Um, we've recently, there's an, um, a motion for some ordinance changes to add some flexibility to the, uh, the way special events can serve alcohol at events. Um, we very much applaud the LRC for how far they've come and the ACC staff for how far they've come. Um, unfortunately, with the way that the ordinances are written, they're not incredibly helpful for the larger events in town. Um, I can speak specifically for AFS that it costs us somewhere in the neighborhood of two hundred dollars to $250,000 a year to put this event on. So alcohol revenue is incredibly important to the event to be able to make sure that we can produce that event every single year. Um, the way that athens Clark County rules are written, we cannot charge admission for any kind of public event that happens downtown. So that means we are incredibly reliant on things like alcohol sales to be able to do that. Um, AthFest educates for those who don't know, 
part of the funding that we raise from AFES goes back into our schools and in our community. We use funding to award grants to support music and arts education for kindergarten through 12th grade youth here in Athens. So it's incredibly important that we're able to have that event be as successful as possible. Um, I ask that the ordinances, that the LRC, excuse me, and the ACC staff work with some of the larger events in town before finalizing any of those ordinances so that the flexibility is, is incredibly appreciated, but we do need it to go a little bit further. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate your input tonight. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mara Zunig. I live in Athens. Uh, I wrote down what I was going to say. Uh, and might be over a few uh, seconds. I know that you allowed somebody else the courtesy to finish their speech somewhat. Um, but I have something, and I feel it's important to me. I'm a natural citizen of the United States, daughter of Nicaraguan legal immigrants with second and eighth grade education with seven children who went to college. We have a doctor in education, a lawyer, engineer, educators, and business people. We are Democrats, Republicans, Socialists, and Marxists, and two veterans. We have black, whites, and natives in our family and in our blood. We coexist peacefully because we know that at the end of the day, we are family first. This cultural melting pot of a family that has nurtured a person who has always asked questions from the time she was an atheist, a socialist, a feminist, a Marxist, and so on. I know the meaning of raising your hand in a, in a power sign and screaming, el pueblo unido jamás será vencido for the Nicaraguan Revolution, which is still in power practicing the very same acts they boldly fought against. And that is why we, the people, have to watch our government from abusing its power. You can be from the left, or you can be from the right, and you can still abuse your power. Some of you in your seat of government right now are abusing the power which has been given to you. You have rewarded those few who work diligently at intimidating and silencing people just like the Sandinistas of Nicaragua in the many ways that I recognize. You are seeking to establish ordinances like the sanctioned tent encampment that many people of Athens disapprove, disapprove of, but you claim you have support because the small circle that you are involved in are doing the intimidating. You claim you have leaders of the community supporting, who? Nonprofits, organizers. These are not the majority. These are the louder ones who receive and interchange information of what's going on, while many others are trying to keep afloat financially and have no time to read or hear or participate. But you know this. You have the power, and you are doing exactly what others before you did that you criticized at some point, except you are doing it better. Who and how many people of Athens are supporting these resolutions, ordinances? Give us numbers, give us data. With the pros and the cons, we are, we are only hearing the pros you are selling to us with no data. What studies besides the carefully chosen, non-comparable to Athens ones mentioned in the resolutions or surveys have you done and where are they? They should, they should be seen despite the fact that I know that surveys can be manipulated. Questions can be framed to get a necessary outcome, such as asking people if they are pro-helping the homeless through a government-run and paid program. Who would say no to that? That's why some people potentially agree to harmful policies because they don't want to look bad or insensitive. But frame the question a little bit more clear and people ask questions, ask for proof, ask for possible other solutions. We can explore what are the pros and the cons to the homeless in our community. Thank but you for joining us. You do year. not want opposition, you want agreement. Here's a con I demand that you address before you approve this ordinance. Can you guarantee that placing homeless in encampment will not be a danger to them and the community? You will be encamping people and you will not be able to know if someone is pretending to be homeless just to come in and deal drugs and enslave people to sexual abuse. Thank you for Within down the encampment and more much. importantly to the youth within our community. You will be encamping people and you will not be able to know if someone is pretending to be homeless just to come in and deal drugs and enslave people to sexual abuse within the encampment and to our youth within our community. You, don't know, you won't know if you will be housing and feeding people who are pretending to be homeless just to come and have a supply of victims. Can you? Have you even thought of that? Where is your data, your pros and your cons? Tim Dempson said, we need this because 
The hold on eviction was coming to an end and a flood of homelessness was coming. Where's the data, Mr. Denson? Where's the data? While some tenants were not working, landlords were told they still had to pay for their mortgage. Some tenants received federal aid and un unemployment benefits rose to give way for people to stay at home because you earn more. Businesses are suffering because people do not come to work. These are si there are signs everywhere saying they are hiring. There are sign on bonuses on some of them. Pre-COVID people had somewhat of a, had a hard time getting a job, but now look at the signs everywhere. Who is paying the taxes that is keeping the government working? Is it not the employed, the property owner, and the business owner? You have a duty to these people too. Give the existing homeless shelters the funding. They have been doing a very good job despite the, their funding issues. Give them the funds to add beds, extend to their buildings. Homeless people should not be on the street, loosely or conglomerated. This is cruel and you have a heartless solution. Athens already pays some of the highest sales tax in Georgia and other states like Florida and New Jersey. Athens pays one of the highest millage rates in Georgia, which make up the real estate taxes higher than Oconee County, our neighbor, where per capita is higher, but sales and property taxes are less. You can't do the same or better? If you cannot do that, then you do not deserve to be in the seat that you are in. Hashtag remove our leader from office. And think about it. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Do we want to break out the nets? <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Commissioner. My name is Noah Johnson. I'm the co-founder of Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement and former candidate for District 10, Commissioner. Um, first, I want to speak to support um, agenda item 28, if that's the anti-discrimination um, ordinance. I think it's great that you guys are finally putting that on the agenda and finally taking it serious. You know, my organization has been out here with some of you before you even got in office, five, six years, trying to um, just balance things out downtown where the bars were discriminating, turning people away with arbitrary dress codes. And we were asking for a lot more than got passed at that time. And finally, some of that stuff is, seems like it's back on the table. So I'm here in support definitely for that. And I also want to speak to the situation going on with the auditor, Mrs. Maddox. I'm here to basically speak on behalf of transparency and accountability. It disturbs me to hear the facts and the allegations surrounding the auditor's complaint to both AADM, Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement, and the EEOC. The way I see it, you have a coworker or a charter officer, and by now hopefully a friend to some of you, as long as she's been here and as long as you've been here, who feels intimidated, belittled, and in some situations undermined. And it seems that, it seems that there's so much hesitation in trying to cure this situation, and I don't understand that. Did it really have to get to this point? Is a false perception that everything is in ship shape condition worth it? Your inability to personally comment publicly to the community on this matter also disturbs me. And also, I hope that this won't be the type of investigation where the investigators are reporting to the alleged. And I hope that the results are not an attempt to try to cover up any unethical behavior. I would also like to see the auditor get the applicable support that she needs to do her job. And I would like to see the splash audited. It's about time that the splash get audited and from the sound of some of the um, concerns tonight, there seems like there's a lot of other things that need to be audited too. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good evening. Good evening, my name is Nancy Everett. I went to school here um, from Atlanta. I've lived here with my husband over six years. And there's been so many great points, there's not much I could say that's new, but I, I'm up here because I do not agree with the homeless encampment. Um, it's a known fact, everyone knows, that other counties drop their homeless people off here. And it's not the taxpayer's responsibility to care for all of Northeast Georgia. Charity begins at home. And we need to take care of our community here, our schools, our homeless people, everyone that are residents of Athens. 
Um, creating a homeless encampment will further strengthen the message that this is the place to come. And why are we doing that? That's ridiculous. We have things at home we need to work on. And by creating that, it will impact not only our homeless community here by not making them as safe, but it also affects the taxpaying citizens and the businesses that make Athens a great place. It's going to put a strain on our emergency rooms, our police force, and businesses, as Suzanne mentioned, some of the downtown businesses. It's, it's not pleasurable to shop downtown these days. I don't know if you people have done that, but I've been harassed many times. And there's no reason for that. Um, in addition to that, a homeless encampment will have increased unsanitary conditions, spreads tuberculosis, sexually transmitted diseases, and um, child and sexual abuse. There is um, a huge increase in sexual trafficking here in Athens and across our country. You know, this is just encouraging that. We need to deal with our own residents here and make things better for people here, not bring people from all over Georgia and try to deal with that. We cannot afford it. Um, so anyways, um, additionally, in trying to help the homeless people, and there's probably not one person here that doesn't want to help the homeless community, but if you've done your research, you will know that a good portion of the homeless uh, community here has um, mental issues, addiction issues. That's what needs to be addressed. That's how you can help those people, not by providing more places for them to raise a tent and bring everyone else from all over Georgia here to do that too. You're ruining our city. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. Good evening. Hey, good evening. Hello. My name is John Monterella. I live at 169 Old Winterville Road. I uh, went to school at Georgia, graduated in 2009. Um, Love this town. Moved here in 2010. Um, bought a house in 2015. I've worked at tons of restaurants, Viva and Homemade and Heirloom and De Palmas and yada, yada. And I've served many of y'all. Um, love this community, but it has been destroyed um, by some of y'all sitting here today, I am disgusted that y'all don't um, uh, have a rule of law or follow the rule of law. Um, I wouldn't expect to be able to go set up a tent in downtown or in a park. I would expect to have a police officer come and talk to me because it's illegal. I would uh, appreciate it if y'all would um, either put laws on the books that address these issues or um, look at the laws that are already in place and enforce them. Uh, we're a, a land of law, law and order. If we're just going to suspend all laws like the CDC has with not having to pay rent to landlords, um, it is going to destroy our country. Um, I just got off work. I didn't know what I would say. I, I was working for 12 bucks an hour at a pawn shop. Um, when COVID happened, I was put on unemployment for the first time in my life. Um, now for the last six months, I've been working at a pawn shop where people get $1,000 a week to sit at home and they come in and buy items I cannot afford with my $12 an hour. It's disgusting. They smell like marijuana, and I gladly give them their PS4. I find myself being jealous of them. I, I understand that it is sick, and I shouldn't be jealous of people like that that are lazy, and I, I, I'm going to work hard. I'm currently planning to move to Columbus, Georgia, where they do have more respect for law and order. I think it's disgusting that you have forsaken the working man of this town and that you are more concentrated on people who don't even live here and who choose to sit on the street corner of North Avenue in, in a disgrace to the city. Um, let me look at my notes I was making here in, in uh, um, COVID. That's a whole nother issue, but I'll just say a few things starting off with George Orwell said, sanity is not statistical. Um, for anyone sitting at home, who thinks that this is insane, such as masking and enforced vaccinations. It is. You're not alone. Um, it is insane to mask children who are not affected by this disease. It is literal insanity and disgusting. I think it's a sign of a sick society that you should cover the face of children who are literally learning how to read the face of other humans to interact. It is part of communication. It is disgusting. I was doing improv in Atlanta and I saw men defecating on the streets, and I decided, hey, I don't want to live in Atlanta, so I would drive from Athens to Atlanta and back and forth. Um, I'm going to move to Columbus because, they, once again, they enforce uh, the rule of law, and they don't allow people to live in these horrible uh, conditions for the sake of those humans as well as the citizens that pay taxes. Um, let me see here. Uh, Australia has turned into a little North Korea. I know it seems random, but what I see is that is the future. 
Um, if we ignore that type of thing, I just want to say it. It's, it's sad. They, they literally have armies, you know, soldiers patrolling the streets. You can't leave your home. They have taken away their freedoms. They took away their guns. They took away their freedoms. I'm not a big Second Amendment guy, but I did buy my first gun last year, you know. Um, my grandpa served in World War II, North Korea. Thank you for the last us. thing, Yes, sir. Uh, my grandpa served in World War II, North Korea, and Vietnam. He was a POW once. Um, he did not serve so my grandma could live forever, who's in her 80s. He, he, he served so that his generations down the line could live with freedom. All right? You're a petty tyrant. Good evening. Is this a part of my time? Who cares about other people? Okay. Good evening. Well, in full, my name is Joan. I'm from Athens, Georgia. I love this town. I really do. I'm originally from Atlanta. I'm originally from Atlanta, and I like Athens because it's smaller. Um, in full disclosure, I think I should tell you that thousands of people in this town are praying for Athens. And also in full disclosure, I think you should know I could save everybody a lot of time and just have a sermon here and talking about John 3.16 and how Jesus Christ died for us. He gave himself for us our sins. He gives us the ability to have a changed life, and we could really go home and would be done, but in lieu of that. The historian Arnold Toynbee said, great civilizations are not murdered. Instead, they take their own lives. We are living in a great civilization that is hell-bent on murdering itself by enabling destructive behavior and calling it compassion. Recidivism is not a criminal term. At its core, it means falling back, back into the same habit patterns again and again. Come to think of it, as it was mentioned, isn't that the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results? The question is, if a person doesn't want to be helped, is there a logical way you can force someone to want a wholesome life? Sometimes life has to get really, really uncomfortable for a person to come to the realization that there must be a better way. In Alcoholics Anonymous, they call it hitting your bottom, which means you find yourself in the most degrading low place that you've ever been, and it sparks a stark realization I need help, which lends itself to an awakening to the reality that I can't live this way anymore. This is, that is the only place where real change can begin for chronic uh, homelessness. Please be assured that I am not referencing every person who finds himself without a roof over his head as chronically homeless, homeless nor can it be termed destructive behavior if through no fault of your own, a person or a family finds themselves temporarily without shelter. There are the situations that need to be, at, these are the situations that need to be at the top of the temporary housing assistance list. Assistance should come first to those who have traditionally worked hard to have a place to call home. Sometimes that hard work is not enough and the community and residents of Athens would sound, soundly agree that assistance is warranted. We should focus on our resident homeless, not the traveling nomad homeless. It is with great sincerity that I say that every person who lives on the street has value. Every human being has value, value that was assigned by God before the foundation of the world. That source of value can never be changed, nor can it ever be destroyed or diminished. Thank you, Ms. Evening. You cannot, nor will you ever end homelessness by providing a structure for every human being to live in. Chronic homelessness is a state of mind that is a rebellion against the norms of society. That rebellion is played out in every destructive choice made daily and over a lifetime. Choices compounded have consequences, and at least they are supposed to have consequences. If there are no consequences, there's nothing to motivate a person to change their destructive habit form. The evening. Hi. Uh, who do I give this to? Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Sarah Gehring. I live at 140 Griffith Street in Athens, Georgia, 30601. And I'm here to speak on item 30. I have a lot of respect for a lot of uh, good, well thought out ideas that have been presented in opposition of item 30. And I lack a lot of respect for the ugliness, cowardice, and ignorance apparent in others today. Before I get to the meat of this issue, I would like to say a word about representative government. Everyone in this room, commissioners and mayor, you have all been elected. And we elected you to govern. Many people in this room are calling for government by committee instead of government by the elected. Instead of government by people who were chosen by everyone in an election day, will be governed by busybodies and board retirees, which in the places that that have ha has happened so far, see our planning commission, hasn't gone very well. Furthermore, most of these people didn't elect you, and I hope that you will not be too swayed by the large crowd that they're able to get together of themselves. Asking for the impossible or inhumane with regards to the homeless population in Athens. To get to the meat of the issue, I strongly support item 30. I think it is a revolutionary idea. Anyone living in athens Clark County is an athens Clark County resident. I don't care how long they've been here. Anyone who sets their head down to sleep here is a resident of athens Clark County until they choose to leave. And every single one of them deserves the same amount of respect. There are a number of reasons that people cannot or will not enter shelters when they are unsheltered homeless. Some of these reasons you may have heard of include an inability to bring their belongings with them, an inability to bring their partners with them, or pets, uh, an inability to remain sober long enough to stay in a shelter. Some shelters are outright homophobic, not saying that they should go away. They're useful for the people that they're useful for, but they're not for everyone. Because of all of these reasons, unsheltered homelessness is an ongoing problem, and the availability of a space for unsheltered homeless people to congregate where they will not fear constant eviction will allow service providers easier access to provide assistance. It will allow people a measure of security that they could not get elsewhere for a very, very low price uh, compared to the price of sheltering them. I understand and completely agree that this is not an entire solution to homelessness. And I'm sure that none of you think that either. But it is a wonderful first step. Thank you. Thank you very much this evening. Good evening. Hi, uh, my name is Graham Jarbo. Uh, I live at 545 Rosanelle Howard Street. Um, and I'm actually from Athens. Like I lived here all my life and went to UGA on like a lot of the transplants uh, who didn't vote for y'all who are here today. Um, and I just want to say it's clear from a lot of the stuff that a lot of these people said that they don't have any real world experience with homeless people. Um, some people are probably going to say that that's not true. We work with nonprofits, et cetera. Um, but I know the homeless people that live around me and I know my neighbors, including my homeless neighbors. Um, and every person deserves somewhere to stay. And a lot of these people are talking like establishing this homeless encampment will be the first ever encampment of homeless people in Athens, Clark County. And that's obviously not the case. These people are here, they sleep somewhere every night, they have to. That's kind of the nature of being alive. The other thing is, the only difference between this encampment and what's going on now, where these people are have to be wherever they can find a place to set their tent down, is that these homeless people will have a sense of security in that they don't get swept out by leisure services, police, their belongings aren't destroyed, um, they don't have to face losing everything that they've managed to gather up um, every few days from the city and state violence. And so I think that it's not a great step. I don't see almost any representation for actual homeless people here. There's no homeless people speaking that I know of, um, but it's better than nothing. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate you coming out this evening. Good evening. 
Hello, my name is John. I'm a board member. I live in Athens. I'm a board member of the Athens Homeless Coalition, chair of the Camp Engagement Committee. I was charged with leading the point in time count last week. I'm a former director of Athens PBJs, which provides friend or is a nonprofit to give friendships and community between homeless and non-homeless people. Um, and most importantly, a familiar face and longtime friend of a number of unsheltered individuals in our community. Individuals experiencing homelessness have very few options when it comes to where to sleep on any given night in Athens Clark County. There are two shelters they've been referenced. One is Bigger Vision. It's a call-in model where you call in at 4 p.m. every evening. They fill up in 10 minutes every single day. The other is the Salvation Army, which requires you pass a breathalyzer and drug screen to be permitted into their premise. As we know, many of our unsheltered neighbors suffer with substance use disorder and cannot meet that barrier at the Salvation Army. They also, many people choose not to stay in shelter due to wanting to have a sense of self-autonomy. They may not like the rules. They may not like the people around that stay at those shelters. But even if they did want to stay in a shelter, we simply do not have enough beds for them all. This leaves tons of Athenians to find or create alternate shelter on any given night, many of which do so via informal and illegal unsanctioned camps all around town on both public and private property. And on these camps, they regularly get broken up by both public and private landowners several times per month all around town. And when these camps get broken up, it induces all kinds of trauma. Um, and these, client, these clients and friends of mine always ask, John, where can I put my tent up? I usually tell them, I don't know. And then maybe off the record suggest another piece of unused woods where the same thing happens a few weeks down the road. Anywhere from a day to a few months down the road, these people get removed again. While in these camps, we homeless service providers are not legally able to provide porta potties or trash cans or trash services to these people. That leaves people defecating in the woods, piling their trash in large piles, um, and honestly, fending, uh, living in a daily fear that they'll be evicted from that spot on any given day or their belongings be stolen. They have no security of their belongings. This is not a conducive environment to hold a job or to make a housing appointment or to hold all of your documents to achieve housing in a housing appointment. Even if someone wasn't using substances, had no mental health concerns, had all their documents and made all their appointments, the fastest they can achieve housing is about three to four months. And that is the, the truth. Where are these people going to go in that three or four months? The idea for a sanctioned camp came from people as they were regularly being evicted. They asked, why can't we stay here? Can't we just get trash cans to keep it clean? Can't we get porta potties to use the restroom? And I said, no, because we need the landowner's permission. Over the past several months, this initiative has become hyper-politicized and a victim of scope creep. We are advocating for a cheap, low-budget harm reduction facility so people can put up a tent and use a porta potty Not one to one and a half million dollars. Those projects should be buying hotels and building affordable housing. We're asking for $100,000 or less, put out an RFP for homeless service providers to step in the role and create a camp that people can have a safe and secure environment. Camping is going to continue whether we approve this or not. Let's give people an ethical location that they can put their tent up, use the restroom in a toilet, throw their trash in a trash can, and hold all their documents, have a safe, secure, sanitary place that they can go to their housing appointments and achieve housing. This is an important resource on our continuum of care and an important first step. How do we expect anyone to get out of homelessness if they're fighting to meet their basic needs every single day? Thank you Thank for you. coming down. Good evening. Hey, Reverend Ortiz, I live on 64 Prince Avenue with my lovely wife for two years. I'd like to give you two options to look at as a governing body. We hope and hope with dignity, uh, which are two homeless encampment programs, and that they have worked very well. Research those before you make further decisions and if you've not already made up your mind. Recently, my wife and I in the last two years have collected at least a dumpster full of trash from our residents. We have been disrupted at two in the morning, three in the morning with people beaten trying to break into our home. Homeless people, drunk, high, half naked. We've had called the cops numerous of times. My wife has been threatened three times to be killed by a lady while we walked in our neighborhood. We've had a trash galore on our church property. We've had uh, needles that we've collected filthy underwear and panties from women and men that have left their clothes behind. Just Sunday evening, my wife and I met Anita, who was homeless, sleeping on our front lawn, passed out. We thought she was dead. My wife and I approached her, spoke with her, turned out she was homeless, and at Lawrenceville uh, County, dropped her off here because she was told she can get a house to live in for free. And she's been here for a week now, 
and camping on the streets, living and going back and forth. My wife and I took her in. We talked to her for a while. We gave her $10, sent her to Dunkin' Donuts, told her to go buy a, cup of, a glass of Coke or something, sit in the air conditioner. It was humid. It was hot. And I was afraid that she would probably end up passing out or maybe dying even worse on our lawn. And I asked her if we can help her out with anything else. We'd be glad to. We have picked up even a 12-inch blade out of our barbecue grill behind our property from a homeless person. Now, you tell me, what does a homeless person need with a 12-inch blade? It seems like you guys have two hot topics this evening. I'm not going to go into the politics of the homeless encampment. I think you have a plethora of that. But I'm going to give you two wise advice opinions that I see happening here. You have article number 28, article number 30. And it seems like the problem you have is that your community quit trusting this body. And you need to really reflect upon that comment. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Chase Lawrence. My address is 100 Cloverhurst Circle. And uh, Athens is home for me. It's where my wife and I both graduated from University of Georgia, and it's where we've chosen to raise our family, and we've been here over 20 years. And we've grown our business here, and we've, we've tried to make investments in the community and in the future. Um, and most recently, I've, I've come to a place where I've lost faith in our process a little bit because in my own line of work, I focus on real estate investment. And because of that, I listen very closely to our planning commission and to you as my mayor and commission. And I hear what you're saying. And I listen to your vision for what you see as the future of housing here in Athens. And I heard you when you said that you wanted to see more one and two bedroom affordable, inclusive options, floor plans that would appeal both to working professionals as well as um, you know retirees looking to downsize. And I heard you when you said you want to see more affordable commercial space with more flexible terms and not afterthoughts of the ground floors of student high rises downtown, but intentional, thoughtful design um, that we, we pre-planned with the neighborhood. And I also heard you when you said that you wanted more connectivity. And uh, in my own development, I've recently purchased seven acres at the intersection of Barber and Tracy Street. And I brought before you a plan for over 100 residents to live there and over 10,000 square feet of space for small businesses to get their start and to create a thriving hub of outdoor dining. We created one of the first outdoor food plazas that I'm aware of in Clark County. And we created a, a space for small scale business to, to get a start where our rents downtown have become, in often cases, unaffordable. And that received unanimous approval, both from the Planning Commission and from this body. And actually, looking back over the transcripts, it was praised as a benchmark of what you wanted to see for responsible and sustainable future development. And now I'm finding that across the street from this project, we're proposing that we put a temporary encampment. And, and I've seen firsthand, I've, I've spent a lot of time recently in the past couple of weeks on Willow Street. And I've also spent a lot of time throughout my career managing properties in Clark County, um, being called downtown to ask to, to unfortunately ban individuals from private property where they've, they've taken up residence. And I've seen firsthand what happens in these encampments and I don't think it's a good fit for what you've said we're proposed and approved to do at this major intersection. We're making a significant investment in that neighborhood and I see a bright future for it. And I just ask you to pause. And, and, and just review options again, um, because I don't think it's a good fit. And I don't have all the answers here, and I don't have any answers for this challenge, but I do respect the magnitude of what you're facing. And I'll just tell you that my own family, we like to come alongside and support people who have dedicated their lives to championing these issues, because they know how to do it best. And I don't try to create the answers. I just stick in my lane, and I do what I do. And so I encourage you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Good evening. Hi. I'm the Reverend Laura Patterson. I live at 125 Ashton Court, um, and I'm the pastor at Oconee Street United Methodist Church. I am speaking in favor of the homeless encampment. Since December, um, I have spent my day off every week camping, or sorry, cooking for those who are living on our streets. Um, I do this because I follow Jesus and he tells me to feed those who are hungry and that what I've, whatever I do to the least of these, I do to him. Our friends on the streets are the least of these in our community. And while I have heard a number of folks speak against this encampment in terms of questioning the morality 
of those who are homeless, I want to question the morality and the ethics of continuing to leave people homeless. Housing people literally, definitionally, ends homelessness. If you have a place to live, you are then not homeless. If you have a place to receive services, if you have a place to keep your stuff safe, if you have a place to lock your door, if you have a place to lay your head at night where you know your neighbors, your quality of life is going to improve. I've come to know the names of some of my homeless neighbors. Some of those on Willow Street, I've watched people be evicted from other camps across the city. I've worked with people through mutual aid efforts to track them down and find them just so that we can get them something to eat. I have led ministries to collect food, to collect tents, to, to collect personal care items. And I can tell you that allowing people to encamp in some place where they are not at th constant threat of eviction is not only the logical, smart thing to do, it is the moral and ethical thing to do. I don't care about what trash is produced. Homeless folks camp at my church too. We just clean up after them. I'm not concerned about drug use and whatever moral judgment others may pass on them. Jesus tells me I'm not the one judge. And so friends, I'm telling you, make the moral choice, make the ethical choice, and house our homeless neighbors, even if it is just a temporary solution in an encampment. Thank you. Jimmy, we only have one opportunity for okay. public input. I didn't know this guy here gave me his time back there. Yeah, so we, I, I'm sorry, okay. we don't have rules to accommodate that. I apologize. All right, okay. I've seen someone else that did it, so I'm sorry. It, Mayor. It, it was a very ad hoc in the middle, obviously. I apologize. Thank you. Good evening, Lane Pratt. I live on 156 Woodhaven. I just want to reiterate the comments apologize. that were made. Let, let, let me get your name again. I apologize. Lane Pratt. Lane Pratt. I want to reiterate the comments that were made earlier that we haven't heard from our homeless community here. We're talking about people who have dignity and rights, and we're talking about them as if they're a pest or a nuisance to be taken care of without asking for their input. I know from the mutual aid groups that if you were to ask these people who are living in our city right now, they have ideas about how they could productively use a safe place. As has been discussed earlier, these encampments are already happening. I've helped clean many of them. I've helped clean them the day before ACC came through and cleared them out and evicted them with no notice, even though they'd promised multiple weeks for people to clear out their belongings. People have talked about the refuse building up. People have talked about the bathroom problem. And then the same people turn around and are friends with business owners who will not allow homeless people to come use their bathroom or fill up their water bottle. And we do not have many public bathrooms or water sources in this town. We're talking about a safe, safe place for people to land and fill water safely, not out of the creek, not out of the river. We're talking about a place for people to safely use the bathroom so that they aren't defecating in our watershed. We're talking about a place where there are dumpsters and trash cans to collect the trash instead of doing it on an ad hoc basis when it becomes an eyesore and the property owners complain about it. And I think that any conversation that takes place, again, needs to include the people that this is affecting and the people whose lives are currently in limbo where they don't know where they can sleep. And I'd like everyone to consider what that would mean if on any given day you didn't know that when you returned home, it would still be there. Thank you. Thank you for coming this evening. Appreciate your input. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Mocha Jasmine Johnson. I'm here to speak on behalf of item number 28. I'm with the Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement. Five years ago, hundreds of us um, community members advocated for the previous mayor and commission to establish a civil rights committee, and we received an inclusion office and a watered-down anti-discrimination ordinance. And I want to know if the legislative review committee recommendations are adopted today, what will be different? How would these recommendations be used to benefit not only business owners, but also the people of Athens? And how will you address the internal how will you address internal discrimination complaints similar to the complaint recently filed by Ms. Maddox, the internal auditor? 
You see, discrimination come in various forms, and sexism is one of them. On May 5, 2020, the Athens Clark County Internal Auditor Stephanie Maddox filed a discrimination complaint with AADM. In her complaint, Ms. Maddox alleged experiencing retaliation and intimidation from her male colleagues, specifically Manager Blaine, Manager Blaine Williams, and Mayor Gertz, after she filed a lawful open records request. This is an example of hostile sexism, and the people deserves a response to these allegations. Within the Legislative Review Committee recommendations, it states, the mayor and commission find that discrimination in the business dealings of this community members and or visitors harms the person involved. It impairs the ability of the unified government to attract new business and new community members and visitors. It is inconsistent with the unified government's goal to embrace inclusion and diversity while taking action to increase equity. So if each and every one of you are willing to stand by that statement, you should start by reviewing internal issues. This document should be more than just words on paper. I want you to take into serious consideration the recent discrimination complaint that was filed with our organization by the internal auditor. Why did she not feel protected? I'm asking you to do more than just adopt this ordinance, but to also develop a plan that ensure unlawful discrimination is thoroughly addressed within our community. Thank you for joining us this evening. All right, if there's no further public input, we'll go ahead and join commissioners. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> uh, Travis Williams, District 8. Uh, you know, it seems like people are pretty against the, uh, <clears throat> the homeless encampment, right? And on some level, I get it. If you uh, kind of view the role of government as something that's supposed to stay out of your way, is something that's supposed to facilitate <clears throat> your individual choices, right, in, in a way that's very uh, you-focused, then something as communal as a, as a homeless encampment isn't going to make sense to you. Right. And that doesn't mean you're a bad person. Doesn't mean you're evil. It means you disagree with me fundamentally. Right. But it doesn't mean you're bad. I think that when we when we look at the the efficacy of this choice of this policy, that's separate from what I think the real argument from people who are against the encampment have been making all night. The arguments have really been that this is not the business of government. Right. Uh, it, it isn't so much that this is bad in and of itself or inherently evil, but this isn't the business of government, right? I, my view on government is uh, if it's not here to help me, I have no use for it, right? And if it's not here to help my neighbor, I also have no use for it, right? Each week, I organize with <clears throat> dozens of people to feed at least 75 families and probably another 120 individuals at the camps around town. These, this camp life is an unstable life, right? We understand that, but when you go from week to week, the police bust it up, right? Because of, because of real concerns, real calls, right? We don't, we don't have a, a communal culture in place to really support this move, but maybe this resolution, maybe this move itself is a step in the right direction. But as long as we're looking at affordable housing as some sort of artifact, like a book, I produce and give it, and not a virtue, uh, a virtue that guides how we do uh, land use policy, how we do environmental policy, and how we do economic policy, then we're gonna fail, right? So something real, real needs to be done. And I, and I hear the people when they're talking about, like, uh, help the homeless people here. I don't look at athens Clark County as being some kind of private club. But if we are going to look at it that way, there shouldn't be any homeless families who go to CCSD. Right? It shouldn't be anyone homeless who works here in Clark County. Right? It shouldn't be anyone who's starving, anyone who's suffering, who lives here in Clark County. Right? You talk about a job. The homeless day center showers don't open up till 10 a.m. Open up the parks. 
let people go in there and shower, let people go in there and use the uh, washer and dryer. So that's it. Thank you for coming Peace. down this evening. Thank you. Anyone else before we begin deliberation this evening? Good evening. Good evening, y'all. Thanks for being here. My name is Stephanie Flores. I'm at 462 Cleveland Avenue. Um, I'll just start by echoing all that Travis just spoke before me and all that Mocha also spoke before me. Um, I think we need to be protecting workers, especially our county employees, and I think we need to be protecting our neighbors, um, as those that Travis was mentioning. Um, so I want to speak to... I also want to thank y'all for looking towards opportunities such as those reflected in line items 26 and 27. Um, so that is the proposed intergovernmental agreement with the affordable housing um, project at Bethel Homes. Um, and these projects can positively impact local workers and the development of our town. So I urge y'all when coming to the table with developers to ask yourself, am I bringing Athens workers to the table with me? What kind of questions would a worker ask if they were sitting right here next to me? What kind of demands were they, would they make? What kind of conditions would they state that they want to work in? And when I'm at the table, am I bringing those employers with me? And I'm not asking y'all to ask, well, what's been done before? Although that's important, but mostly like, what is possible? Like, what can I envision as a possibility that, is, that will elicit justice and, and fair outcomes? Um, which is what we're doing with the homeless encampment too. It's, it's not the solution, but it's a step in the right direction of what is going to elicit a, a more fair condition. And a fair condition is not to live in constant fear of, of whatever you own being taken away because of the circumstances that you're in. Um, so just a couple of like specific points. Can we make sure that developers and Athens employers in general pay prevailing wages and wages that Athenians can thrive on? Can we also make sure that we are supporting the right of people to exist safely, uh, which is yeah, what we're doing with line item 13. Um, and in doing so, while we're engaging in, in those activities, can we also invest in apprenticeship programs to connect people with jobs that can sustain their families? So that's youth apprenticeships, that's apprenticeships for homeless folks, um, connecting people with jobs. Everyone has a skill and everyone's skill can be developed. And like we need to be able to harness those skills and connect them with opportunities that exist. <laughs> Um, we have a $30 million opportunity that's coming our way right now, so it shouldn't be difficult to find and connect people to those jobs. And then lastly, can we make sure that we're partnering with local labor rights organizations and community stakeholders in general um, to provide oversight during these processes and to bring these workers to the table with us if that's not something we feel like we can do uh, as a commission. Um, not to say that you're not connected with people as you are, um, but there are folks who work, like I work with people in my day-to-day -day job, I connect them with resources. Um, as a neighborhood leader. And so maybe reaching out to folks who are very much connected with workers and with individuals and ask them to bring folks to the table um, so that we can make sure that all folks are represented. So I just want to again thank you all for your time and um, appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak to these items. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, last call for anyone who'd like to speak to us this evening. Evening. Well, if nothing else, we've shown the need for a mask mandate. Uh, it's kind of a super spreader back here. Um, but I, I want to speak on uh, item number 28. And uh, I'm so glad you all seem really ready to take action on the, in the swift passage of the non-discrimination ordinance. And now also voting to declare the intent to form a human rights commission to help enforce it and advise you all on other needed pro policies and procedures. It seems like we've got this. Thank you. Um, Y'all know where I stand on this, so I want to take my time to reiterate one of the reasons why this matters to me. Many of you know my story, but my partner, I'll call him Michael, comes across as gay once you get to know him. We met a long time ago on Valentine's Day. He's sexy, kind, funny, and honest to a fault. He's also an extremely talented web designer. He's worked for many great companies, including AT&T.com, theweatherchannel.com, autotrader.com, and a number of other major web design houses. Why so many? Because even though he's amazing at coding web pages and creating innovative designs and solutions, he's been let go over and over and over. They never say why, but it's never for his work or his attitude. It's always been easy to read between the lines, though. It's really just because he comes across as gay. When I worked at Autotrader at Com 
autotrader.com, same time he did, I was a manager of another area under the same director. Related people working at the company were not uncommon, even though Michael and I were technically roommates. I was present during his firing after him being there three months on the job with exceptional productivity records. Typically, the employee should get a verbal notice and a first, second, and third written notice, at least the straight white ones. He got let go with none of this and no clear explanation. When my director learned that Michael and I were lovers, my next performance evaluation went from its regular all 4.5 out of 5s to zeros across the board. So I quit. OK, um, that was all past. And all the ises I mentioned should have been wases. My partner, Shane, is at home preparing a late dinner. Michael, Eugene Adams, my previous partner, had enough of getting fired for coming across as gay specifically and is now dead. He committed suicide for this very reason a few years back. There are a lot more Michaels out there, and they're in Athens. Please, I know y'all don't agree on everything, but pass something tonight on this, hopefully with a better enforcement mechanism. Thank you for all your work on this. Thank you. The, Madam Clerk, that was Alan Jones for the record. Last call. All right, we're going to move to commission input and action. Mr. Mayor, I move to recess for 10 minutes. And, uh, do I hear a second? I second it, yes. All right, all right. Uh, we'll go ahead and recess uh, for 10 minutes. It's 8.05. We'll see you back in your seats at 8.15. All right, thanks, everyone.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, just a little programming note, uh, to, just to uh, be able to let everybody get some rest tonight. Uh, we're going to reorder the agenda slightly, and uh, we're going to handle item 30, then 28, and then the remainder of old new business and zoning items. So, uh, again, we're going to begin with item 30. All right, uh, may I receive a motion from a member of the body to so reorder? So Seconded. All right, I've got a motion from Commissioner Thornton and a second from Commissioner Myers. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, any opposed? All right, so we're going to move on with discussion of item number 30. Would uh, entertain a motion from the body or any comment from a member? Uh, Commissioner Houle. Uh, Mayor Gertz, I'd like to make a motion to approve item 30, and I'll save my comment for if I get a second. All right, I've got a motion from Commissioner Houle. There's a second. I'll second. All right, I've got a motion from Commissioner Houle, a second from Commissioner Link. All right, uh, Commissioner Houle, would you like to provide comment? Yeah, I guess I'll. Am I audible through this thing with the. Yes. Uh, so I'm glad we're having this conversation. Uh, until this resolution, we were not talking about this in City Hall, uh, certainly not the way we are now. And so, for no other reason than that, I'm certainly glad that we have this resolution driving now tonight's agenda item to take the next step, which is one of many. Um, I think first and foremost to address the concerns of many in the room, we are talking about people who are already here and who have nowhere to go and who need help. People are already sleeping outside and the shelters are already at capacity. So while we search for the best way forward on the latter half of the resolution, which does map out a strategic plan and sets parameters for how we will continue to collaborate with agencies in the community to have permanent supportive housing and to expand shelter capacity and invest in other needed work that's being done to address mental health and substance use, et cetera. This stopgap measure is an overdue attempt to provide a compassionate, sanitary and safe response to the dire situation that many people who live in this community are currently in. I'm very grateful for John's comments. Uh, one of the many people who have been working on the front lines with the homeless population, who also helped work on that resolution and is continuing to engage with this government and our housing and community development department, who's worked overtime on this to try to address this swiftly and responsibly and compassionately. Uh, I want to just share one last thought and then I'll give over the floor. And it's from Brent Temple, who couldn't be here tonight. He sent us an email. He's another person on the front lines. And he said, with this structured homeless encampment initiative, we aim only to remove barriers from the most vulnerable among us. We are not solving homelessness with this initiative, but giving desperate people a needed leg up to engage in the services we have in Athens with their most basic needs addressed. This is the least expensive and most effective intervention per person available to us for these most vulnerable citizens. The service community is excited about the land identified. I hope you will address the budget through the RFP. And I believe it is too early to argue about the funding. The numbers that you may have seen are preliminary and not yet grounded in fact. The initiative stands to empty the camps at Willow Street and Old Hull Road safely and without traumatizing the community. We have heard no other solutions offered to serve this part of the community, so please choose this initiative over doing nothing. Thanks. All right, uh, Commissioner Link is second, or would you like to provide comment? Um, yeah, first of all, I wanna thank um, the providers who have had input on this along the way. Um, they have been consulted, contrary to some of the statements of some of the folks who spoke. And I really question um, whether or not some of the folks who spoke in opposition to this even read the agenda item. Um, it's crystal clear in the agenda item that um, you know the government will not be running this site. We will be sending out an RFP to ask those who are are experts in this area to um, come up with a plan to run such a site. We're merely identifying a location, providing some funding and some infrastructure. This is something that's long overdue, and part of the reason that we are in the situation we're in with clearly a homelessness crisis in our community, with people sleeping 
on the streets and in tents and in the woods all over and on porches and people's sheds. I mean, I get, I get emails and calls from constituents regularly, at least once a week. Some people find folks asleep on their porches and in their sheds and they're very compassionate. They don't know what to do. This gives people a place to send them. Um, so I think it's, it's high time that we, we did something like this. And part of the reason we need to do something like this is because this local government has not provided resources for our homelessness service providers throughout the years. Um, this is just a first step and hopefully we are committed to um, truly solving the crisis of unhoused people in this community, truly providing affordable housing and appropriate mental health and job training resources for folks who cannot find a place to live. So um, I look forward to this moving forward and um, I look forward to the providers out there working with them to have a truly successful project that can move people out of homelessness. I've got uh, Commissioner Wright uh, and then uh, telephonically Commissioner Mark and then Commissioner Hamby. Um, thank you. There's, I think, one, two, three, five parts to the, I think, the request uh, on this motion. The one that um, I'm aligned to supporting, but it, I don't, there's not a way to support it without uh, taking it out of uh, the other context is the um, allocating money for us to facilitate a comprehensive homeless service strategic plan. I think that the strategic plan is what needs to be happening uh, for us to have an appropriate plan that does include the partners and understanding what works and what doesn't work. But my question that goes with this idea of the strategic plan facilitator, um, Mr. Manager, can you, can you guys update me on our homeless coordinator position that we have and wouldn't that be uh, an appropriate place for this strategic planning to start? So the, the, the homeless coordinator position uh, has not been filled yet. Uh, the funding was just made available. I think if I remember correctly, some, some uh, positions funded in the budget were staggered for later mm -hmm. in the year. I, if it was available at, at the soonest, it would have been July 1st and, okay. and uh, we're just a month in. Uh, that person, uh, you know, that job description is someone that would be working with the homeless coalition more directly and assembling data and, uh, it, uh, you know, working with the HMIS because we don't have any dedicated staff for that right now. And uh, that supports the idea that the government can help as a facilitator and coordinator, uh, leveraging the services that the nonprofits provide that um, and need further support. Uh, our thoughts were that this would be not just a, um, a, a, a routine exercise that we would hopefully bring in somebody with uh, ideas of best practices in other communities, could challenge the stakeholders, but listen and, and get the best from them to create a really comprehensive homeless uh, strategy for both the government and the nonprofit. So the thought was we would we don't have anybody in mind, but find somebody and a third party objective outside facilitator to come in and work with the stakeholders that are doing the work. Okay, and um, I appreciate you explaining that to me because I, I do believe that that's the first step that we should be doing before um, a lot of the other recommendations within the current agenda. Thank you. All right, I'm going to turn to Commissioner Parker, who's with us by telephone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to speak um, in favor of the proposal. I think that we had a lot of people folks come out tonight that expressed some very real concerns about the current state of homelessness that we're experiencing in the county, but it's important to note that these realities are operating on the status quo when we aren't providing pe people the stability that they need to thrive. Um, with regard to some anecdotes people had, had expressed around harassment or crime, um, that's happening is people don't have the stability of a, a place to call their own the rest of their head of nights where they, you know, know they can come home to their stuff still being there and know that they will be, you know, bodily secure in a place where their own rights won't be violated um, because there are safety measures in place with regards to the cleanliness of town. That's something we've received a lot of concerns about email. Uh, people throwing trash or not having a place to, you know, throw trash away is the result of not having... Um, a space for people to legally be that is provisioned with basic sanitation services so that they can be a productive part of keeping our community clean. Um, the question of folks getting jobs. Um, I, for one, a lot of homeless people do work but still can't afford 
um, the rising rents in athens Clark County, but it's really hard to get a job. It's, your documentation gets thrown away by ACCPD when your camp gets swept. Um, and if you don't have access to a shower to maintain, you know, basic uh, hygiene uh, before and after you, you know, go to work every day. And so the question of why can't people just go out and get a job and become stable? I think that taking this interim step um, as a part of a larger spectrum of services we are aiming to implement to um, address the crisis of homelessness in our community um, actually tackled a lot of what we heard the speakers this evening expressing concern about, and it's one of the reasons why I'm in favor of the proposal. But ultimately, I do think it's just a moral and ethical thing to do um, in a county with such, well, no one should have to live outside. And so beginning that process of stabilization so that we can transition people to more permanent housing settings is necessary. It's a necessary first step. And I want to say thank you to all of the to, to, to staff as well as to um, the nonprofit uh, partners in the community who have come to the table to give us advice on uh, how to build out that spectrum of services and um, those. And I, and I, I just urge my colleagues to support this. Um, initiative tonight. It's not everything, but it's a desperately needed first step, um, and it's a, it's the moral and ethical thing to do. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, I'm going to turn to Commissioner Hamby. Thank, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it, and appreciate the appreciate the time everybody has spent spent here tonight. And I must say, I've been I've been looking over the uh, agenda item. I've looked over it uh, since it came out to us on on Friday of the past week, and, uh, and the materials that Blaine Williams. Uh, Manager Williams has sent to us. It was very good material and and uh, helped help help shed a light on what it is that we're actually currently doing with our with our homeless uh, population, our unhoused population, and our indigent services. I mean, and when you look at the list that he provided us, we we're doing quite a bit, uh, especially with the way we allocated the CARES dollars uh, for for homelessness and for rent assistance and for and for food. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm proud that this body did things like that and, and appreciate that. And I think we also learned a lot from that, though, you know, certainly, certainly uh, about how to, how, to, how to make sure that unhoused have a shelter over their head. I keep going back to the, uh, to the, to the, uh, uh, the pastor from, um, from Oconee uh, ch uh, Church there, um, um, the morality of continuing to leave homelessness as it is, and and that's that's been that's weighed on me for a lot. But she said it, and I was like, that's a, that's what's been weighing on me, and why it's weighing on me is, and why this why this action that we're taking tonight is weighing on me, is because what it's asking us to do is to leave homelessness the way it is. Yeah, you know, we aren't we aren't putting up shelters for anybody we're, if you you know what this is going to do for approximately 50 people is to is to still keep them homeless they're moving from one homeless place to another homeless place and like we did with cares and like we do with other things i think we ought to really be thinking bigger this this shouldn't be our first step our first step should be how do you put a roof over somebody's head i keep going back to when we when we were talking about the architecture for downtown, you know, the concern of having the, uh, the middle bar and the benches so somebody could, somebody could sleep on the benches. And I think I said at the time, you know, we shouldn't be worried about people sleeping on benches. We should be worried about them sleeping in beds. And, and I think that's what we ought to be doing here tonight. And there's ways where we can do it. We did it during the CARES money with some hotel vouchers. And, and what I would suggest is let's, you know, we're looking at spending $300,000 uh, tonight, two hundred fifty thousand of, of that goes to uh, get that site ready over on Barber Street for it, and fifty thousand dollars goes for a study. But if you look at the expenses of, of, of future expenses that uh, after an RFP, there may be even more. I mean, these are just estimates that I appreciate staff putting these together. And we've put a lot on y'all these days, and and the work you're doing is 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 in answering the majority of the commission has has been has been what you. What the majority of the commission has said to do, so it's 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 appreciated that we have this information in front of us, and I'm I'm, I'm gonna hurry up. I'm sorry, I didn't I forgot forgot the daggum clock. But uh, but what I would suggest uh, is let's look at what we've done in the past with the CARES dollars. Let's really put our minds together. We're a bright town. 
we're, we got some of the smartest people in this town. We got some of the most caring people in this town. And, and I think when we put our minds together, we can solve the solve solve this for a lot of people and make life better for a lot of people. But continuing to keep somebody homeless is is not is not the answer. And what I would suggest, and I'm going to make a motion, if you don't mind, Madam Mayor or Mr. Mayor, is is a, a substitute motion. And and I'm going to do this because we're spending the you know part of the RFP calls for spending the 1.7 and the 1.6. So basically, we'll be spending three million dollars. On, on this. That for 50 people, that's $60,000 a piece. Uh, and what I'm going to make a motion is, and, and, and I'm, I'm doing this on the fly and I apologize, but, but in, in thinking about making sure that we get the study in, which is, I think, important part of it. So let's do the study and let's take uh, the amount of dollars needed to, to, to uh, at least for 50 people and focus on the people that are at the CSX railroad property for the 50 people to focus on on providing uh, a hotel shelter, a real a real bed, a real shower, a real facility, and those wraparound services that may come with those 50, uh, 50 people that n need some help. Jamie Scott, Mr. Scott from Sparrows Nest knows all too well about the wraparound services that are needed. Let's engage the partners that we have engaged with over the years and over this COVID crisis and get them to help us provide this wraparound service so that we can start with these 50 people. Let's get them, let's, let's get them into a shelter. And so my motion is this, um, um, uh, direct staff to um, allocate, uh, help me, can you help me out here, Manager Williams? You see where I'm going, direct staff to, 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 to continue with the $50,000 study but also to direct staff, and I'm trying to skip the RFP process altogether because we've already had engines, engines and services provided to us from other partners. Uh, direct staff to engage previous recipients of engines and services funds to help with housing and wraparound services for um, uh, the folks uh, targeting the folk, the homeless unhoused around the CSX property. Does that, does that help give some clarification? All right, so I've got I don't a, know uh, what that dollar amount is, but we're spending, you know, we've already <laughs> said we've got $3 million on the table, so let's let's start there somewhere. And, and just, just uh, Attorney Drake, if I might, if that, just to say that it would be provided to all homeless persons, but with specific attention to those coming out of the CSX. Yes, sir. I mean, because obviously that's why we're here tonight is to is to focus on on that. But I would I would it would be nice to focus on if we can do more, let's do more. Yes. All right. So I've got a uh, substitute motion to allocate fifty thousand dollars to the strategic plan as outlined in the agenda report, and then direct staff to engage with previous service providers of indigent services to target the unhoused with a particular focus at the CSX occupants. All right. Is there a second? I'll second it. All right, I've got a second from Commissioner Thornton. Do I get to make a comment? Um, I'm, I'm going to provide okay. Commissioner Myers. I uh, oh, uh, indicated her, and then I'll return to you, Commissioner. Okay. All right, help me out a little bit with procedures, since there's a replacement motion in here. It's a new commissioner. Awesome. <laughs> so, so you, you, you can speak the to the breadth of the work. But can I speak to the first one? You, you, that's what you I was can speak going to, to the speak. agenda item broadly. I can speak to the yeah. agenda oh, item yes, broadly. Yes. Okay, so just to clarify that. Um, I, I am supporting the original, um, the original agenda item. Um, I have spent a, a, a lot of time speaking with homeless providers um, who are here tonight and who haven't, reading materials, reading the 34-page or five-page document that we got from our county staff, um, as well as really thinking deeply on this. Um, and, I, and I think that one of my... One of my uh, constituents is out there who I just met tonight who talked about um, all the people who were here tonight and how they might have a different focus in terms of the role of government. And I think that's probably very true. Um, I do see government as providing services that we as a community need, whether it's to help with our parks and recreation, to help with our roads, to help with people who are in a troubled situation as well. Most of the money that we will be using for this is going to come from federal funds. And in fact, if you read the agenda item carefully, I believe, and you can correct me, manager, on this, that the, the goal is to 
uh, reimburse us with the American Rescue Plan money for that 250000 if that's possible. That was, I thought I had read that. Is that correct? <clears throat> or we'll attempt to do that? Yes. Okay. So that's all. And I, and I just want to point out, I did a little math here. I pulled up our general budget. And um, this $250,000 that we're spending is 0.001% of our budget, and it's budget that we hope to get back. I, I also hear people talking about our homeless population here and, and the problems that are occurring because of their existence. And the, I see this as a way to help us as a community work with that. Our homeless population is not is here already. People are coming. People have told us about apps. Those apps are there already. People are here. So there are people who are here in need of housing, who are using public property, who are using our parks, who are using private property. So we are actually addressing community needs at the same time as helping our homeless. And, and the last thing I, I have to say is that I, I did spend, along with some of my fellow commissioners, some time about the half ago helping um, clean up one of the homeless encampments, which looks, as I rode by it on my bike the other day, just as full as it was, even more full than it was when we were there. And I, I just have to go back to my, my, my moral, the moral question of doing on to, to others and for caring for the poor. Um, you know, I went to mass every Sunday growing up in Catholic school, and the part of Christianity that I learned was helping the poor. And this is one way we can do it. Um, and it, and so I am supporting this. It is one step. I did pull up our continuum care, and I want you to know that the homeless continuum of care includes emergency shelter. This is one type of shelter. This is not the end of the story. This is one type of service. Uh, Commissioner Thornton. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor. And first of all, I want to um, thank staff for the detailed report that um, they did. It, it, it was much more than I had expected. Um, and I, I, it's two things I want to say. Uh, I did sign, I did, I did not um, co-sponsor or sign off on the resolution, but I did vote for it, mainly because I did want to see what was out there. And this is what the resolution did. It asked you to in investigate this and bring back um, a recommendation. My concern is that, um, and even with the speakers that came tonight, I appreciate all of you coming. But I guess my concern is, how do we get to this point where the most vulnerable are the ones that are really being um, kicked around or we're making decisions about when we could have done some of this as a community a long time ago? Um, I think Commissioner Link thanked thank the, um, the agencies that have been working on homelessness. Well, I must say publicly, I thank uh, Athens Alliance. They brought this to our attention, and they made the noise, and they rattled some fences, and people paid attention. But we drive by every corner and see people on the corners and either we give them something or we don't. But we've been seeing this, but we see it so much we became blind to it. So I appreciate everybody coming out here. I will be honest about it. I don't know if everybody came for the moral value or, or hill. I don't know that, and I'm not going to judge nobody. And my faith also tells me that um, we should help the homeless. If I wasn't the type of person that didn't get out in the streets and, and help clean up and feed them, and, and I did all of that. And I'm just wondering how many people that spoke tonight, have you done it? It's e it, 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 well, no, no, you ain't got to raise your hand. Is this ain't class? <laughs> okay? Uh, no, but I, I just asked the question. Commissioner, just... I, okay, look, 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 look. I, 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 uh, folks, and, we appreciate you having your time here in City Hall tonight. And time so for the commissioner to address am, the motion. I, I am. I'm not going to support um, the original um, proposal. I'm not going to support it. 
but I am supporting something that we need to be done. So I don't apologize for what I'm feeling right now because I know how much we've all done. And only God knows all of our hearts at the end of the day. But I do think that this would not have even been an issue if certain people didn't bring it to the forefront. Right, Commissioner Denson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I, I, I am uh, supporting the, the original motion. I, I, I'm, I'm supportive of the substitute motion, just I feel like talking about that we need to do a lot of these different things, that the structure encampment is one of those things. Um, and it's going to be difficult. It is. Um, but I, 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 we've done a good process. Actually, everybody was at the, on the agenda item. And history number 27 says, no, on July 22nd, ACCGov met with homeless shelter and service providers uh, to get feedback on both site and operational considerations for this policy. And that's Athens Area Homeless Shelter, Athens Alliance Coalition, Athens Homeless Coalition, Vantage Behavioral Health, Salvation Army, The Ark, Bigger Vision, Family Promise, ADDA, Project Safe, and the Backpack Project, so that this could be shaped by those service providers. And I think a lot of us have sat on a conference call with the Homeless Coalition in which they said, like, yes. I remember almost, I think if almost verbatim the word was, this is part of the solution. This is not the solution. This is part of the solution. That's coming from the folks who work with those people who are unhoused every single day, which I will admit that I am not, although I've gone out there and done some work here and there, but I am not someone who works with them every single day. I think outside of maybe two people who spoke, none of us are in this room. So if we're listening to the people who are on the ground doing this work, and they say this is part of the solution, I think it's about time that we listen and try to enact part of that solution. And this, the, the, the thing that, the other way I look at this, which I guess I'm surprised by some of the, the pushback on this, is that I've also got complaints in my district, I think all of us have, of homeless encampments popping up in our district behind neighborhoods, behind businesses, on little tiny strips of, of, of undeveloped property. And it, and it causes problems. That's what we're trying to solve, y'all. We're trying to get to a situation where you don't have trash in your yard, where you don't have people sleeping in your front yard because they can't find anywhere else, to, anywhere else to go. We're trying to provide somewhere else to go that has place that, that for solid waste to go, so it's not just being spread around, that has bathrooms, that has safe water, that, ha that creates a secure area for them to be, and also to have that direct connection with a service provider so that they can get into a better situation to get out of that homeless situation. So, I mean, honestly, for like 70% of the complaints I heard tonight, I'm like, y'all should be in favor of this because this is gonna fix that problem more than anything else that we're talking about is. Um, and, I'll, and I'll bring up, this is not a brand new idea. I don't know how many people are aware of HB 713, carried by Representative Katie Dempsey, a bipartisan bill, Katie Dempsey, Republican, uh, chair of, of, of uh, one of the chairs of the appropriations, supported the Reducing Street Homelessness Act of 2021, which created structure encampments. It's still a live bill, actually, for next year. This is a bipartisan bill, actually, led by Republicans. And um, so I, I think that this is something we need to be open-minded here. We need to do as much as we can, but this is definitely part of the solution. Is there anybody who has not spoken who would like to speak before I recognize Commissioner Hull again? Right, Commissioner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess I'll start from a point of connection and say that I share the passion and dismay that is overflowing in this room. Uh, there is uh, no doubt, I think, you're, I think Commissioner Thornton is right, you know, in asking how do we get to this point, she is correct that this problem has been ignored for too long by this government. There's been a lack of collaboration in this community, which could have and I think should have been facilitated by this government sooner. Um, and there has been an underinvestment, or at least not the best management of investment that's happened to date in this community. But regardless, we're at this point now. We have an opportunity to take action in partnership with the orgs who are on the front line every day. And I'd just like to remind everybody that in the resolution passed in June, which is Appendix 1 in tonight's agenda item, Sections 9, 10, 11, and 12, all of which include the emphasis, which is all over tonight's document and the June document, of collaboration with ACC staff and partner agencies, includes the 
the multi-year strategic plan, which it seems like we're all at least in agreement of funding tonight, um, and that that strategic plan should include, shall include, measurable goals and a plan for evaluating outcomes, those haven't been defined yet. Now, the strategic plan should also, shall also, outline and define policies for staff and how they go about engaging with encampments and evictions, how they go about responding to calls about people who are unhoused or perceived to be homeless. We have a huge backlog of things to get through, and the title of this document is The Resolution to Address Homelessness with Immediacy and Strategic Planning. I do believe that we can walk and chew gum at the same time, and I do not mean to belittle this scenario as so simple, because it's certainly not, but I would ask my colleagues to respect the tireless work that our understaffed Housing and Community Development Department has done in responding to the resolution we passed, bringing forth this measure tonight, honoring that work to take this next step, honoring the work of the nonprofits that we're all apparently claiming to collaborate with, that they've done in helping draft this resolution and helping get us to this point with tonight's agenda item, to take this next step knowing that there are many more steps to take and honor the original motion in lieu of the substitute motion. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Davenport. I just got a, a question for uh, Manager Williams. Um, you had mentioned during, um, he re-explained the RFP process that we'll, be, we'll, we'll have a stakeholder and yeah, can you explain that one more time, the process? Sure, with respect to the, the camp, um, it's been stated tonight, you know, to still try and use uh, homeless service providers, homeless shelter providers, their expertise and connections in the community and knowledge. And so that uh, the, the, uh, the agenda item contemplates uh, selection of the site, and then there would be a, immediately starting, you know, uh, tomorrow an RFP that would be put out to identify an operator of the camp uh, that would um, manage the population there, uh, the sanitation, the security, uh, things of that nature. And so we would go through a, an open and transparent process to identify uh, uh, someone that had experience with such things and that reasonable chance of success to do a good job. And, and we would uh, seek to bring them on board in the next 30, 60, 90 days through an RFP process. So the, um, the operator would essentially be one of the nonprofit organizations that's already dealing with um, homelessness in Athens, or it could be an individual or church or... There would be some selection criteria. I would expect it would be someone here locally that, that has local knowledge and experience running uh, homeless services or shelters. Can I make a comment, Mayor? Absolutely. Okay. Time is still yours. So as a Christian, I've, I've been mulling over this, um, and I thank everybody who have come out and spoke. Um, I will not be supporting the original motion. Um, I will be supporting the substitute motion, and the reasons are, are very. Um, last year, during our FY20 budget, we gave money to create a position with, that partnered with the Managed Behavior Health to help the, um, the homeless coordinator. This year, we gave money in our FY22 budget to help um, the homeless people in, in our community. We've done a prosperity package. We've done a lot of stuff in our community. I respect all the great people who are doing all the awesome work in our community and helping the homeless situation. But at the same time, we need an audit of where, where is money going what's been done, because if, if we continue to support the problem, all we're gonna have is the continued problem. And what I heard from the um, Homeless Coalition was, yes, this will be a step, but it's not gonna solve the problem. And the more times we keep putting our focus on, putting band-aids on problems, all we're gonna have is more problems. And it's not to belittle all the hard work and you know, the sincerity of these people trying to get off the street, but it's a, if these people are suffering substance abuse problems, mental health issues, and various other issues, that should be our focus. When day one, when we came in, we said affordable housing is our main issue. We still have that problem. So we can put up housing, we can spend all the money we want on a, for, um, on a homeless shelter, but at the end of the day, these people need homes. And if we're not focusing on breaking down this complex problem, we're gonna be back at the same situation a year or two years from now. So. All right. Appreciate it. Now it's time when we need to go ahead and deliberate. Uh, Commissioner Thorne. And I, and I guess my, my point is that, and I'll, I'll say it again, this, is, this finally has come 
back around and we do have to do something. But if I don't know what the criteria is for the RFP, if the, the points that Commissioner Hull mentioned is not clear, we're going to be voting blindly again. And Commissioner Davenport put it the best. We have done so much to help the least folk or the most vulnerable folk. And then we're back in the same place. There doesn't seem to be any accountability. There doesn't seem to be a, a well laid out plan. It looks like we're just voting because it feels good. I, I'm the first one to say I'm a Christian, but that also gives me wisdom too. And we need to use it sometimes. We can't keep helping people if we don't, who, who, who may have some issues and struggles. We got to know what those things are. I'm also bothered that we even would have to put out an RFP. It seems to me that we should have staff that would know this um, clientele, and they should be coming to us and telling us what they need. I'll go back to saying again, when we hire po folk and we put money into departments, there should be some level of expertise. We should not have to be going out everywhere seeing what somebody else is doing. We should be, be able to have those folk to tell us, Mayor and Commissioner, we need this. Mayor and Commissioner, we need that. But guess what? We haven't heard anything until this thing blew up a few months ago. We didn't hear anything from no agencies or anybody else, except for, the, um, like I said, Athens Alliance. So I'm through with it. I'm not voting for um, um, the original resolution. Uh, I am going to still stick with the um, substitute motion. I'm going to turn to Commissioner Link. Yeah, um, I just want to reiterate that um, this is pretty much an emergency stopgap measure. We have hundreds of people living on the streets, living in the woods sleeping on downtown corners and on other folks' porches right right now. In order to solve the problems that cause them to be in that situation, whether it's a lack of affordable housing in our community, whether it's mental health issues, substance abuse issues, lack of jobs, all of that stuff, that stuff takes a very, 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 very long time to figure out. We've got people who are in dire, dangerous situations right now. And certainly by passing this resolute or passing this this agenda item, we're not going to give them a place to sleep tomorrow, but we very likely could give them a decent, safe, sanitary place to go in the next, I don't know, two, three, four months. But all of those other things could take years, if not decades. This is an emergency. This is a crisis. When a hurricane hits, you put up an emergency shelter and you give people a roof over their heads. This is a slow moving hurricane that's been going on for decades. And you know, for, for those who talk about Christian faith, I grew up Catholic too. I went to mass twice a week because I went to Catholic school. And in, in Matthew 25, it says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. It doesn't say we did a bunch of studies and, and, and talked about accountability and sent out an RFP and all this other stuff first. We have a problem now and this is a way to at least stop the bleeding. Yes, it's a Band-Aid, but you know what? A Band-Aid is better than a gaping open wound. Turn briefly to Commissioner Hamby. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. I'm, I'm Catholic too, but I usually used to go to church once a w once a week. So I don't. I'm sorry, yeah, but I feel like I've gotten enough church tonight to satisfy me for the rest <laughs> of the year. So, uh, but I, I will say this. Uh, I will say this. The substitute motion is not is not a band aid. The substitute motion will will immediately immediately uh, address the situation. We've we've done it before with the cares money with the with the vouchers, and that's what the substitute motion includes. So I just want to make that clarification that this. This immediately starts to address the issue. All right, uh, I've got a substitute motion on the floor. The motion from Commissioner Hamby, second from Commissioner Thornton. Um, Commissioner Hull. I guess what's not clear to me about this substitute motion is how an on the fly motion, another one of these, 
uh, is somehow clearer than the 47 page report we have from staff that accompanies tonight's proposal. I think it's kind of absurd to describe a, a vague on the fly paragraph of giving money generally as somehow being a more effective, efficient, specific or transparent method than tonight's proposal. Regarding Commissioner Davenport's comments, you got to put a suture on the wound before you can address the underlying condition. So, you know, I, I think Commissioner Link covered well, <laughs> and as well as many others tonight, why this is obviously not the whole thing, but it's a key component. Uh, we are not leaving homelessness the way it is by passing tonight's proposal, but the putting of roofs over people's heads is going to take far more time than putting this in place. This is something we're hoping to turn around as soon as possible within 90 days. There ain't gonna be permanent supportive housing in 90 days. We ain't gonna work out even more RFPs with more nonprofit organizations to figure out how they can best expand their shelters in to be determined buildings in 90 days. If we commit to 22 months and we found permanent supportive housing solutions with the urgency that we're also committing to tonight, less, in less time than that, then we don't have a need for this for as long as we're allowing ourselves. But this at least gives us something right now, because let's make no mistake about it. If we don't pass this tonight, then we are leaving ambiguous how long it remains the case that anyone who is already unhoused gets evicted and has nowhere to go except outside the county or prison. Those are the only options legally that this government has afforded people who have no resources. The only options available to them is to flee in exile or be locked up. And I believe that it, the onus is on us to provide something better for now until we can actually provide the good stuff that it sounds like we're all in agreement we want to do in the future. All right, I've got a substitute motion on the floor. I, Commissioner I, Edwards. Um, I, uh, I, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Hamby's attempt to, to broker some, some sort of compromise here to get to move something forward. Um, However, I, I'm, I'm not able to, uh, to vote in favor of his uh, substitute motion just for, for the reason that I, I would just need a little more time to consider uh, what he was proposing with the, with the allocations of funds, et cetera. Um, I, however, I, I salute his effort, but um, I, I just respectfully um, am going to vote no on this one. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Thornton. I think somebody, I think. Um, um, I may sound like I'm being sarcastic, um, but I do have to respond to um, Commissioner Hull's um, comment. Um, where do where will people have to go to jail or whatever his analogy was? And there was a gentleman that spoke tonight, and he asked a, a question that really resonated with me. How many of us would? invite the homeless to come and stay with us. There's some place to go. Do you want to open up your house? But I'm being sarcastic, but it's real, because we got to treat people the way we want to be treated. So I'm, I'm, I'm stick with the, the, the substitute motion, but it's easy to tell somebody else what to do. It's easy to have suggestions and if you're not writing the check, if you're not um, being accountable, if it doesn't fall back on you, we do it and then we move on to the next thing. But we gotta take responsibility for everything we do. And we are not, we have not been the best stewards of accountability. There's been questions, the RFPs have been questionable in the past, the process, the process. Um, so it's easy to say, let's do this, but who's going to be accountable at the end of the day? So I just wanted to share that. Uh, again, I want to thank everybody for sharing. And um, let's, let's do what's best for folk. And I hope some of the people that, um, no matter how this vote goes, I hope some of the people that have spoken will step up and volunteer to be a part of the solution as we move forward, no matter what happens. All right, I'm going to turn to Commissioner Parker. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can, uh, can everyone hear me okay? I'm yes. Like, kind of losing my yes, we can. A bit. You hear me all right? Yes. yes. Okay. 
Um, I wanted I wanted to um, thank Commissioner Hamby for bringing forward um, an interesting um, and bold solution to the issue that we face. That is, you know, people are in need of housing. People are in need of stability. Um, I will not be supporting the substitute motion, however, um, for similar reasons as Commissioner uh, Edwards. Um, we've had months to consider how best to tackle this issue. Um, we've had really robust discussions as a body dating back to the summer when we, was, we met, you know, for a retreat on this issue at Bishop Park, um, during which time Commissioner Hamby got up and walked away. Um, and so I'm just, like, very concerned about the nature in which we are making a really big decision about how to address this issue um, um, in contrast to the very detailed reports that we have received from staff and our nonprofit partners on how to proceed with an issue that we have been discussing for months. I do think, however, as Commissioner Hull um, stated, is we can't walk and choose them at the same time. And so I do think this idea is something that we, this idea being that, that what's encapsulated in the substitute motion, is something that we should begin to aggressively consider with, with respect to those in our community for whom an encampment might not be uh, ideal. We do have supports already for families, but we do know that people who may be in recovery or, you know, who have other sorts of barriers that may not make this environment if approved, um, ideal for them, um, need other solutions. And perhaps in a few months we'll, you know, be able to work out how best to go about this solution and be able to trans transition folks into um, an even more stable environment of the kind that Commissioner Hamby has laid out in his substitute motion. And so I hope that as we consider this, this continuum of services that um, are very necessary to help people achieve that permanent stability, that the substitute motion on the floor is considered among those um, among those steps. Um, though I will be supporting the original motion. I'm going to turn to Commissioner Myers. Yeah, I, um, I'm not supporting the substitute motion either, but I want to also just use this opportunity to follow up with a request that Commissioner Thornton made to those in the audience, uh, because I think one of the things that we haven't talked about or we haven't uh, welcomed in here are religious organizations helping out. And I do want to, I know I had talked to someone who has worked with homeless encampments um, and talked about churches, the idea of churches sponsoring homeless encampments, even if they're for six months and moving on to another one. So I, I do, anyone is out here who is affiliated with a church who would like to step up, I would please welcome you to reach out and you, we can, any of us could get you in connection with some of the people who are working right now. Um, I think that would be a wonderful solution, um, and, and I welcome that. All right. Um, we have a substitute motion on the floor, motion from Commissioner Hamby, second from Commissioner Thornton. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you go ahead and call roll on that, please. Hamby? Yes. Davenport? Yes. Parker? No. Link? No. Wright? Yes. Denson? No. Hull? No. Edwards? No. Myers? No. Thornton? Yes. Four yes? No. All right, we, we return then to the original motion. Uh, motion was from Commissioner Hull with a second from Commissioner Link. <clears throat> well, I, I wanted to speak before we had the vote. Uh, Commissioner Edwards, um, go right ahead. I, you know, I've, I've, wrestled with this issue absolutely and i appreciate all the hard work put in by my colleagues commissioner Hull, link denson and others um yet the fact remains that i that i'm simply just not ready to go down this road of creating a a structured encampment i'm i'm certainly intrigued by the idea i'm just not quite there in terms of this is the structure i'd like to go with i i certainly would love to explore uh, other possibilities perhaps with the, with the government uh, transferring property to a provider or entering some other sort of agreement with the provider but i i'm just not there yet when it comes to this specific structure um i, I think we're really close and i i would love to believe that that we can get uh more of the community to behind what we're doing here um so i I move to table this item for 30 days. A motion on the floor to table. I'll second it. A motion from Commissioner Edwards, a second from Commissioner Wright. 
All right. Um, Madam Clerk, if you could uh, go ahead and uh, call roll, please. Yes. Myers? No. Thornton? No. Amby? Yes. Davenport? No. Parker? No. Link? No. Wright? Yes. Denson? No. Poole? No. All Three? Right. Yes, seven, no. All right, we return to the standing motion, then I'm going to go ahead and call the question for Commissioner Hool. There's an ordinance, I think the attorney needs to uh, go to. Can you uh, read the ordinance, please, Attorney Drake? An ordinance to amend the FY 2022 annual operating and capital budget for Athens, Clark County, Georgia, so as to provide funding for expenses related to site improvements for a homeless encampment and a homeless services strategic plan and for other purposes. That's attachment one to the agenda item. Poole? Yes. Edwards? No. Myers? Yes. Thornton? No. Hamby? No. Davenport? No. Parker? Yes. Yeah. Link? Yes. Wright? No. Nope. Denson? Yes. Six? Yes. Four? No. I think it's tied. I'm, I'm sorry. Five? Yes. Five? No. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I'm, I'm going to vote yes, but I want to explain this. Um, we clearly have a dynamic where we have lots of community-wide challenges here, um, and if there was a proposal to have a permanent structured encampment in isolation, and that was the only element of this, that would not be something that I think any member of this body would support. But what's clear is that what's proposed here is a continuum of services to provide a necessary safety valve. Uh, I think as noted earlier, we've heard again and again from members of the community that they're concerned about both public and private spaces being damaged by homeless individuals. And this provides relief to that damage and relief to that challenge. Uh, and I mean safety valve in another context too, and that is a place where people will be able to transition with greater dignity and with sanitation and just basic human need opportunities fulfilled in the sort of classic Maslow hierarchy version of that. Um, and fortunately, we have fantastic partners in this community. A couple of them are here in the room tonight and many others have been mentioned. And I believe it's these partnerships and relying upon those very knowledgeable very expert, very experienced members of the care community that are gonna mean that we do this successfully just as we'll successfully pursue this, um, this long range plan and that we will be able to provide the permanent supportive housing and the case management that's gonna be necessary and that's been necessary for many years. So uh, again, I'm supporting the measure and voting yes. Um, we are uh, moving on uh, to item 28 which is the legislative review report regarding uh, local civil rights legislation. I um, believe uh, Commissioner Wright is chair of the legislative review committee. So I'm going to uh, ask her to begin our conversation tonight. Yeah, thanks. I was losing track of what was next. Sorry. Um, very exciting. We've had this. Um, the legislative review report <laughs> Echo. Um, okay, so about the report, the agenda item has a great, uh, the agenda report as well as the ordinance, I mean, the, the non discrimination ordinance that came out of committee in um, June, I think. Or no, May. Anyway, what we have there is, is there, there's also a commission to find option from Commissioner Parker that has um, a section five and six that the attorneys were um, wanting to add after committee. So that's in there. And we also have the minutes from our last meeting that gives some context. Uh, when we met July 22nd, we approved those minutes. So those have been added since um, our, 20, our, our July 20 meeting. And then there's a commission to find option from um, what was LRC's um, four members of the LRC committee before the January committee was put together. It's Edwards, Thornton, Hamby, and myself. And in that commission to find option, we are asking the mayor to um, assign to LRC the um, mission of 
putting together our human rights committee, community committee, and uh, the mayor has agreed that he wants that done fast. 60 days is what we would like to do with that to get our um, studying underway and bring that forward for the mayor, the, the full commission's consideration and approval. And then also in the agenda report, you'll see where there's an educational toolkit. We took that, um, separated the original mission of, of this topic so that the ordinance could be approved as soon as possible. And um, that will be coming from the manager's office. We'll have a work session on that. And I would hope that that would also give us some insights on how staff would imagine that that committee might work with the educational toolkit. Um, the changes in the commission defined option that um, I'm making a motion that for the commission defined option from Edwards, Hamby, Thornton and Wright, um, we are using the Brookhaven definitions um, in there uh, and where the traditional definitions for the protected classes. We've kept those intact and I think those are the changes on it. So that's my motion. A second. All right, we've got a motion from Commissioner Wright and a second from Commissioner Thornton for the option as defined in the agenda report. I'm gonna to turn to Commissioner Hool. Speak? Commissioner Thornton, did you wanna speak first? Second. No, I, um, I'm good. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, well, glad that we've arrived here. Uh, I would like to make a substitute motion and then I'll speak to why, if I can get a second, that uh, basically uh, is the CDO on the table, but reverts the language around definitions back to what passed unanimously out of committee. Um, so it that was, would be- It was not unanimous. No, it wasn't unanimous. It was not unanimous out of committee. It was 3-2. One of, the, one of the two changes passed 3-2, and then the whole thing passed unanimously out of committee with those changes therein. Uh, the other change was adopted by consensus. Anyhow, uh, and there are minutes attached if people want to read through it. But, uh, so that would just be reverting uh, the definitions, section 620-26, familial status, and 620-215, sexual orientation, back to what passed committee. Uh, so that's my, that's my substitute motion, and I appreciate the work that's gone in around the, the other parts of that CDO. All right, there's a substitute motion from Commissioner Houle. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, Commissioner Link is the seconder. Would you like to make comment? Um, yeah, I just don't see the reasoning behind the CDO. Um, I, I feel like it's, it's somewhat limiting, um, you know, as far as those definitions go. Um, I, I feel like definitions as they appear in what's presented as originally passing out of committee are more inclusive of the groups that we want to assure are not discriminated against. Uh, any further input? Commissioner Edwards? Um, I, uh, I, I will uh, reluctantly not be supporting uh, the motion on the table um, and, and this is why. Uh, we're, we're breaking some new ground here, uh, adopting a non-discrimination ordinance. Um, this has been done, to my knowledge, only twice before in Georgia by Decatur and the city of Brookhaven. And both of those municipalities adopted their provisions quite recently in the past year. Uh, I like the fact that the CDO that I've sponsored mirrors the language of those other two governments, adding strength to the movement here in Georgia for local non-discrimination uh, ordinances. Uh, we haven't had any action from the state, so again, we're seeing it locally. That's sort of been uh, a routine we've grown accustomed to here in athens Clark County. Um, and so I like the security provided by our colleagues in Brookhaven and Decatur. If a court challenge comes to one of these municipalities, will have the fraternity of the other municipalities to fight back and defend it. Um, another, and the final reason is uh, I'm, I'm wary, I'm leery, I'm apprehensive about uh, tinkering with uh, the definition of familial status within our ordinances, primarily because of the, uh, the, the single family ordinance that, that is used uh, in, in my district and in, in other districts, um, uh, often uh, 
there was a situation a, a year ago where an outside investor purchased a home in a neighborhood close to the University of Georgia, put six bedrooms in it and rented it out to the students. Our single family ordinance is, is the only tool in our toolbox to try to prevent that type of zoning use in our in-town neighborhood. So in my district, it's a big concern for me. I have a lot of family neighborhoods or, or just neighborhoods that abut the university and that tool defining the familial status within that ordinance uh, is used. It's our only tool preventing the conversion of the, uh, these neighborhoods into party houses, basically. So I'm, I'm very apprehensive of uh, changing that definition. Um, I, I would be open to changing it down the road on a case-by-case -case basis. If folks have areas that they'd like to suspend the enforcement of that ordinance, I'd be fine with that. But by changing it here, I feel it strikes at the heart of, of the ordinance countywide, and that's just not a tool I'm willing to sacrifice at that moment because it does get used to prevent the development of more party houses in my district. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a, a number of commissioners. I'm going to recognize Commissioner Parker, uh, Commissioner Myers, uh, Davenport, and Denson, and then I'll get those who've spoken already. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll be supporting the substitute motion on the floor uh, with the definitions that we um, we all voted on to exit um, LRC a, a little over a month, I guess a month and a half ago. With regards to the concerns about the legal argument around uh, legally sound definitions. Um, it is uh, it, we picked Brookhaven of many NEOs that exist in the state. Um, Doraville, Clarkston, and Macon Bibb all use uh, definitions of familial status that differ from ours. In Decatur, um, their definition of, of sexual orientation includes pansexuality. In Doraville, Clarkston, and Decatur, um, it also includes asexuality. Um, and so, I think that there's many kinds, different kinds of precedents that exist for being more inclusive with regards to LGBTQ identification in particular. Uh, but that aside, I inquired with the attorney's office about including a savings clause such that if any of these issues, if any of these definitions ever met legal challenge, the rest of the ordinance would still be intact if that would need to be struck at a future date. And so being maximally inclusive today um, uh, does not at all endanger this ordinance as a whole. Um, and so I don't think that's a valid reason for us to not move forward with um, the, the version that we all agreed upon um, in LRC um, at our last meeting and where we passed that of committee. Um, and that's and for that reason, um, I'll be supporting the substitute motion. All right, I've got uh, Commissioner Myers next. Hi, I, I'm um, going to borrow Commissioner Edwards' wording in saying I'm reluctantly not going to be supporting the substitute. Um, I'll put this right out here. I was one of the three who approved the, I get these wording, the wording that came out of the LRC, and then uh, it, that was a three to two uh, vote for that. And part of that reason was those, uh, that was sort of new wording, and I was wanted to be really inclusive and think about that um, and open to that. And I have been, I especially was doing a lot of reading and thinking about it today and legal status. And it really comes down to my concern that this anti-discrimination ordinance not be held up in any way. Um, I support us looking at the definition of family, perhaps developing that and replacing it down the line. Um, I'm concerned that any conflicts in our definitions of family might end up leading to this uh, being a case against this. And perhaps if there was more time to discuss this, I would find out otherwise. But this is the point I'm at right now. Um, I know we have the clauses at the end that have a special name uh, that would uh, that Mariah, uh, Commissioner Parker just referred to, uh, but it's also my understanding that a judge could uh, could say that we could just put the ordinance on hold until that's figured out. Um, and so I don't want to delay that. Uh, we heard people tonight talking about how this has been an ordinance that's been asked for for the last five years. And so because I really want to honor that original commitment, at this point, um, I don't want to go with the new wording, although I am very open to looking at that and how that evolves legally in the future. Turn to Commissioner Davenport. Yeah, um, I will not be supporting the substitute motion as well. I just want um, 
people to realize that the look at the history of where this came from. The fact that black people have been discriminated against downtown, but just because of the hair, because of the clothes they're wearing. Think about all the, the, the LGBTQ plus who were heckled, criticized, ridiculed at gay pride around town. I find it insulting that we will even include familiar status. I understand it, but at the same time, look at the struggles that these marginalized groups that's federally defined as being discriminated against. We've come so far, um, and I, and I, I com uh, commend Commissioner Parker's and Commissioner Hill's efforts, but at the same time, I just don't want to muddy the water for all the efforts and the discrimination that's been happening in our community. So I want to be supporting the substitute motion. Uh, I'm going to turn to Commissioner Denson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, one of the points I wanted to make, uh, Commissioner Parker kind of made already that there's uh, you know, a number of, of NDOs now across the state that use, um, especially when it comes to sexual orientation definition, which that, that one I'm, I'm, I'm all, I don't think we've talked about that as much, but I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about us uh, weakening that one and pulling it back um, while uh, cities such as uh, Decatur and uh, Doraville and Clarkston um, have a more expansive definition of sexual orientation that has been on the books for some time. And when it comes to familial status, uh, Doraville, Clarkston, and uh, Macon Bibbs draft, although that last one was vetoed by the mayor, even though it passed, um, also has a different definition of familial status that is used. Um, and and I, and I understand uh, Commissioner Edwards' uh, concerns around the single family ordinance when it comes to, to housing. The way I look at this, though, is, is a little bit of, I guess, the other side of that coin is that by doing this, it carves out a protection for folks that we don't want discriminated against, which is folks who are in legitimate, intimate relationships, no matter how many partners or who they're, what their partners look like or anything, um, while still giving the ability that to us to to stop and bar party houses from happening, which I think is the real concern here. I don't think, I mean, I don't think, the, I guarantee you, every single one of us, we have, we have families that live in our districts that have multiple loving, intimate partners in them. And I don't think we want anything to happen to those folks. I, I think that's the in, entire intent of us passing a non-discrimination ordinance. We don't want them discriminated against. Um, so I think this carves out, it, and, and, and it carves out some space there for that. And then same thing with sexual orientation. I, I think um, pulling back the definition um, moves us in the opposite the direction that we want to be doing with an, a non-discrimination ordinance, that it doesn't carve out uh, uh, pansexual, asexual, or anybody else that might be outside of that, um, like the Decatur language does. And so um, I, uh, I, I will be supporting the, the substitute motions for that, because I think that those definitions get to the intent of us creating a non-discrimination ordinance in the first part. Outside of that, I want to really appreciate uh, the, the, the LRC for all the work they did. Um, <laughs> obviously, outside of these two differences, I think we're agreeing on everything else, which puts us in a fantastic place. But again, if we're going to take these steps and we're trying to protect folks for a massively different kinds of traits we don't want them discriminated against, I do think that we need to have uh, the definitions that are in the substitute motion. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, I want to address an issue that Commissioner Myers raised with me before, uh, immediately before the meeting. Uh, it related to the section six that we added. All ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict with this ordinance are hereby repealed. And she brought up a good point that we don't want there to be any issue regarding whether this language is actually re repealing uh, the definition of familiar status as set forth in the zoning ordinance. And while I think that's not the case, and I think to avoid that confusion, I would request a, fam a friendly amendment uh, to Section 6 to avoid that issue because I think that's the purpose of, of the uh, Edwards, Hanby, Thornton, Wright, CDO. And that would be to add the following uh, sentence sentences. Uh, Notwithstanding the fore foregoing, all provisions of Title IX of the Code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, related to zoning and development standards are hereby saved from repeal and shall remain in full force and effect. And then just to make sure clerical error is correct, not really a clerical error, clerical error, but we use the word chapter and ordinance interchangeably in this document. I'd like to add the sentence, the, the additional sentence to section six, for purposes, for, for purposes of the provisions of this ordinance as set forth above, the terms chapter and ordinance may be used interchangeably herein. 
So I would request that as a favorite amendment uh, to the Edwards, Hamby, Thornton, and Wright CDO. Thank you. I accept it. Thornton? Yes. You, you, you accept what the attorney I, I has added what, to the section attorney, six yes, on the, yes, the motion? The, tells the original me. motion. Thank yes, you. Yes, and, sir. And, and I, I also appreciate accept that mentioning. in the substitute motion if Commissioner Link. Yes, yes. I, I'll second this acceptance in the substitute. Yeah, I appreciate you pointing that out. That All right. something that, as I thought about, we need to clarify. So, Thank you. So, so it's understood that that's embedded in any of the motions on the floor. Yeah. So the substitute motion does include section five and six, Commissioner Huell? Correct. The substitute motion is only changing the definitions that the CDO changes from the language that left LRC. So my substitute motion still retains all of the language added by the attorney that oh, we're referring okay. to here, sections five and six, and it also retains everything related to the establishment of, or the next step in establishing a human relations commission. Where, where did, where did, where does that, where did that come in? The committee part of your motion? I didn't hear that part. My, my motion was to approve the CDO except reverting the language of those two definitions back to the, the, the language that left LRC. The, the Parker? Okay. I got confused because yeah. there's two commission defined options in the packet. The, the one that's on the table that um, you put for, together. For yeah. clarity, I, I, well, though I inquired about the savings clause, sections five and six, I didn't actually submit a CDO on purpose. I do, do see that it appeared in the packet, but um, that was not my final intent. So I'm actually not sure where that came from. Um, so there's really just one CDO on the board, <laughs> or a CDO and okay. a substitute motion, rather. Okay, I think I'm clear. Okay. Um, any any further comment before we, Commissioner Hu? Yeah, I don't want to belabor the good points made by my colleagues. Although I do hope that that language adjustment from Attorney Drake helps address the concerns around how the definition of family, which is not universal in every city in Georgia, um, will not preclude. Uh, enforcement or retention of our single family ordinance. So I hope that with that amended language, we can move forward with the original language from LRC around familial status and also sexual orientation. Uh, one point I just want to raise up that I feel is very important that hasn't really been elaborated upon yet is that uh, the, the reduced definition says sexual orientation means actual or perceived sexuality, homosexuality, heterosexuality, or bisexuality. And it ends there. It just changed the part that said including but not limited to. Um, I don't see why we would want to limit, I don't see why we'd want to fail to recognize people who have other sexual orientations, pansexual, asexual, omnisexual, however someone chooses to identify. Now in committee, when we discussed this, we talked about whether we wanted to have a longer list or just include that language. And it was adopted by consensus in committee to just use that vaguer language. I am completely open to providing a more comprehensive and longer list if that's the way we need to go to make that section work. So I'm open to that if that's what my colleagues need. But I, I and we can, you know, build off of the language that has been adopted indicator uh, to at least include pansexuality and asexuality. Uh, I just, I, I, I fail to see the logic in that. I appreciate Commissioner Edwards speaking tonight to some of uh, his logic for this, I, I was dismayed that we didn't have any discourse on it in our agenda setting, so now we're just kind of deliberating here tonight. Uh, but I will end on saying that I am uh, very encouraged that we are in agreement about the whole rest of it. Uh, and the last thing I want to speak to is uh, just none of us yet have addressed some of the comments that came from the public about, I guess what I could broadly summarize is what's different if we pass this tonight besides just being uh, words on paper. Uh, the words that we put on paper are legal documents that I do think matter and position us to provide uh, shorter and easier avenues for recourse for people once this law is on the books. Uh, and then I also think an extremely meaningful next step that we're hopefully going to undertake and act on swiftly is the establishment of a human relations commission, which will be uh, an independent body that's you know, citizen-led with people who are uh, representative of the folks that we're trying to serve with this ordinance. And so uh, I, I do think those are some meaningful next steps, even though that still doesn't get us all the way across the finish line to where we need to be. Commissioner Link. Yeah, um, I, I want to address that, um, the, the erasure of the term including but not limited to homosexuality, heterosexuality, or bisexuality. Um, 
I don't know why those words were not were taken out in the CDO. I, I the only thing I can come up with is, you know, people get imaginative about these things being a slippery slope towards bestiality, or I, I don't know. I'm wondering if perhaps those fears could be alleviated by adding the clause um, between consenting adult humans to the end of that definition. <laughs> um, I mean, that, that's the only thing I can imagine as a reason for removing the clause, including but not limited to. Um, I don't know, C Commissioner Hull, would you be um, open to adding those, that short clause to the end of that definition just to provide real clarity here? To be honest, Commissioner, like, I'm open to amending it in whatever way helps us pass a more inclusive de <laughs> definition, but I hesitate to theorize why people want to change it unless we hear from them so i i, I don't want to amend it as you've suggested well, unless yeah, I, I would like to hear to from the, the from, response to people's yeah actual i would like to hear from the, the those who sponsored the cdo about why that was changed and i also want to address the um the familial status and as it pertains to this, the definition of family because that is a, a real issue in my district as well it's primarily an issue in our historic african-american neighborhood that was the zoning was changed to multifamily, which allows for these college party houses. So um, there's nothing we can do about it there. Um, but I, I would like to ask the attorney, you know, this, this idea of having multiple intimate relationships, what would one have to prove if they were to live in a household with multiple unrelated people? What would one have to use, what evidence would one have to provide to prove the intimacy of their relationship? I'm not, I'm not sure I'm following the question of what this is about. Well, you know, the, the fear is, you know, you get a college party house with four or five college kids, and um, they get dinged by the, the uh, no more than two unrelated in a single-family district, um, and, and they would cite this ordinance as, as, being discrim as, as being discriminated against, saying that they have an intimate relationship and they should be considered a family according to this non-discrimination ordinance. But in this definition, the original definition that left committee, it's um, perspective, status is having multiple intimate relationships and or as a parent or legal guardian. The CDO removes that multiple, in, multiple intimate relationships and purely clarifies familial status as parent or legal guardian, guardian to a child or children below the age of 18, blah, blah, blah. I'm just wondering, like, would it hold up in court for a group of college students to claim that they are ha have multiple intimate relationships and are being discriminated against? Well, I, I can't, I don't want to be hypothesizing if I say whether or not that would hold up in court. I, I see what you're saying. You're saying, well, it's going to be very hard for them to make that argument and to overcome the, 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 familial uh, defin status definition that's, as it applies in the zoning ordinance. That's what you're trying to say. Yeah. What I would say is, you know, uh, I think these are it's, it's two different policies here that are being looked at by the commission. Uh, one policy uh, is certainly safer as preserving the, uh, the familial definition that's in the zoning ordinance as it currently stands. Mm -hmm. And that's what I understand Commissioner Wright requested the assistance of assistant attorney uh, uh, Sherry Hines in, 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 in addressing. And I think we, the way it's addressed, we think does a better job from a policy perspective of making sure that the, uh, the, the provision of the zoning ordinance related to uh, uh, the, 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 the def definition of familiar status as it applies <coughs> there is definitely preserved. But there would be some discovery for, you know. There would, and, I mean, anything would be litigated. Yeah. And would those college students, would the landlord have standing, or would it have to, any challenge would have to come from those who are actually supposedly being discriminated against being the college students who might live there? Well, I was, you know, as you said that, I was thinking maybe the business of the whoever, whatever the rental company was yeah. might be involved in dispute in some fashion. But again, you know, I can hypothesize all I want, but the reality is, Commissioner, you know, my, it's my understanding that uh, there was guidance sought from our office related to how best to make sure that that section of the ordinance related to 
uh, in the zoning ordinance related to familiar status was not in any way uh, potentially, potentially uh, might be able to be uh, attacked as a result of this. And I think mm -hmm. this is the best route to that. And it follows what is being done. Uh, I think it's in the Brookhaven okay. ordinance as well. I uh, turn to Commissioner Thornton. I, I think I got somewhere lost in the discussion, and I know that's what we're supposed to be doing is discussing. Um, but I'm kind of feeling a little bit of, you know, even your 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 example was kind of offensive, but um, but um, but but more importantly, past, um, Commissioner Davenport spoke about the folk that have been discriminated against, gays, blacks, and it's almost like nobody even heard him. You know, you're still, you know, it's like what he said does not have no real significance. We're talking about people who have been beat and killed and, 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 and um, it's just, it's, it, it's almost like you're almost taking those tragedies and minimizing it. Now, one thing about um, Attorney Hines, she explained what would be enforceable if we had to go to court. But it seems to me when we get um, legal or, or expert advice, we pick it apart until we mold it to what we personally want. I think Commissioner Davenport made it real clear on why this I'm really getting kind of emotional about it because I know about discrimination on every level. And for us to take this step forward and just try to pick it apart or figure out how we can squeeze, so maybe down the road we will change it to the language you, you want. I, I, I'm ready. Is it time to make a motion? Uh, <laughs> can there's, I? There's, there's a motion on the floor. But, uh, call call uh, the question. We want to go ahead and. Question. <laughs> Well, um, um, I don't even, I'm so confused right now. Call the question. <laughs> All right, uh, we've got a, a motion to call the question. Uh, that, that requires a second and then an assent to call the question. All right, there's a motion to call the question from Commissioner Thornton, second from Commissioner Hamby. All in favor, call the question, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say aye. All right, we're going to go ahead and move, beginning with the substitute motion, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, please do that. I appreciate it, Attorney Drake. In order to amend the code. Ordinances of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, by adopting a new Chapter 6-20, unlawful discrimination in Title VI, licenses and business regulation, and for other lawful purposes. Okay. I believe the, uh, the, the substitute motion uh, was made by Commissioner Houle and seconded by Commissioner Lind. Houle? Yes. Edwards? No. Myers? No. Thornton? No. Hamby? No. Davenport? No. Parker? Yes. Link? Yes. Wright? No. Denson? Yes. Four yes, six no. All right, we now return to the original motion uh, from Commissioner Wright, seconded from Commissioner Thornton. Yes. Yes. Houle? Yes. Edwards? Yes. Myers? Yes. Thornton? Yes. Hamby? Yes. Davenport? Yes. Parker? Yes. Link? Yes. 10 0. All right. Motion carries. All right. Thanks, everyone. And I appreciate the hard work of everybody on this body and uh, more significantly, the hard work of the community in getting us to this point. So th thank you all. All right, we are going to return Six. back <laughs> to ancient history. Item that number eight, my friend. Let's come back. Let's and, come back. Uh, oh my God. and uh And item eight is uh, was removed from the consent agenda. It regards the Downtown Development Authority Community Events Program funding request for FY22. Uh, for context, uh, there was a little bit north of $60,000 provided, um, but there was some unspent money that went back into the uh, hotel motel tax fund from the prior fiscal year, obviously unused in the midst of the pandemic. 
So Commissioner Parker asked for uh, some discussion of this item, and so I'm going to go ahead and ask Commissioner Parker uh, to begin her comments. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as I did last summer, um, you know, uh, in seeking to honor some of our stated commitments to better support black led community events as part of the Black Lives Matter resolution, um, I put forward a CDO then to grant full requested funding to the Hot Corner Festival, the MLK Parade, and to honor Commissioner Wright's request for a friendly amendment to also have Athens Pride uh, funded at its full amount. Um, a lot of those festivals or events got scuttled or rescheduled or were or not perhaps attended at their fullest capacity in the last year and a half given the pandemic. And so I wanted to sort of follow up on that work that we started back then to ensure that as as uh, with downtown events um, receive higher patronage um, as the pandemic hopefully wanes, um, that they have um, the full resources they need to execute those endeavors successfully. Um, and so um, that's essentially what I've done here. My CDO grants an additional, uh, the total of an additional $8,825 to these four, to, um, four downtown community events, um, funding uh, the Hot Corner Festival at $11,000, MLK Day Parade at $4,500, Swedishi Black Market and Caribbean Festival at $5,000, and Athens Pride at $5,325. For a total expenditure of seventy-three thousand eight hundred and twenty-five dollars, so um, just a little bit north of the sixty-five k, sixty-five k, yeah, uh, um, <laughs> that we approved in the FY22 budget. So, um, in the I hope form of a motion, um, motion, I make that motion. Sorry, Russell, I motion that we approve my CDO. Second. And, Second. Uh, yeah, Second. I, I, I All right. look forward to your support. All right, so we have that uh, motion from Commissioner Parker. I have a second from Commissioner Hamby. All right, uh, Commissioner Hamby is the seconder. Would you like to make any further in? No, I'm ready to vote. Okay, all right, we've got a uh, motion from Commissioner Parker, second from Commissioner Hamby. Any further input from the body? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Same sign. All right, hearing none, motion carries. All right, we are moving on uh, to item number 18. Uh, which is the uh, land use agreement regarding the Hickory Street property. Um, and uh, Commissioner Parker, uh, you, you requested discussion of this too, so I'll turn it over to you. Yes, I did. Give me just one second to make sure I can hear you all. Okay. okay. We got you. So um, let's see. Um, with this item, as I think we'll also come up later as we discuss the North Downtown Development Authority and as some speakers came to the podium and discuss earlier this evening. Um, thinking about how we build into these RFP processes, these um, uh, anytime we're working on a big project like this, not only thinking about community benefits in terms of amenities offered, but also thinking about labor standards for the people who are building out these projects. Since you know, we do have a very high poverty, <laughs> uh, high percentage of working poverty in this community and ensuring living and prevailing wages on projects like these is a really great way to, for us to combat that. Um, and on page, on, let's see, page um, two, oh no, I'm sorry. Uh, hang in there with me, y'all. Let's see, it's uh, page 11, item 2C, um, the second paragraph. Um, it states that the authority shall incorporate a living wage category into the RFP for the Hickory Willow Development Project to be a portion of the grading rubric for said project. Uh, in previous discussions around living wages with the Classic Center project as a whole, there have been some discrepancies among, between what we as a commission define as living wage versus what uh, members of the Classic Center Authority have considered a living wage. We've tied it to the uh, MIT calculator, but there's varying uh, levels on that calculator. For, you know, for on one side, like if you are a single individual with no children, if you're living in a two-income household, if you have three kids, and so um, making sure in, in those discussions that we're actually looking at at least $15 an hour. And in fact, if we're talking about construction and other um, industries where they're already paying above a living wage, actually ensure they're paying a prevailing wage. So not um, uh, getting, uh, their, their low, getting the lowest bid because they are paying their workers. They're, cut, they're cutting the corners on labor costs and not paying their workers what they should um, in order for them to get that contract. Um, and so with those, you know, I, I'm happy to move this um, 
forward tonight as is, but in the language around the committee that's going to be evaluating um, the proposals on the basis of that living wage category, um, I was wondering if we could add, um, um, if we skip down a little bit, the review committee shall consist of two members of the Commission of Athens Park County, designated by the mayor, two members of the Class Center Authority, designated by the authority, the manager of the Unified <laughs> Government, the executive director of the authority, and the director of the arena, and if we could add um, two community stakeholders um, representing um, the interests of labor, in, uh, or, or yeah, I guess uh, a labor interest in the community, um, some something like that, so that someone who actually works with labor and economic justice um, from Athens, outside of the government or outside of any of these institutions, can weigh in on that decision, so that um, we actually have a conversation around what a living wage should mean, that is tied to what people are currently pushing for in Athens, and bringing that discussion of prevailing wages as well. So we're also thinking above living wage to what people actually should be receiving in a given industry. Um, I know that's a lot, so I'd be happy to repeat the um, relevant portion. I did it again. Is Russell still there? He probably hates me right now. Um, but I would like to make a, a, a motion is. to approve um, the, the classes in Arena Hickory Street properties. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm trying to. Uh, property land use agreement with the addition and 2C paragraph 2 that the committee consists of um, these members as well as a community stakeholder representing uh, a labor economic justice group. Does that make sense to everyone? So you, you no. wish to add no. to, to the committee that's outlined in the intergovernmental agreement, a member of the yes, community sir. representing labor interest. Yeah. Did you want to add one or two, Commissioner Parker? Oh, come on. Um, I guess, let's see, there's two. I would like two, if possible, yeah. I would like two people representing labor, community labor interest. So, yeah, I make that motion. All right. Uh, motion from Commissioner Parker is there second. Uh, to be appointed by the mayor, appointed by uh, commissioner, whatever. I'm open to hearing feedback from my colleagues. I, my feedback is this. I was criticized earlier for bringing something to the floor at the last minute like this, and this is certainly last minute. It's not that I don't disagree with it, but... You know, I, again, we're sitting here on the floor doing what y'all accused me of doing. I and if we're going to start doing that, I'm fine with it because I like to do that. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but just just let me know what the rules are. All right, uh, I'm going to turn to Commissioner Houle. Um, yeah, I guess I, I'm hoping for clarity from uh, maybe the manager on, I mean, is there any reason why we can't table this to address what I think is a very worthwhile consideration and revisit voting on this next month. I mean, we've got a 44 item agenda. Lord knows we've all tried to dig into every page and I don't think any of us except maybe you, Manager Williams, has actually had time to do that. So uh, is, there, is, there any, is there any reason that we can't table? What are the ramifications of a table? Commissioner Edwards has improved my language. Uh, and yep, you know, and Commissioner, Hull, you know there are the other opportunities too. If if you want to table it to the next meeting, work session, agenda setting session, uh, the voting meeting, that'd be up to y'all. We're voting on something the seventeenth already, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I anticipate we will be. What are the ramifications of tabling this until the seventeenth? Well, uh, I don't think that it, it would change the project substantively. Okay, uh, I'd like to make a motion to table this till the seventeenth. I second it. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Thornton, did you want to make further comments? No, I was going. I was trying to say I finally agree with with something with uh, Commissioner Hull. <laughs> there will be many more, many more. Um, but I second um, it. All right. So there's a motion from Commissioner Hull to table until the 17th. Second from Commissioner Thornton. Any further input? Commissioner Edwards. I'm prepared to support this motion. I just request Commissioner Parker circulate that language to us, so we'll be ready to vote on the 17th. I'd be ready to support it. All right, thank you. Um, all right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any opposed? All right, we'll see this again on the 17th.
All right, uh, moving forward to old business. Item 19 is the Falling Shoals parking prohibition that we've seen a couple times uh, to set up access for emergency vehicles. And Commissioner Davenport, I'm going to go ahead and let you have the floor. All right, so today, um, unfortunately, will be another um, table until the 17th. Um, here's the reason why uh, I sent out um, so that we, uh, the Fallen Shows Homeowners Association, we had a meeting um, the last week of May, early June, um, and a lot of uh, residents expressed that they support the, um, the parking prohibition, but they just wanted a more democratic process and have, um, have their say. Um, and I've been working with Tim Griffith, and I thank staff for their hard work as well as uh, manager Williams. Um, so the Tim Griffin came back with, well staff came back with a, uh, another option. It's something that um, some of the residents have come to um, understand that maybe another option that may be better. And we presented that to the homeowners association and they distribute that information out to the residents that will be impacted. And I got that information Thursday and I have not had time to unfortunately to um dissect that information and get feedback from tim griffith so if you guys do not mind if you just finally this will be done there's, there's no reason to hold it other than just to, to get feedback from staff um so to put it on vote for the 17th all right. second all right so there's a motion from commissioner davenport second from commissioner edwards to table until august 17th any further input all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, hearing none, we'll see this again in a couple of weeks. All right, we're moving on to item number 20. This is the Morton Avenue parking prohibition and uh, very close to Commissioner Wright. And I would like to make a motion that we hold this till the next voting cycle. I did not uh, get my constituent um, feedback that I wanted to, and I'm, I still need to work with staff on the details to communicate. And I appreciate Charlie Barrel coming today um, and Anyway, so motion to hold. All right. All right. Got a motion from Commissioner Wright and a second from Commissioner Edwards to hold until the first Tuesday in September. Yep. Any further input? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We'll see this again in a month. All right. Item 21 is the ordinance amendment establishing a fee for emergency review of special event permit applications. Again, this is done. Uh, recommended by staff to incentivize people to uh, to work with our staff in a timely fashion to plan their events. Move to approve. Second. 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 Please do. I appreciate that. <laughs> Special events and for other purposes. All right. I've got a motion from Commissioner Edwards and a second from Commissioner Thornton to approve. Any further input? I, I just want to Mr. clarify Meyer. something for people listening, that it's important to know that this special event permit is not required for public rallies, marches, protests, and other constitutionally protected activities. And I think that's just important that we all are aware of this. This is an emergency review fee that is going to create a financial incentive for other event sponsors to get their applications in on time so that our, our, uh, commis our, our staff can get all the work that they need to get done done. All right. Thank you for that. All right. Uh, there's a motion from Commissioner Edwards, second from Commissioner Thornton. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. All right. Uh, item number 22 is uh, our first use of a policy that was approved two years ago to incentivize uh, affordable housing by uh, uh, eliminating hookup fees, connection fees for water and sewer program. And this is for the uh, Bernie Mac House at 853 Reese Street uh, by the Athens Land Trust. And uh, staff has indicated that they're creating a framework for this for other providers as well. So, uh, Commissioner Link. Yeah. Um, I'll second that. Um, I, I do. I defer things. to Commissioner Link. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, do, I just have a few things to say um, about the Bernie Mac House. And, and um, this house is a historic home that was owned by. Um, uh, several uh, renowned African American Athenians. It was it was owned by the Max, who were the first African American dentists um, in Athens, and and then it was for a long time owned by Miss Annie Burney, who was a principal of the African American High School, and our Burney Harris um, Lyons Middle School is named after her. 
Um, this house was in danger of being demolished when it became clear that the varsity property was going to be redeveloped. And through much, much um, negotiation, we were able to save it as well as the adjacent residential properties um, and transfer those to Athens Land Trust to assure that they, um, they will remain affordable housing into perpetuity. Um, so th this is um, this waiving of fees is, is a means of um, assuring that 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 housing can be affordable. Um, the, the county is waiving the, these very expensive water and sewer hookup fees. So I'll move to approve, or I guess we've already moved and seconded. All right. So I've got a motion from Commissioner Link and a second from Commissioner Edwards. Any further input, Commissioner Benson? Just a, a quick comment. Thank you, Mayor. Um, because one of the main reasons that we actually passed this. Uh, two years ago now, or three years ago now, two years now, um, was to encourage the creation of affordable housing. And because that's also the intent of our inclusionary housing uh, policy that we were working on, um, I'm really hoping, and, and we're starting to discuss, the, to roll this into that policy so that uh, that idea of affordable housing, which is not defined in this code section really, it comes up to us just deciding if that meets our definition or not, um, we'll have that actual definition that we're working on and again, it could actually maybe take out out the um, uh, the process of somebody having to apply and go through this, while they could possibly do it by right, making it encouraging people to take advantage of this thing when they're trying to create affordable housing. So, um, and and I don't know if that's going to require us to change this code section a little bit if we were to do that, but that's something that I'm hoping that we'll discuss and maybe get some attorneys' feedback on. Thanks, Commissioner, and I appreciate the work that you and Commissioner Park and others are doing. Um, uh, for commissioners who aren't on that group, they're making r really diligent work to move ahead our affordable housing goals in a series of stages. Um, any further input before we call a vote? All right, motion from Commissioner Link, second from Commissioner Edwards. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Moving on to 23, which is a standard process we often go through. It's a request for the exception to our policy and procedure regarding water and sewer service. This is uh, an off-street lot uh, being provided water service uh, uh, that's nearly renovated. So, uh, Commissioner, to approve. Commissioner Link? Uh, I was going to move that we deny this request um, based on the fact that it um, no longer complies with our code. Um, it, the, these houses, um, these were two shotgun houses um, that were demolished and um, they're, they're, the plan is to build two three-bedroom student housing homes on them. And these are far substandard lots. The footprint of the houses pretty much takes up the entire lots. The parking is um, off the lots. It, it's combined with an adjacent lot. A student housing developer came in and bought a house fronting Rock Springs as well as the two um, vacant shotguns behind it. Um, closed the driveway to the adjacent that was used by the adjacent property. Um, if this project were be, to be proposed today, it wouldn't be allowed. It, you would only be allowed to build two bedroom houses on those lots. So um, I'll second your motion. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, got a motion from Commissioner Link, second from yeah. Commissioner Handy. Any further input? Um, uh, Attorney Drake, is this a case where a uh, developer may have uh, accrued vested rights? Mr. Mayor, I'd, I'd like some time to research that. I've not been able to find out more information about what's happened with this, with this property in the past. If there, is there a problem from the staff perspective in doing, getting more time to look at this? Well, I, <clears throat> I think we did address this to some degree in that follow-up report. And um, the staff response to that particular question was the two houses were permitted in March of 2020 prior to the text amendment being approved that reduces bedroom counts. So they have vested rights under the three unit. Parking for 197, 199 will be provided in conjunction with parking for the house that fronts North Rock Springs in a common seven space parking lot. Everything was permitted is what the staff response was to that question. Would, uh, would commissioners feel comfortable tabling this while we can do a little more research? I, I, I just want to note that this, um, when those, when that text amendment was put forward, it was originally intended to be voted on before March, and when COVID hit, it delayed 
that vote. So um, if not for the, on the, the pandemic coming on, these homes would not be allowed to be built with three bedrooms on these, these particular substandard lots. Uh, I'll make a motion to the table. Well, there's a substitute I'll, on the table. Oh. So maybe, maybe Commissioner Link will amend her motion to table to get I some mean, answers. I'll, I'll go ahead and make the motion to table. Let's change my substitute motion to table. I'll, I'll second that. All right, so motion to second to table. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, we'll come back to this. All right, uh, item number 24 uh, regards a SPLOS 2011 project for neighborhood traffic management programming uh, on Boulevard between Chase Street and Barber Street. Uh, any, uh, would anyone like to make a motion on this item? Number 24. Oh, sorry. Turn on you, Commissioner was, Lang. Yeah, sorry. I was having a side conversation with Commissioner Davenport. Yeah, this is Boulevard Speed Tables. Um, I will move that we approve. Um, this has been a long, arduous process um, led by some folks in the neighborhood um, working their butts off. So, you know, our, our um, traffic management program requires some surveying and staff has worked closely with folks in this neighborhood to find the precise optimal location for these speed bumps. Um, you know, there's a lot of challenges with drainage and stop signs and... Um, Second. And, and uh, what do you call them? Oh, Post office boxes. So. Um, I just want to, yeah, I move to approve. Thank you, Mike, for seconding. Thank you, thank you. All right, we've got a motion from Commissioner Link, second from Commissioner Hamby. Any further input? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. All right, we're going to move on to uh, next item on our agenda, which is uh, 25 staff has requested that we table this. Could I get a motion to table? So moved. Second. All right, I've got a motion to table from Commissioner Wright, second from Commissioner Myers. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It, and the, uh, it, the difference between tabling and hold? Uh, well, we, we, we've had some date certain holds, okay. and, and, and this is a table with, without a date certain. Okay, so. thank you. Uh, all right, uh, next item 26 is uh, the SPLOS 2020 Project 2, Affordable Housing North Downtown Proposed Intergovernmental Agreement. Uh, welcome input. Um, I um, want to thank... Um, the dialogue and the questions that we had at our last meeting, I, I, I know that everyone has probably seen the um, um, agree. I, I don't shut my computer down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, that right. uh, Rick Parker has sent us. I think that again there was there was some confusion <laughs> about um, um, community benefits and where they fit in at. But we've cleared that up, um, and what <coughs> some people wanted to do was be in line to make sure we have a community benefits process. I've talked to um, the mayor today, <coughs> and um, he reminded me of the disparity study that we did that opens the door for, it, for that. Um, I think that... Um, Rick and, and the partners went one step more than, than probably necessary because I think that we should be having um, this type of community, uh, a, a, well, a community benefit project um, um, plan for all of our developments, mm -hmm. especially our SPLAS developments. But since it came up and um, since it came up, we're moving forward and um, yeah, we're moving forward, but um, I'm going to make a motion that we accept the uh, recommendations. Motion. I got a motion from Commissioner Thornton, second from Commissioner Wright. Um, uh, I'd like to go ahead and uh, recognize Commissioner Parker. This is good. Good. Oh, oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to further clarify, I guess, some comments that I brought forward at the agenda setting session in, in the hopes of inspiring um, a different kind of framing and a discussion around projects this large in the future. Because uh, I am very appreciative of the work that the Housing Authority did to uh, make their best efforts towards minority uh, business contracting, women contracting of uh, women-owned businesses, of local hiring processes. Um, but I do think it's really important to, in our discussion of 
of these projects not only the, not only um, make room for um, conversation around what amenities you want to see built in, but also who we want, uh, how we want the people building up the project to be treated. Because again, we do have a working property issue in Athens um, to fight for things like prevailing wages on projects like these could do a lot to lift people out of poverty um, to attract, and even in my conversation with Rick Parker last week around uh, focusing solely on minority and women um, business enterprises, is that even if, even by um, lifting up those um, those small firms that might not be always be competitive for contracts like that, we want to make sure we're not doing it at the expense of the workers that are employed by them. We want to make sure that whether you are white or black or or you know or a woman or a man or running a running a business that we contract with, that um, the people that are keeping that business afloat, who are doing the actual labor, are getting paid what they deserve for their participation in that project. Especially if they're getting hired from the local community, that can make such a difference from helping lift a family out of poverty. And so, creating room for those discussions when we look at uh, perhaps with teeth cloth, uh, perhaps with, with future um, iterations or phases of this project as well, um, building in room for that in the public input. It seems like in discussion of you know what we were desired with the horizontal infrastructure with the project concept, um, there wasn't really anywhere for that to like plug in. Um, and so, as with you know, I brought up earlier with the um, the intergovernmental agreement with the Classic Center Authority. Anytime we can, make sure that that is a part of the discussions as well, so that we're supporting the people that make these make these projects happen. You know, whose labor um, makes something like all this affordable housing or the hotel at the Classic Center possible. Um, make sure those people can support their families. Um, and so, let's just keep talking and thinking about that. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and pass. Um, in a governmental agreement. I uh, recognize Commissioner Houle. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a couple questions for the manager. Manager Williams, is this uh, intergovernmental agreement going to apply to the entirety of this project from beginning to end? Is this kind of the one IGA for the whole Bethel redevelopment with the Athens Housing Authority overseeing that? Yes and no. Okay. Uh, it does apply with respect to project management. Uh, the fees of, I think there are five phases that are envisioned. Uh, and so what you're doing is you're contracting through the intergovernmental agreement with the housing authority to provide those, those project management services uh, and, and to, you know, to coordinate the uh, design and construction of the horizontal development. So that's set into place. Uh, it does speak uh, to phase one with regards to, um, well, uh, that's a later agenda item, but the preliminary plans. And so I make that distinction for you to say, that in phase two, they would need to come back to you with preliminary plans. Uh, so the two items tonight together, the IGA is to uh, you know, cement the relationship with them being the lead, and then they'll come back in successive phases for the details. And in phase two, will we have an opportunity to revisit the intergovernmental agreement? Well, I, I guess as a body, I, I don't know that the intergovernmental agreement will come back up for a vote, but as a body, you could always request to revisit an agreement, I, I would suppose, Attorney Drake. Yeah, you could always request that. It's certainly uh, I would be uh, something you could ask. I'm not sure, it's, to be honest with you, what the housing authority expects. They think that they, they expect to be able to work under this agreement moving forward. Okay. Is there any moment in the process that would precipitate us revisiting? This agreement, or is this kind of it? Unless we wanted to invite that. This is intended to be it for the horizontal infrastructure. Typically, you negotiate the contract and you try and determine, you know, all the parameters and guidelines, and and then hopefully you never have to look back at it because everybody does what they're supposed to do. Uh, Commissioner Myers and then Commissioner Thornton again. Just following up on that. Um, this is for the horizontal, but for the phase two, three, and four of the vertical, are there going to be intergovernmental uh, um, agreements on those? Well, there, so this is for the horizontal infrastructure, uh -huh. uh, setting up the framework uh -huh. uh, for uh, phases two, three, and four. Uh, that's correct. But this includes like the demolition and construction yeah. of phase yeah, one. So yeah, we, it, it includes, uh, well, I think y'all had already approved some things with respect to phase one, but basically this 
uh, will allow for the authority to move forward on the North Downtown Athens development project with respect to a, a design, demolition, construction, and project management services for each phase. And as the manager spoke, they'll have to come back to you to check in uh -huh. uh, at, periodically uh, with regards to uh, approving, uh, what, were, what are we approving tonight, Blaine? On the next thing for phase the preliminary one. plans for phase one horizontal infrastructure so they'll come back and you get the preliminary preliminary plans approved yeah. for each successive phase subject to funding availability and uh eventually though they will come back to you uh the, the this intergovernmental agreement says there will be another ij that will come iga mm -hmm. and maybe yeah. more than one related to uh the agreements that we enter into with the uh housing authority and the private development partners related to the vertical construction right. ground leases and things of that nature so there would be opportunity at that point to put in some change language with the uh the hiring or employment that we were talking about tonight i believe but with, we, with respect to the uh uh with, the, with respect to the vertical infrastructure we that 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 discussion can always be had okay i i also just want to make another point and that is that the uh columbia residential the program the pe the people who are organizing this all and planning it and doing all the work um did reach out to me to discuss the sustainability efforts and i just want to thank them and everyone who's been involved in really thinking about sustainability at all uh, parts of this in terms of the orientation of the the buildings the water use and and th really thinking about any sustainability related topics so um, i want to point that out that that's a, a big part of this development return to commissioner thornton and maybe i just need to make sure i understand phase one is the horizontal that's the demolition that's the digging up the grounds wiring and, and all of all of that um that the 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 future phases there will be um, um more opportunities um that that i think that some of the concerns are being raised around that would create those jobs that, that would create some program that would open up some new opportunities but i also want to say that we are um going down this road on this project mm -hmm. but it's much bigger i mean we need to be looking at all of our all splas projects all of our development projects so whatever we're doing we shouldn't be just rubber stamping this we should be thinking of something bigger and how we move forward. So this is just a first step, but I would be really uncomfortable if, if this is the only project that we're going to um, be um, um, kind of tweaking. This should be across the board. So um, um, I hope that we you know, will stay abreast. Um, the staff has always been available to, to folk and so if you have questions, we could get them taken care of. And you may even have some great ideas that they have not thought about. But this is not, this should not be an isolated case. And, and, and that's what I got to say. And, and to your point, Commissioner, you referenced the disparity study earlier. And that undergirds all the work that we can do as, as a hiring and procurement and contracting entity going forward. So. And I wouldn't have even known, I wouldn't have even thought about that until I called the mayor and he explained, you know, he reminded me. And I think a lot of times we make us, um, decisions, you know, right then, and we don't get all the information. So really, we are already heading in that direction for other projects too. So I think we're, we're good. Um, if all of our developments were um, working with us, like the Housing Authority and the partners, I bet you we would have some um, really commendable projects. All right, uh, I've got a motion from Commissioner Thornton, a second from Commissioner Wright. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. And we're gonna move forward to the very related um, phase one infrastructure preliminary plans, item number 27. Is there a motion on this item? I'll make a motion to accept. Second. All right, I've got a motion from Commissioner Denson and a second from Commissioner Edwards. Any further input? All in favor? Oh, uh, apologize. I'm sorry, just, just Andrew Williams. it's such a, a, a meaningful and transformational project. Mm -hmm. I, th there are phases. It's going to be confusing to the average uh, person without a lot of knowledge on it. 
I do want to call out in the agenda item, it does, this first phase will support the vertical uh, construction of 120 units of mixed income housing, uh, 80 of which will be affordable, and that's just the first phase. Uh, so uh, you're going to see some of the buildings come down in the months to come, and then you're going to see new buildings coming up next year, and then other buildings mm -hmm. will come down after that. So it's, it's, it's a tax credit project that the oh, uh, housing uh, authority is very complex financially. They can't do it all at one time, and, uh, and so these are being done in phases, and that's what folks can expect to see at the end of this. Th thanks, Manager Williams. I appreciate you making that point. And this first phase, for members of the public familiar with the, the property, really hugs whole street between Lumpkin and Hoyt Street and includes some of the infrastructure that's going to serve the entirety of the site, including stormwater that, of course, has to be done first. So uh, I think this will probably be in some ways, you know, one of the more stunning pieces. Um, really appreciate our partners at Columbia and Housing Authority and the Rose Company, um, particularly as they've engaged the residents. That's been, I think, a powerful piece of this work. And, and this full right of return for residents is something that I'm really grateful for in, in the way this project is unfolded. Uh, so again, motion from Commissioner Denson, second from Commissioner Edwards. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. And we're going to move on to another LRC report, item 29, regards the prospect of a pilot program uh, regarding uh, some differences in the way that we manage uh, alcohol serving opportunities during special events specifically. And uh, Commissioner Wright, would you like to take this or would you like me to turn it to the Attorney Drake? Um, it might be that I have Assistant Manager Jones help me out oh, with Oh, perfect. It. All right. Um, but what I wanted to do was um, thank everybody for their patience as we got this on the agenda so that we could get public input, and we did. And so we, as a committee, I think, are ready because we meet on Thursday to take the input from this body as well as the public input and um, come back. So I'm making a motion that we send this back to committee with input tonight so that we can build on that um, and the input from the community. And uh, Mr. Mayor, it'd be great if you could have a, a, let us vote on this next Tuesday at the work session, um, if the committee gets it out. And then I wanted Mr. Uh, Assistant Manager Jones to also speak so that those that aren't in the committee um, can share their ideas so that the committee knows the direction. That's great. Okay. Uh, Assistant Manager Jones, if you could just outline how this pilot is prospectively different than what we have right now at our special events. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. So, you know, going back to the charge that you gave, uh, you asked for a number of things, pr primarily flexibility and, you know, uh, the consideration of police officers required. Uh, you know, un under the draft ordinance, there's significant greater flexibility provided as it relates to the size and number of uh, our gathering places. The food requirements, uh, we're, the group decided to keep the language in, in there related to food requirements. The furniture requirements, uh, staff recommended that we just take it out and make it optional. So instead of requiring it, make it optional. And, you know, throughout the process, we wanted to make sure that we consulted with the police department and, you know, really try to balance you know, entertainment and safety. Um, so the police department was a great help. And as we work through this, we really want to consider the impact on them. Um, you know, this is a pilot. We're, we're recommending this is a pilot, so we want to see how it works out. Um, I think a resident mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, policy is not perfect. And um, we, we know this one's not perfect and certainly heard some feedback uh, over, the, over the past couple of days and uh, looking forward to kind of working it out. Thank you, System Manager Jones. All right, so we've got a motion to return this item to committee. Commissioner Houle. Can I just clarify the timeline of this? Because, you know, we do have a major event coming up. So is the plan here to send it to LRC and then bring it back here on the 17th? Yeah, that's okay. what I'm hoping is okay. um, we can get feedback, um, implement and discuss uh, the public input that we asked for and, and bring and, it right back. And I'm glad to bring that back for a vote on uh, on the on, 17th. On if, the 10th. If the committee, yeah, on the, can we just do it on the 10th? Uh, if, if the committee prepares uh, mm -hmm. prepares for our needs, and, and I will say I've heard from right. some downtown business owners who you know, are, are certainly hoping that beyond this pilot we continue to take yeah. a, a look at some of these elements, which I think is going to be necessary. So uh, Commissioner Davenport and then Commissioner Denson. Just one quick comment. Thank you. Um, thank LRC for all your hard work um, and attorneys. So just one quick question on 6-3-B. The event producer will pr pr provide participants with wristbands and approved cups. So I just want to make sure that it's a downtown event that approved cups are recyclable because I'm tired of trash going into District 1. So just 
put that input. You want to speak to that, Carol, Commissioner um, Myers? Um, I I would um I would rather you speak to it later. <laughs> So on the um, on the items we modified it from being a, a designated cup to a um, approved container, so that um, for sustainability, um, a lot of times it's canned beer that's uh, easier to serve, and so that means a koozie could be the designated container that identifies and helps uh, the monitoring and make sure the person has a bracelet while they're in this festival zone and being able to mingle, go to stage, and still have the beverage and not being corralled in the, um, I think what we're calling them now are the special outdoor cafes, previously known as the beer tents. Trying to give some flexibility, freedom as well. And so um, Commissioner Myers formulated that um, container to give us the flexibility there and so that the, they wouldn't have to just take the canned beer poured in a cup, that we could mm. have some modifications there. A modification that we heard was, why did you pick 16 ounce cups? We, we, we have one that it's 20. Committee might say, we don't need to talk about the ounces. It could be that we say, what we didn't want were buckets and double handled, you know, two handed. Now why not commissioner, right? Just, I don't know, I, it's uh, just, but I, 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 uh, you I know, enjoyed we do, a bucket of beer on occasion. We talk huh? about drinking and uh, we're experts at it in LRC and so, um, but anyway, so those are the kind of things we want to uh, address and come back for both next Tuesday. All right. Commissioner Denson. Thank you, Mayor. And I, I, I appreciate this, y'all looking back at this again for LRC doing that. Um, one of the concerns I know I heard was the, um, the festival zones about being able to allow other bars and restaurants to be able to sell also and have those uh, drinks carried out into the festival zone. And I completely understand the concern uh, from some of the uh, event uh, coordinators about potentially a loss in revenue. But if that's going to be pulled back, I guess I would really love to see that maybe just both options available. So I think it could be great to have an option where all bars and restaurants that are adjacent to the festival zone could use it, and then maybe a slightly different version that could be applied for where they didn't. Um, and also just because we haven't got the chance before, I'll throw out there that I would love to see College Square just be an open area all the time anyways, open drinking. So, yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Hu. I like that College Square idea, but I did uh, just want to clarify for anyone in the public who's watching, because we're trying to turn this around quickly. Legislative Review Committee is meeting this Thursday afternoon. We're meeting virtually on WebEx. If you do want to weigh in with any thoughts on how this should go, you know, we've got Twilight and Fest and Rumpus and stuff coming around the corner, um, then please contact those of us on the committee or the whole commission. Um, as soon as possible so that we have that in advance of our meeting on Thursday. Um, feedback we get before that committee meeting is going to go a whole lot further than anything we get after, I think. Uh, and those folks are myself, Commissioner Myers, Thornton, Wright, and uh, Parker. Commissioner Myers. Yeah, and just following up on that quickly, and I, and I may have, um, someone may have pointed this out already um, because I'm getting a little spacey with the late, the late hour. Um, but we did receive uh, about 12 comments that were all basically the same, and I know that I will be using those comments to review on at our Thursday meeting. So for all the people who put that in, be assured that we will look at all the points that were made in those emails. Thanks, Commissioner. All right, there's a motion and a second to return to committee. Any opposed? All right, we'll see this again. Uh, all right, item 31 Mr. is... Mr. Mayor, I move we recess for five minutes. Mm -hmm. Five minutes. Can we make a 10, an, an actual 10? Come on. If I five. recess, oh, I'm going to sit here. in my car go home. All right, I'm, 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 happy for a, I'm happy for a 10 minute recess if it's 10 actual minutes. Yeah, five Earth, minutes. Earth minutes. Earth minutes. 1036. All right. Oh, I have to. We say five. We'll say five. <laughs>
10 seconds. As we return for the last uh, home stretch, uh, my, my, my prediction skills are being questioned by members of the body, rightfully so. Uh, but we are returning to the agenda at item 31. And 31 is an intergovernmental agreement with the Athens Housing Authority to partner on a missing middle study. And this uh, this rose out of the Inclusionary Zoning Task Force, which we're uh, grateful to have two of our affordable housing partners, uh, two planning commissioners and two county commissioners, including uh, Commissioners Parker, who's with us by phone, and Commissioner Denson. So Commissioner Denson, uh, if you want to just briefly describe what this will do. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm just very appreciative of this, that the Athens Housing Authority is going to be partnering with us to be able to uh, scan our code and also our, our, our land use planning uh, and our infrastructure even to try to find ways that we could better encourage affordable housing to be de developed here in athens Clark County and try to find any possible um, policies or code that might be hindering the creation of that affordable housing. Uh, so with this IGA, we'll be coming to agreement with an organization that specializes just in that. And um, I think it's a great step forward, a necessary step forward, and I make a motion to accept. I'll second. I've got a motion from Commissioner Denson, second from Commissioner Link. Any additional input? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, hearing none, motion carries. All right, um, uh, we have four items of new business. I need a motion for suspension of rules. So moved. Second. second. All right, I've got a motion from Commissioner Houle and a second from Commissioner Thornton for suspension of rules. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, rules are suspended. Our first item under suspension of rules is a CDBG CV application that allows us to provide a partnership with the Food Bank of Northeast Georgia so that they can build a larger facility. And so uh, they, they are, of course, already a nonprofit and so not taxed. And the government will simply own the dirt underneath their facility uh, if, if this passes. So, uh, entertain a motion. I, I so move. Second. All right. Any any other input? All right. I've got a motion from Commissioner Thornton. Second from Commissioner uh, Edwards. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Uh, item thirty-three our uh, appointments to various boards, authorities, and commissions. Uh, if I could get a uh, motion and a second, and then uh, upon approval, I'll read those names. Uh, Move to approve. Second. second. All right. Got a motion from Commissioner Edwards. I have a second from Commissioner Myers. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, and uh, I thank those members of the commission who were able to spend time interviewing. We had some fantastic applicants, and they include appointed to the athens Clark Library Board, Stephen Mason, uh, reappointed to the Downtown Development Authority, B.J. Hardy and Dexter Weaver. Appointed to the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities for Region 2, Jill Gambill. Appointed to the Development Authority of ACC, Alan Cleveland. Uh, appointed to the Division of Family and Children's Services, Gail Kurtz, Jeff Turner, and Algernon AC. Uh, and appointed to the Vision Committee, uh, Everard Rutledge. Angela Myers, Susan Winstead, and Antonio Garcia. So thanks to everybody who applied for those positions. We're, we're getting a great wave of applications. In recent waves, I encourage any member of the public to uh, apply when they see those uh, available. You, 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 I think Commissioner Myers are pointing out a name that we need to defer to a, to a future date. Oh, okay, yes. great. Top, top name on the second page, we've got to defer to a future date. Okay, got it. All right. Uh, okay, um, item 43 is an ordinance for the 20th declaration of a local state of emergency related to COVID-19 and for other purposes. And as I think uh, commissioners recognize, this includes a returning to masking in indoor spaces tied to the CDC's high COVID spread metric of 100 cases within one week per 100,000 of the population. So, uh, Commissioner Denson. Thank you, Mayor. 
Um, I'm just going to make a, um, uh, I guess, uh, a question to find option just to add one sentence on there, which I sent out earlier this morning to the body. <coughs> on section 3A, the part that uh, has the mass on there, adding um, a second triggering component that would end uh, the mask mandate of, and this is the language here, um, or when 80% or greater of the athens Clark County population has been fully vaccinated according to the Georgia Department of Public Health. Um, I just want to really be able to attach this mask mandate to one of the things that we're pushing people for, not only to wear masks when they're out in public, um, but also to get vaccinated. So, um, All right. Got a motion from Commissioner Denson and a second from Commissioner Edwards to approve the motion with the small modification that a trigger for uh, ending the mask ordinance would also be when 80% of the population is vaccinated as identified by the Department of Public Health. Uh, uh, any other input from commissioners? I would, Commissioner Edwards. I would just say uh, uh, my, my heart's heavy having to adopt this again, um, but with the Delta variant being as transmissible as chicken pox, uh, the, prim the primary impetus for me to get behind this uh, renewed mask mandate is to uh, provide a rationale for business owners who want to uh, reasonably require their patrons to wear masks. Now they can point to this ordinance as an explanation to avoid conflict with their patrons. And then if a business doesn't, doesn't want to do it, they could simply opt out. So glad, happy to see this move forward and uh, let's flatten the curve once again. But, uh, Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Link. Yeah, um, I want to thank everyone for supporting this. Um, you know, the, the Delta variant is a thousand times more transmissible. And even if you're vaccinated, you still have a very high level of COVID particles in your nasal passages that can be transmitted to others. Um, children are not vaccinated. Um, you know, folks say they don't need to wear their mask because they're not going to get serious COVID. But those around you could. A five-year-old little boy died two weeks ago in North Georgia. He had no pre-existing conditions. His family was unvaccinated. A five-year-old little boy died of COVID. In Louisiana, they're seeing a huge uptick of children in the ICU from COVID. Um, and then there's folks who can't be vaccinated for assorted reasons, for immunocompromised stat statuses. My, my father is vaccinated, but he has a degenerative lung condition and he's on immunosuppressant medications, which keeps him at high risk for COVID. That's why I'm wearing my mask and I'm avoiding crowds. That tonight's scene in here with dozens of non-masked individuals, this is a reason why we need this mask ordinance. It's, it's a shame that so many care so little about their fellow human beings that they won't wear their masks. Um, and, you know, it's really a shame that UGA has not passed a mandatory mask rule on campus. Um, those of us who work on campus are really scared, um, you know, especially those of us who are caregivers for people who are very vulnerable or who have small children. Um, so I'm glad that athens Clark County is taking this step <laughs> and following CDC guidance, following the science, and mandating masks in our own facilities and um, giving others out there in the business world the fallback to um, enforce mask wearing in their, in their facilities. I, I also want to ask that we address um, how we're going to treat this when it comes to our special events that are coming up, because we are going to have crowds. They may be outdoors, but this, this Delta variant is so contagious that it's very likely that these could become super spreader events. So I, I would ask that we mandate mask wearing in these upcoming special events. Um, Thanks. We've got uh, Commissioner Houle and then uh, Commissioner Davenport. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to thank Commissioner Denson for the CDO, although I do feel it's worth noting that if 80% of people are vaccinated, we're extremely unlikely to see the alarming case rate that we have uh, now and that we've dealt with in the past. So uh, hopefully we get those vaccinations up that's really the important thing here the mask mandate is just another stop the bleeding stop gap until we can try to get more people uh protected through a vaccine i did want to clarify that this is going to apply to all acc facilities after we pass it is that correct uh, so. th there's a, a separate administrative uh, order regarding acc facilities uh, Manager williams <clears throat> could you address that 
Yes, uh, and Commissioner, obviously what you would pass tonight applies to all buildings within ACC. Uh, and athens Clark County is a geographic entity. Uh, we have some additional uh, social distancing and uh, uh, mask requirements that are specific to our uh, both the folks that work in our facilities and the residents that visit the facilities as well. And that will go into uh, effect tomorrow morning. Okay, and it's, I appreciate seeing so many folks here mass now, um, but I just want to clarify, so that would include these meetings as well? Yep. The, Correct. Okay. Yep. Uh, Commissioner Davenport. Just quick to the, for the public, um, I miss going to the clubs. I miss hanging out with y'all. Just get vaccinated, just one jab. It doesn't hurt, it's quick. <laughs> um, but I would like to thank um, Clark County School District for, you know, leading um, school to start tomorrow. Um, you know, there's a high transmis transmi yeah, transmission rate within our school system. So I'm glad that Clark County School District, you know, is, is stepping up and requiring masks. But just get vaccinated, folks. Two seconds. That's it. And uh, just before we vote, I also want to note that uh, uh, I've been in uh, very active discussions with the Northeast Health District uh, regarding a vaccine incentive program that they're very excited about. And I think within the next week, we'll be able to announce details of that to, uh, to, to greater support the breadth of our community's vaccination efforts. Um, so we have a, a motion on the floor with the amendment that Commissioner Denson provided. This is an ordinance. Can you read that for me, please, Attorney Drake? declaration of a local state of emergency related to COVID-19 and for other purposes. All right, thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. And we move on to item 44. And 44 is a somewhat related resolution directing the manager to implement a COVID-19 vaccination uh, mandate for ACC Gov employees uh, by September 1st. So, move uh, to approve. I'll second. All right, got a motion from Commissioner Edwards and a second from Commissioner Link. Uh, Commissioner Edwards, did you wish to make any input? Sure, I'll speak to it. Uh, the, um, this, this policy comes on the heels of discussions with uh, Manager Williams and, and Attorney Drake. Uh, we have uh, had a draft of a policy that we shared among the, the colleagues here to uh, consider for our uh, employees of the government, um, but we have decided to uh, defer some to the administrative authority of, of the manager. Uh, we do have a management style of government. So this uh, resolution here is very simple, uh, directs the manager to implement a COVID-19 vaccination mandate for ACC Gov employees uh, to be implemented no later than September 1st. And um, there's various reasons behind it. Um, some of them um, have been coming to light to me uh, the past few days from, from employees with the government you know, um, we're a self-insured government. We all pay into one insurance pool. Some of us have, have gotten vaccinated, therefore protecting ourselves during this pandemic. Uh, others uh, thus far have chosen not to, but those unvaccinated individuals, if they get sick, well, we're all gonna have to pay for that. All the employees of the government are gonna have to pay uh, for that employee's choice. So, um, this has brought some discussion across my desk of, of employees um, a little upset with the un unfairness inherent in that structure and, and, and discussions of how uh, employees who smoke must pay extra for their premium. And, uh, and so I, I think it, it might come to pass very soon that we'll see that uh, employees across the nation who choose not to get vaccinated may very well have to pay surcharges like a smoking surcharge to take part in a pool uh, that, that has insurance. So um, I think that this is gonna be a, a great policy for our community to gain confidence that the government is leading by example. When the community reaches out to, to engage our government, to, to avail themselves of government services, they have a reasonable expectation that that service provider, that that official will not infect them with a pandemic virus. So um, part of this is, is about reinstilling some, some trust and confidence in the government. You know, when somebody picks up the phone and has an emergency, dials 911, they want that expectation that the person who comes to help them will not infect them with the coronavirus. I know that the police and the chief have done a great job already getting folks vaccinated. So 
This uh, policy also points out uh, some of the incentives uh, that are already apparent for employees who get vaccinated. They, they get a, a day of a paid time off. They get a day of leave. Um, as the mayor alluded to, we're also talking with the Board of Health about other uh, vaccination incentives that we can point to. But really, the most important word in this policy is it's a mandate. So uh, again, reinstilling that confidence and trust in our government from the citizenry and, and, and a touch of fairness among our self-insured uh, health insurance policy holders in our government. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Houle. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I know many people are concerned regarding the vaccine um, and they're experiencing hesitancy. Um, you know, what are the long-term effects if you are vaccinated? And that resonates with me a lot. You know, it's, it's hard to jump into something that's been rushed through. It's hard to trust things that have been moved through by giant pharmaceutical corporations that do a lot of shady things. Um, we on this body have had the benefit of being inundated with information about the vaccine, about the virus, hearing from virologists and experts that I do trust and we as a body trust enough, not only to put this forward in good faith, but also everyone on this body is vaccinated. Um, so for what that's worth, um, you know, as a demonstration of our belief that this is a safe thing to do. Um, and I, I generally try to avoid anecdotes and personal connections when I'm arguing for things behind here. Um, but I will share for people listening that uh, I know people who have died who are my age from coronavirus. Multiple people my age who have died from coronavirus. My father was severely ill and in the hospital with it. And most of us at this point have stories of people we know, however intimately. Um, so whatever fears we might feel about the vaccine, I guarantee you that COVID is extremely dangerous. And we also don't know the results of long COVID, but we know that short COVID is deadly. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that long term, you have some really severe problems to deal with as well. So please consider getting vaccinated voluntarily. And if you work for the government, please reach out to us and talk to us about why we think this is a good idea. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Link. I just want to point out that we are simply following in the footsteps of major employers across the state and across the nation. Um, both, our, both our local hospitals have mandated vaccination for their employees. Um, companies such as Google and Disney and Facebook mandate vaccinations. Walmart has even mandated vaccinations for their corporate employees. They don't seem to care about their, their actual retail employees or the customers they serve, but they did mandate for their corporate offices. Um, so this is just a, a, a normal step that we are doing to protect not only our employees, but everyone that they come in contact with. Commissioner Denson. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, yeah, first I just want to uh, uh, thank Commissioner Edwards for uh, his leadership and and getting this moving forward. And um, I mean, just correctly seeing where things were going. I mean, it was just six weeks ago when we were having multiple days of zero cases, one cases. You know, it looked so great. And I don't know if anybody been able to check the numbers that were reported out today, but for Athens Clark County, 84 cases today, 84 new cases. So that's a seven day average now of 252 cases when we were down to, you know, handful, you count on one hand. Um, so we need to get this under control. And I think it is, it is important for us to uh, be mandating for those who can uh, get, the, get the, the vaccine to do so, because there are, as, as Commissioner Link brought up, there are a lot of people who can't for different reasons, you know, compromised or too young to be able to do so now. So we need to make sure that everyone who can do this and has the health to be able to do it, especially if you're a public employee serving the public. That's what we all do here. Um, that we need to make sure that we're also keeping the public safe when we do do that serving. So, thanks, Commissioner Denson and uh, I, Mr. Myers. Oh, I just I just also want to support this and and thank uh, Commissioner Edwards for bringing this up. And um, I I hear our employees. Um, I value our employees. Um, and I trust that Manager Williams will put together a program that respects their work and their fears and encourages them in a positive way. Um, this Delta variant is 50% more contagious than the Alpha variant. Um, and what is it? And, and 
double another variant and such. It's very contagious and numbers are going high. My personal anecdote, which I don't, you know, I'm going to bring up just because it's so relevant, is that I have my daughter who has come from another country where she has not been able to get the vaccine because it's not available to people in her age category. And she came over with her husband and, and child last week, um, tested twice in Morocco negative, was planning to go the next very next morning to get her vaccine here in the United States and instead went in and tested positive for COVID as well as her husband. Um, so I think that we have a, we here in the United States really have an opportunity because everyone can get that vaccine. Um, I urge people to do that. If we commissioners can do anything in the PR for our county employees, we have all had this vaccine. Um, you know, please, Manager Williams, let us know. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and, and while uh, obviously this directs the manager to have a policy in place by September 1st, and that policy thus is not written yet, uh, Manager Williams, I don't know if there's anything you want to provide for our employees or the public broadly about the contours of this. Obviously, we've uh, We've got the benefit of having engaged with other employers, in, including uh, St. Mary's and the Piedmont Athens Regional Hospital. So uh, I'll give you a moment if you want to say anything to that. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that and uh, understand uh, hearing, you know, both sides of that. I think common to some of the more controversial conversations we've had tonight is the role of government and and uh, and it can be viewed in different ways. Uh, but this is certainly i think being done uh from the commission on a you know consistent with uh, safety and business necessity and i appreciate being allowed some time to work through this and hear some employee concerns as well as to uh you know provide for com confidential review process for evaluating exemptions or reasonable accommodation there's there's more to it you know as we we get through all of that and we will do that responsibly and thoughtfully uh, and uh, consistent with the direction uh, of, of the mayor and commission. Thank you, Manager Williams. All right, so we have a, uh, a motion uh, and a second on the floor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, uh, hearing none, motion carries. Mayor, right. if I might. Please. On the previous mask ordinance, uh, I do want to point this out. We have talked about using the new CDC guidance of seven days as opposed to 14 that the previous uh, mask ordinance was anchored to. In the administrative mask ordinance tomorrow, uh, we are linking to the CDC for the uh, seven day reports. And, and, I, and the DPH reports to the CDC, so the, it comes from there, but in the ordinance, I'm sorry, Attorney Drink, for bringing this up now, uh, but I think that that'll be a more consistent uh, for folks to go to if they want to find out what's going on. Uh, I, I would defer to the CDC site. We will here internally. So I just want to bring that up. I don't know if any changes needed, but I wanted to point that out. Appreciate that, Manager Williams. Let me, let me, so you're saying... Uh, I think within the, the draft or the ordinance that was approved, there was a reference to DPH's website for uh, you know, the current um, control, yeah, number of cases or frequency. So you said you'll go, instead of using uh, George Department of Public Health, who, who will you use? We would use the, the CDC uh, website w related to COVID, and they do break down the community characteristics on a county-level basis. By seven days? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's good because, well, I'm willing to... Uh, if we could revisit that, Mr. Mayor, and make that amendment, I'd be willing to do that because I know that I was going to, have to to figure it seven days on Georgia Department of Public Health. You're going to, have to do it manually, basically. They come out the seven day figure. They they run it every, based on every 14 days. They publish it daily. I figured out today how to figure it because y'all put it with that. I didn't realize the CDC did that, so that would make it a lot easier. So move to amend. Yeah, if we could go back to item number. Uh, uh, 43 uh, make amend. a motion first probably make a motion to go back after we uh, get through this agenda item 
I guess. Well, yeah, yeah. So we've done 44. I'm sorry. Uh, you could, could have a motion to return to item 43. Move to return. Second. <laughs> All right. Are we doing your item? Uh, yeah, did y'all? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we, we, we voted on that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 we voted on 44. So, um, motion to return to discussion of item 43 from Commissioner Edwards, second from Commissioner Denson. All in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. All right. Uh, is there a motion to amend item 43 to Move. reference the CDC's seven day metric? Move to amend item 43 to utilize CDC's seven day tracking metric for cases. I did have a question. Yes. Uh, for staff, um, are they repeating at the same pace? Do we get the numbers at the same? Because it's delayed, right? CDC, it's like a 24 hour later or something, I think. Uh, I think the CDC is more timely than the Usually years. it's more timely. It depends yes. on the day. I mean, the, the jump recently was because there was a misreporting on Friday. Yeah. So okay. A lot of this you want to wait a day just because. Right. Yeah. Okay. Just trying to just trying to get some clarification on it. Yeah. So, well, I, okay. I appreciate the marriage pointing out because I, in looking at it today, I noticed it late this afternoon. And I was like, well, how am I going to get seven days? But I figured out how to figure it. But I said that's going to be confusing for the police chief. But now that you know it reports that way. Well, so, and I appreciate it. Assistant Manager Edwards has been tracking the data and was specific about that and caught that. I, I apologize for not having caught it before. Well, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll second the motion. All right. Uh, any further questions about that? All right, uh, it's a motion from Commissioner Edwards and a second from Commissioner Denson for that amended version of number 43. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. So we are moving forward now with the um, kind of final agenda section of the evening, our planning and zoning items. We have uh, Planning Director Brad Griffin who is here, and uh, there is public input individually on each of these items. Uh, is uh, the first one of these? Oh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, item 34, 34 is uh, renaming Carriage Court to Ariel Calloway Avenue. So would anyone like to speak to this item? Item 34, is there any public input on the renaming of Carriage Court to Ariel Calloway Avenue? Good evening, everyone. It's been a long evening. Uh, Roderick Flanagan, um, 243. Sunset um, Drive or Sunset, uh, yeah. Um, just want to speak briefly, I guess, to um, the renaming of, of um, Carriage Court to Ariel Calloway Avenue. Um, as I understand it, the, the family was really adamant about having Thumper on the actual sign. Um, and I, I mean, I didn't know the young lady, and I you know, definitely want to pay my respects to her, her life, and her family. Uh, I was conflicted on whether I would actually speak to this tonight. Um, but definitely just want to shed light on opportunity to engage people that are different, that normally don't engage with local government, and how we respond to their concerns and their needs when they want certain things done in a certain way. Um, it's very, you know, cultural, related to culture. You know, um, there's lyrics in hip hop that reference, uh, you know, Sasha Thumper um, in, in one of the Outkast songs. Um, you know, the, the Bambi movie. I think that's where the nickname Thumper for some people come from. Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a very ingrained cultural thing, you know, for, for people. And so for her to have that nickname, I don't know where she got the nickname from. Uh, that would be a great question to ask the, the mother of the family. Um, but if it's that important to the people, I think we should listen to them, um, you know, as we are moving forward with these type of things. And I feel like if more commissioners were at the DEI training, this, what I'm saying right now will be a little bit more relevant. Um, and hopefully, I'm looking forward to everybody going through their training um, with the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, because this, this, this is what I'm speaking to right now is it, really kind of highlighting some of that thumper. You know, maybe you can put it in the middle of the name, Ariel Thumper or Thumper Calloway. Um, and so I, I, I want to yield the rest of my time, I guess, to pay homage and respect to Ariel Calloway. A moment of silence.
Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? All right, seeing none, I believe this is in Commissioner Wright's district. I'm going to turn it, it over to her. It is, and I am thrilled that we are at this point to um, approve what has been petitioned by a family, a friend of the family, who has been communicating with me and the family about um, honoring R.L. Calloway. She left here uh, way too way too soon for her family and friends, and the community can um, give up a nod to her here with this request that they have asked for uh, carriage court and um, Ariel Calloway her family is um, I spoke with her uncle today and who spoke with the, her his sister who is her mother and they are happy for this to proceed um, with the street name and the street location as it has been submitted. It has gone through the processes, and I did want to get uh, Brad to clarify um, any responses that may have come from the notifications that staff sent out. Yeah, we, we have not had any, I mean, I've not personally had any discussions with anybody um, requesting name change from, from what's coming forward at this point. We did have one family member who I believe was an aunt that spoke at the Planning Commission meeting that actually spoke in opposition and we talked about this at agenda setting but she did recognize the the name in a positive manner that it was her given name that we were going to put on the sign now that's that was just what was said at the planning commission meeting but we have we have not been contacted in the department by family members that were requesting to change it right and and then the notifications that went to the people whose name whose address is changing also, uh, staff didn't get any mm -mm. feedback from that. And then, as you can see from the report, um, there were one, two, three, five people also spoke in favor of it. So I make a motion that we um, do what the family has asked and honor this woman with a street name change. I second it. Uh, there's an ordinance to read. An ordinance to amend the code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, with respect to changing the name of Carriage Court to R.E.L. Callaway Avenue and for other purposes. All right, thank you. And uh, uh, got to turn to Commissioner Parker and then Commissioner Thornton. Uh, was, there a, was there a second to the motion? Th there was a second from Commissioner Thornton. Okay. Yeah, um, I spoke with the petitioner earlier today who said they'd be reaching out to co Commissioner Wright regarding conversation she'd had with the family as well. I spoke with Ms. LaShonda and her daughter Kiki um, on Sunday afternoon. Um, and so I, I'm just, I'm hearing conflicting information still about what the family wants. I mean, I've had my personal experience with them being neighbors of mine um, and talking to them on the phone, um, what they seem to be adamant in requesting um and a willingness for uh this to go back through parts of the planning process in order for that desired outcome to uh come about um and so i'm not really sure what to do at this juncture i i feel inclined not to support the motion on the floor just out of respect for what the family has expressed to me um they they would like that have happen including the petitioner um, Alicia Smith, who I've uh, been in contact with since November of last year, considering this issue, spoke with earlier today, um, who gathered, I think it was 2,000 signatures for in support of mm -hmm. Name the Streets on the Avenue. I just wanted to give the commissioner some of that context as well. And um, I feel, I, I was hoping that uh, that the petitioner was, as she said, she was going to reach out to the commissioner right earlier today to let them know, let her know. Um, where they stood, but I don't want to, um, if that, if that contact didn't happen, I'm not really sure how to move forward. I just wanted to add that initial context. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, well, I, I don't think I'll be supporting the motion on the floor, um, for that reason. Any further input? Commissioner Link? Yeah, um, I just, this is another one of those instances where it would be more helpful if we had a more detailed summary of the Planning Commission discussion. I know that things like this have come up before. You know, when we have citizens speak at the Planning Commission meetings, you just have a for and against column. You don't have any details whatsoever about what their comments were. And often these comments are kind of nuanced. Um, so I just, you know, want to ask the manager if, 
you know, there's any way we could capture some of these comments and some of this discussion with a little more detail in, in the future um, so we can make better decisions when it comes to these, these things. Brad, do you have any? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, this is generally the way we've done it. We've tried to follow the direction of y'all's minutes and the way you present your minutes to the public, too. Um, these meetings were recorded and are available to watch on YouTube, so, so that conversation could be seen. But, you know, certainly we will follow the direction of this group. If you want more detailed minutes, we can provide that. But this is generally the way we've tried to do them. Uh, could I uh, note, uh, Commissioner Hull? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I feel like I'm swimming here in a sea of miscommunication. Uh, I, as I recall, uh, Commissioner Parker was the first to bring this to our attention, and for a long time I was only hearing it referred to as Thumpa Ave until it started to work through the Planning Commission process, and I think there are some dialogues there around um, the character limits on a street sign, which is why we can't do Ariel, Thumpa, Calloway Avenue. It's too many characters for a printing limit. Concerns around quotation marks. That totally makes sense. I've heard no explanation for why we can't just call it Thumpa Ave. And I, I fear that there's been something lost in the communication here around why what was maybe originally pitched as Ariel Thumpa Calloway Avenue, or had it in quotes, uh, a reason to have to change the way it's presented stylistically or reduce the length has then turned into a reason to use a given name instead of the name that most people refer to her as. But the petition says Thumpa Ave. Uh, I watched the Planning Commission meeting. I wasn't able to attend in person, but most of the people speaking in favor of this were referring to it as Thumpa Ave, referring to her as Thumpa, also referring to her name. And I think ultimately people want to honor this person, um, and so they're in support of honoring this person is the impression I get. Uh, and I think we should take really seriously that, you know, the last time we honored somebody, it was for a life that they lived. It was very long. It was a celebration of a long life, and now we're, you know, reckoning with serious issues of gun violence in our community and talking about someone whose life was cut short. And so I'd rather us take time to make sure we get this right. Um, and you know, I guess I'd like to understand the ramifications of holding this item. That's my question to move forward. If we were to hold this item, could we then um, pursue Thumpa Ave instead? And if so, what would that entail? I think you said we'd have to send out new postcards and things, but. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think from from our standpoint there are no ramifications of holding. I, you know, I think you're correct, Commissioner. This did begin um, with a directive from this body to us to process Thumpa Ave, and then it was brought back and changed to Ariel Calloway by this group, and that's what we processed. I mean, from a hold standpoint, this is still operating under the original '92 policy. You know, I think under the new policy that you have now adopted, it will be much more clear because there is a formal application that has to be presented up front. Um, but having said that, I do not see anything in the 92 policy that would, one, require you to send it back to the Planning Commission. I think you could hold it and change it. I would strongly encourage you that if you're going to change it, that we need to send new letters to all of the people because they have been told one thing. <laughs> And we have received very few comments, if any, other than the people that showed up at the meeting um, based on that. So I, I think it would be very concerning if you changed it tonight. Um, but to hold it and direct us, and, and, and I've heard the name a couple ways this evening, so I would also respectfully ask if, if you do that, um, I need to have a spelling for it so we make sure we get it right in the letter. Um, you know, I think it's T-H-U-M-P-A. But I've heard people refer as Thumper to, I and mean, we don't want to miscorrectly spell that when we put it in a letter. So, you know, that would be a motion to hold if that's the desire of this body with the direction that we re notified the 100 applicants that we sent letters to last month. Well, thank you, Brad. I'd like to make that motion to hold then. I don't feel comfortable acting tonight. I'll second. All right, I've got a uh, substitute motion to hold from Commissioner Hool and a second from Commissioner Parker, and uh, I'm going to recognize Commissioner Thornton. 
Um, I don't, this is when I don't have a dog in, in this fight, but I, I was totally confused too after the meeting. And um, I did speak to the uncle today and I, told, and I called Brad just to make sure I had the right information. And I explained that, um, and the mom did say, uh, um, well, let me put it this way. I, I explained it to the uncle, and then the uncle put her mother on the phone, called me back on three-way. And I did tell him that I didn't see no problems if if they wanted to uh, revisit it, but we would have to send out the letters, again, notifying everybody. Um, and I didn't know how long that would take, but that's what I repeated what Brad told me. And then they thought it was going to be on Carriage Lane, but it's Carriage Court. So they were kind of in the, in the dark, but then he texted me um, later on that the, today, and he says, um, and this is Bryant Gant. Hey, Miss Ovita, I tried to call you, but I couldn't get through. It is okay to proceed with the street name and the street location as it's been submitted. That was today. So, um. I, I, you know, I'm... I'm not, like I said, I'm not torn to, to, to one name or the other. I do want to respect the family. I do think there was a lot of people involved, but this is from the uncle after he talked to, matter of fact, he did have her mother on the phone with me also, and, this, and then he sent me this text um, this afternoon. Um, all right, I, I will say just, you know, as we're having this conversation, uh, maybe some group correspondence from the family to the body would be very helpful uh, given I think everybody wants to respectfully honor the, the, the life lived uh, sadly cut short uh, by this woman and, and I think we need to do that appropriately um, got, uh, Commissioner Myers and then Commissioner Parker and then Commissioner Link yeah, I, I support tabling it and I would encourage if somehow I mean, we have communications from Commissioner Wright and Commissioner Parker and Commissioner Thornton and maybe get all those communications together or get some people together so that everyone's on the same page because I think we do want to do the, you know, there's not a rush this is not uh, we're not talking about COVID we're talking about doing something to honor someone and working with their family so um, I hope we can find a way to do that and get everyone on the same page. Oh, and this is not a zoning item that's subject to the procedures of 94, which limits you to a one month hold on any of these items. You know, I, I think this is something you could hold. Not that anybody wants to hold it longer mm -hmm. than that, but you know, I, I think that is that's good advice to you know if we need to send the letters out, but we would much prefer to wait until you all were comfortable and had a discussion with the family and there was clear direction and then direct us to resend them. When we do that, we, you know, the letter at that point where it normally reads, you know, that it will be heard by the planning commission, we would indicate in that letter that, you know, comments would be directed to the mayor and commission and received at their public hearing on whatever date that is for your next upcoming regular meeting. Ms. Neal, I, I don't want to belabor this. Is everybody comfortable holding I'm this? I'm, I'm just curious as to why we wouldn't just send it back to the Planning Commission. If folks want to speak in public, it would be much easier for them to speak in the Planning Commission than to wait around till 1130 at night at one of our meetings. I, I'd, I'd certainly be glad. Email to, us. We just yeah. need an email. And I'd certainly be glad to take this up at the front end of a meeting, uh, you know, given yeah. uh, given the late hour, and, and and I think our desire to get easy access to, to the body. Um, so th there is a substitute motion uh, to table and a second. I have a, I have a question. Quickly, because, because um, so Brad, you're saying it it does it can be on hold. The notification that that you guys send out in your department to the property, um, the people in the property affected by the name change does not have to go back to the Planning Commission? I looked at it again today and I do not see, now certainly if there was a desire to change the street okay. and, and go back to Carriage Lane, then I think we need to start all okay. over from the okay. very beginning. But okay. in this case, I, I, there's nothing in the policy that directs it to have to go back, but it is very important that we re-notify. Okay. 
All right. All right, That's so there's, there's a motion and a second to table, and uh, we, we'll certainly engage the family in, in a way that where we get common communication. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, uh, moving on to item 35. This is the request of Carlton North uh, regarding 115 Grand Ellen Drive, and this also is in uh, Commissioner Wright's district. Is there any member uh, of the public here to speak to item 35, 115 Grand Ellen? Come right on. Good evening. Good evening. Even. I am uh, Carlton Reed North. I live at 1200 Creek Shore Drive in Athens. And I've been developing here since 1985. Some history behind this is we developed that in 1698, which I have a visual aid if you need it, but if not, okay. Uh, so we did that in 96, and I kept 0.1 acres out for future use, which allowed for three bedrooms, which is already platted and approved. Um, I used to live at Ann's Court, and so that's where all this started was way back when. So presently we're trying to build a one home, one home three bedrooms. We we'll work real close with Brad and uh, Rick for almost seven months. And I think we've got every detail just about ironed out as much as I can tell. Uh, so, the home we have is conducive to the area. It fits well and it meets all criteria for ACC. And we're going to landscape it extremely well. Uh, I have included, at my expense, a sidewalk that will wrap the lot frontage and street trees also on to Grand Ellen. So I welcome your support in finishing this project up the way it should be done so that that corner will look great. I got a C in <coughs> speech 101. <laughs> Thank you. We, 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 don't, we don't require any, any training. I haven't, <laughs> <That's good. laughs> I haven't improved any. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Uh, now now we'll, we'll, uh, we'll call you up if commissioners do. Um, any further input on item 35? All right, uh, Commissioner Wright, I'll go ahead and ask you to kick it off. Yeah, I uh, make a motion that we approve it with the conditions that well, were listed from the port from Planning Commission and Planning Department. I'll second. I've got a motion from Commissioner Wright and a second from Commissioner Link. Any further input? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, please read the ordinance, Tommy Drake. I appreciate that. An ordinance to amend the Code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, with respect to amending a plan development for one parcel of land comprising approximately 0 0.18 acres located at 115 Grand Ellen Drive in the RM-1 PD Mixed Density Residential Plan Development District and for other purposes. All right. Uh, again, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. All right, uh, item 36 is a request for the Oak Grove uh, amendment to an existing plan development. Uh, is there any member here uh, interested in speaking to 36? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Scott Haynes. I work for WA Engineering. I'm here on behalf of the Oak Grove Area LLC. Um, here tonight with a very simple request just to remove the condition from the existing um, PD that restricts the signage for the property to CN standards. The property is uh, under an underlying CG designation and we just seek to be able to do signage under that designation. Um, we're really excited about this project to bring a grocery store out to this location and to see the remainder of the Oak Grove development finally uh, come to fruition. Um, thank you all for your time tonight. I'll keep it short. And if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Thanks. Thank you for coming to speak to us. Uh, Anyone else here to speak to item 36? Uh, Commissioner Denson, this is in your district. Uh, yeah, as I think this one's pretty uh, cut and dry, as was mentioned, this is simply removing a, uh, a self-appointed uh, restriction. It's moving this towards uh, signage to being allowed under commercial general. I think it makes sense, and I, uh, I move to accept. Sir, sir. Got a motion from Commissioner Denson, second from Commissioner Houle. Uh, can you read the ordinance, please, Attorney Drake? Russell. Oh, I'm sorry, it's from Commissioner Edwards. Second was Edwards. You ready, Mr. Mayor? 
Yes. An ordinance to amend the Code of athens Clark County, Georgia, with respect to amending a plan development for two parcels of land comprising approximately 52.89 acres located at 102 Lavender Road and 6045 Jefferson Road in the CGPD Commercial General Plan Development District and for other purposes. All right. Thank you, Attorney Drake. All right. Uh, any further input? All right. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. All right, we are uh, moving across the street. Um, th there, there has been a request to allow withdrawal uh, for item 37, but because this has been advertised, I need to see if there's anybody interested in speaking to this item. And hearing none, uh, uh, Commissioner Denson, uh, would you like to make a motion to uh, accept a request to withdraw? Yes, I, uh, I make a motion for us to accept the withdrawal. I'll second. All right. Got a motion from Commissioner Denson, second from Commissioner Link. Any further input? All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. All right. We are moving forward to item number 38 um, regarding 281 Rivercliff and 2465 Tallahassee Road. Is there anyone here to speak to that item? I know you already go home. I just want to introduce myself. I'm Kate Blaine. I'm an owner with Nancy Stengel of this land, and I just wanted to let you know I'm here if you have any questions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. Anyone else here to speak to this item? All right. This, uh, interestingly, is in District 5 and 6. Uh, I know, uh, Commissioner Hull, you're recusing yourself from this item. Um, yeah, so I'll turn to Commissioner Denson. Just keep them coming. Uh, yeah, I, I, I appreciate uh, uh, Nancy Stangle and Kate Blaine uh, for uh, making this move so we could be uh, conserving this uh, beautiful green space that's going to benefit uh, the parks of that area and the entire community. So I make a motion to approve. I second. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the first is uh, the future land use. So can you make a motion to amend the future land use? I make a motion use? to accept the future land use now. I second. All right, and uh, can we read the ordinance, Attorney Drake? An ordinance to amend the Code of athens Clark County, Georgia, with respect to amending the official future development map of athens Clark County by changing the designation of two parcels of land comprising approximately 82.63 acres located at 281 Rivercliff Drive and 2465 Tallahassee Road from single family residential to rural and for other purposes. All right, any further input on future land use? All right, uh, Commissioner Edwards. Uh, proud to support this. This this is really a, an admirable move taken by this landowner to protect some beautiful land. So, thank you. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? All right. Uh, we we need another vote for uh, for the rezoning. I, I make a motion for us to approve the rezoning. And uh, you need an ordinance. An ordinance to amend the Code of athens Clark County, Georgia, with respect to rezoning two parcels of land comprising approximately 82.63 acres located at 281 Rivercliff Drive and 2465 Tallahassee Road from RS25 single family residential and AR agricultural residential to AR agricultural residential and for other purposes. Second. Is there a motion from Commissioner Denson? Second from yep. Commissioner Edwards. Is that mm -hmm. correct? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. All right, we're uh, moving forward to item 39. Is there anyone here to speak to item 39, 295 Tallahassee Road? All right, seeing none, this is in District 6. So I'm gonna turn to Commissioner Hull. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to accept the recommendations from the Planning Commission, including the conditions that they've outlined in the document. Um, and if I get a second, I just wanted to make second. two quick notes. All right. Um, for anybody who's concerned, because I know a lot of residents who live along Tallahassee are, um, just like to point them to the notes in the report that uh, point to there being a minimal impact on traffic. I know that's a major concern for a lot of people along Tallahassee um, because the peak hours of this are going to be on Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings. And also that the addition that they're proposing here isn't going to encroach on any of the neighbors there. Those are concerns I've heard generally in the area, although not specifically about this item. So with that, motion to approve. 
Uh, uh, can we the ordinance, please, Attorney Drake? An ordinance to amend the Code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, with respect to special use approval in the RS-8 single family residential district on a parcel of land comprised of approximately 15.05 acres, located at 295 Tallahassee Road and for other purposes. All right. Uh, got a motion from Commissioner Houle. Is there a second? Second from Commissioner Myers. All right. Any further input? All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Hearing none, motion carries. All right. Uh, last zoning item for the evening is 155 and 305 West Park Drive. Anyone here to speak to this item? Good evening. I'm Brett Thurman. I live at 160 West Thompson Street, Bogart, Georgia, and uh, I work for Armstrong Matheny Thurman here in Athens, and I represent the uh, owners and developers at the uh, subject parcel. Um, I just want to say real quick, it's late, and uh, my owner worked really hard with the, um, the, uh, the homeowners in Somerville. They expressed an interest when we first started this project. We had a lot of interest in just doing one building residential and leaving the other building commercial. And while we were working with them, they said, you know, what we really like is just having all residential development here with no more commercial. So we went ahead and made that adjustment and we worked with them, both the homeowners and the, uh, the architectural review board in order to come up with a development that fits within the, the uh, tenor and the tone of the development and matches a lot of the architecture there. I think we came out with a really good product and we received that unanimous decision for the planning commission. I hope that you too will vote unanimously to approve it as well. Thank you. Thank you for coming to speak to us tonight. Is there anyone else here to speak to item number 40? regarding West Park Drive. All right, seeing none, uh, this is in District 10, so I'm gonna sure. turn to Commissioner Hamby. Thank you, Mayor. And, uh, and certainly appreciate the work that's been done um, by, the, by the petitioner and, and uh, the developer in, um, in presenting a good product. I would like, however, to hold this for uh, uh, 30 days till our next meeting, simply because I just wanna make sure the residents around there, they certainly do agree with the residential component of it. And I want to make sure, you know, as, as staff has pointed out in the um, in the uh, staff report, you know, several of the several there were three letters I think submitted to the to with the application report, and they refer to townhomes and owner occupied housing. And I just want to make sure that uh, for the residents around there uh, that we get some clarification on that and that they understand what's going on there. I don't anticipate any any difficulties with that. Uh, I also am mindful of the. Uh, uh, massive project that's going on uh, across the street uh, from this property and the realignment of Jennings Mill Road. So there's a lot, there's a lot happening within this neighborhood. Uh, so I just want to, I just want to make sure we cross our T's and dot our I's on this. And I appreciate the extra hold on this for for that. So make a motion to hold. Second. All right, there's a motion to hold from Commissioner Hamby. Second from Commissioner Edwards. Any further input? All, right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. All right, uh, now is that opportunity for resident input on any item not on the agenda tonight. And so the same rules of input apply. Uh, you have uh, three minutes, and uh, the light on Clerk Spratlin's desk will indicate when you have 30 seconds left and then when your time is up. Accepted. Y'all don't get to go home yet. Um, let's talk about the auditor. Do you know why an internal auditor requires independence? Anybody? Has anyone here read the International St Standards for the Professional Practice of Internal Auditing? Anybody <laughs> familiar with the federal guidelines known as the generally accepted government audit standards? No one. Do you know who does? The internal auditor. The international, the international standards in section 1100 states 
Independence is the freedom from conditions that threaten the ability of the internal audit activity to carry out internal audit responsibilities in an unbiased manner. The internal audit activity must be free from interference in determining the scope of internal auditing, performing work, and communicating results. There are only two commissioners who have stood up for internal auditor Stephanie Maddox. That is Commissioner Link and Commissioner Thornton. Stephanie Maddox has reported internal threats from the mayor and the county manager. I have filed a criminal complaint with the solicitor. It is currently being reviewed by the prosecuting attorney to the Council of Georgia. The commission has abandoned its internal auditor. She has time and time again requested to create formal standards for the audit committee a committee that has nothing but a charge, a charge determined by the mayor. The internal auditor needs to be restructured in the charter and the code of ordinances because she does not currently enjoy the independence that is required by the federal guidelines. In the coming weeks, I'm going to show you how that's going to happen. And you are going to listen to us. Because the internal auditor is to follow the money. And there's a lot of money in this, in this government that isn't being followed. Thank you for joining us this evening. I, too, want to speak um, in support of the auditor. Uh, Broderick Flanagan, 243 Sunset Drive. Um, I've been in a situation before where I've been talked in a certain type of way to my uh, superior, um, and it doesn't feel great. I had a conversation with him about it the first time it happened, and you know he assured me that it wouldn't happen again. Well, it actually happened again, so I walked off the job. So I want to say I commend our city auditor for stepping up, telling her story, and her testimony publicly. Um, and I encourage other people to come up forward and do the same. Um, I remember once when I came to City Hall, uh, Manager Blaine Williams pulled me to the side after he got an alert about a video posted on uh, social media uh, that talked about or alluded to violence. And so he asked me about the video, you know, in, in a candid conversation in, in the hallway, right here in this building. And I answered all his questions and whatnot and, and assured him that I don't, I don't, I don't condone that type of activity. You know, I don't, I don't participate in any of that. And so I'm, I'm highly disappointed to hear these allegations coming forward after he addresses me in that manner. Same thing for you too, Mayor Gertz. Um, and so I, I do support the auditor's office being restructured. Now, if this was a performance issue and her performance was declining, then reprimand, reprimand her back then before the, the, 18th, the uh, October 18th incident happened. If this was just solely a performance issue and she was doing things that was out of character, out of the job, the scope of you know, her responsibility, then let it be that. Um, why go to her office and talk to her in an intimidating way for submitting a lawful open records request? That caused the question other other activities and other things. Um, you know, and then to add on insult onto injury, you're gonna add a workload that is impossible for her to complete with the current staff and situation that she has right now. You're setting her up for failure. And so unless you're gonna properly support her office and take care of those things and get her the proper support and staff, adequate staff, competent staff that she needs to, to, to complete three audits a year, then we need to uh, you know, have a conversation about restructuring that whole process. Um, for now, I guess that's, that's all I'll speak to of the situation, and I hope you guys listen to what we're saying, because these are serious uh, issues. Thank you for coming to speak to us.
Hey, how y'all doing? Um, my name is Quaris Franklin, the founder of NYM, mentoring young men. Um, as we can see, like, um, with our youth right now, they're getting killed. We have the name Street South Arm. Um, and I actually was a young man, was raised in an environment with drugs and gang violence and a lot of stuff was going on. And so we have a program, a 12-month program that kids can go to, like, um, one month we might teach them honesty, the next month respect, the next month integrity. And all our training, the guys got to have background checks, and our training is done by the Air Force. And we see, I see a lot of programs going on that's been failing the youth. It's like so many programs, but they've been failing. But I have a blueprint on how to go to the community and how to save these young guys before they get caught up in gang, before they get, you know, manipulated while they're young, you know, before they get caught up in um, drug trafficking and all that. I have a blueprint that can reach the youth. All I'm asking you guys is for is support. You know, it's to look into what I, what I have come up with. Um, it's not only just an just idea, it's a solution to all the problems. A lot of stuff is going on, and I can believe it can go from state to state, to city to city. Because as, as I said, I was once a young man, had to go to boot camps, and fortunately I don't have those, the boot camps no more. But I haven't learned a lot when I did go. So now I'm going back to the streets and getting the youth. So I'm just asking you guys for support. Um, Cause it's like it's crazy out there. It's a fire out there. So, and so we, we got guys that housing their life and giving all to go behind the youth and to teach them and to build relationships with them, showing that they can trust us, showing that that we love them. And so it's NYM mentoring young men. Thank you for coming to speak to us tonight. All righty. Good afternoon. My name is Asia, and um, I live in Athens. Uh, Georgia. I'm actually in uh, District 9, which I've um, spoken to Mariah about. I've actually had opportunity to speak with um, uh, Miss Carol and uh, Mrs. Thornton over the time, but I'm also um, a part of NYM, and uh, we're under the umbrella of United Community Outreach. And I've been here majority of the day and had an opportunity to spend time with you guys. And there's a quote that says that it's better to build strong children than to repair broken men. And um, I heard a lot of um, talk about the homeless and a lot of other issues, but not enough talk about the youth and the young people. And um, uh, there, there's a there's there's a crisis going on in our in our in our community. A lot of young people are dying week after week. Um, I believe it was just last week that a 17 year old, um, you know had a gun and shot down someone just here within our community so we're seeing a continual um problem with our youth and we need to um be able to direct some of our attention and some of our focus to that um over the last couple of months I've, we've been in several meetings talking about um the allocation of the american rescue um funding and the executive order and how is that how is that funding going to be allocated um is it going to go toward the minorities or are we going to like i've heard today continue to support the same nonprofits that have been supported year after year but we're not really seeing the change that we're looking to see in our community. And I think that at this point, we're not just looking for change, but we're looking for transformation. Um, we're not really looking to deal with the fruit of the issues because I think a lot of the stuff that we're seeing are fruit. We're not really getting to the root of the problem. And um, one thing that our programs direct is really directing the, the attention towards the mind and the heart of the kids that we are reaching. Um, because I believe that if we build up things around them without building them up, all they're gonna, you know, if their mindset and their, their, their heart hasn't changed, they'll end up destroying the very thing that we build for them. So a lot of our uh, programs are directed toward that. And um, as Quaris mentioned, we definitely need the support of you all as commissioners. I know that I'm, um, I've talked to several commissioners one-on-one, uh, -on -one, um, but as we're looking at how to allocate these funds, we definitely need the funding, we need the support, and um, thank you for your time and your support. Asia, for the record, can I get your last name? Asia Thomas. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else here to speak with us this evening? Good evening. I'm Barbara Benson. I reside at 235 DeBose Avenue, uh, 30601. And I uh, am the secretary for the Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement. Um, very involved with that organization. I attended the June 8th press release that was hosted by AADM 
and it was on behalf of Auditor Maddox to um, be able to listen to um, concerns that she shared about um, on-the-job um, experiences, and I was very concerned about the gender and racial discrimination, intimidation, interference, retaliation concerns that I heard. And so, um, consequently, I am asking um, your support of the restructuring of the audit auditor's office um, with a separate audit commission that will enable Auditor Maddox to be more, uh, to have more greater freedom and independence. Thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate you coming tonight. Um, hello, Mayor and Commission. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm Fred Smith. I live at uh, 425 Rivermont Road. And I'm really here to kind of echo what Ms. Thomas and Mr. Frazier said uh, in reference to uh, the funding that has come to Athens, Clark County uh, as a result of COVID-19, et cetera, and to urge you to um, use those funding to help the community uh, as they are uh, defined in the legislation. Um, um, and as they said, uh, and as you know, uh, there is quite a crisis in the community. Uh, when it comes to youth, when it comes to housing, et cetera, and these funding, these funds uh, do uh, provide an opportunity to be transformative. Uh, it's a lot of money and, uh, and uh, greater flexibility than, than is uh, generally given with, with, with these funding. And so I ask that you, uh, that you do the right thing uh, because, again, uh, there's so much uh, hurt and pain. Uh, there was hurt and pain in in our communities uh, before COVID-19, before the pandemic, and so now it's even uh, been multiplied, uh, maybe a thousandfold. So I ask that you uh, you know give some some great uh, priority to these concerns and and move forward. With, uh, with due speed. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you coming tonight. Is there anyone else here to speak with us? Um, hello again. Um, I want to first appreciate the folks who are here in support of youth um, and in using some funding to provide opportunities for um, youth to find restoration, I guess, and to really be, begin those processes of healing our community. I'm also here in support of Auditor Stephanie Maddox, um, and I also commend you for being brave and being here, because um, you didn't have to do either of those things. Um, so every person should feel safe in their workplace, and what is considered safe is both intuitive and also something that must be co-created with consent by all persons involved. So when a harm is committed, and especially when an employee feels threatened, as Ms. Maddox has felt in this case, and they have been aggressed upon, then my first instinct is, is to suggest that we need to take a restorative approach to address this harm. So that would mean that we, one, acknowledge and own that harm was caused, and this would be done by uh, Manager Williams and Mayor Gertz, and perhaps by the members of the Mayor and Commission who have yet to show support publicly of uh, your position with Stephanie, uh, you know, of Stephanie Maddox's position and, and in acknowledging the, that harm was caused. So first, acknowledging that harm was caused, and then secondly, listening to what the community and Stephanie and the community behind Stephanie are suggesting are solutions to redressing this harm and can also prevent other employees from having to experience that harm in the future. Um, and so some of the solutions that have been listed today were to um, restructure the auditor's office, a citizen-only independent audit commission with an explicit auditing charter and bylaws to serve as her direct supervisor, at least two full-time assistant auditors, unrestricted access to all government matters, compliance with federal auditing standards, a whistleblower hotline, a publicly searchable exponential database, and regular full audits of the manager's office and SPLOST and T-SPLOST. Um, so listening to the solutions and then creating a plan, so number three, to enact these suggestions and these solutions and to be held accountable by each other 
um, as a governing body, and then also potentially by maybe a third party facilitator. Um, I'm just thinking about, I worked as a, or I was trained as a restorative justice facilitator by the Georgia Conflict Center. And this is the, the kind of approach that we take when conflict is, is caused in schools or at very personal levels. And I think that we can apply this to workplaces. Um, but ultimately we can't do anything until y'all acknowledge that you caused harm and y'all acknowledge that you do not want to do this to another employee and that you do not want to further cause any more harm onto Stephanie. Um, and starting from there and then moving towards those solutions. So thank you for your time. And again, thank you, Stephanie, for being here and being brave. Thank you for coming this evening. Is there anyone else here to speak to us tonight? All right. Um, just uh, very briefly, um, requesting that LRC members uh, very rapidly move through that revision of the special events alcohol service pilot. Uh, so that can return to this body ahead of any events that may happen this fall. And, and if you will uh, double up and simultaneously work on the composition of the Human Rights or Civil Rights Committee, so that also can return to us um, within the next two cycles. And, and I never do this, and I very much apologize, but I have to sign the emergency order by midnight. And so I'm going to go to my office to print that and sign it. And I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, uh, ask uh, first the manager, the attorney, and the auditor if they have any input, and then if we can begin with uh, Commissioner Davenport and end with Commissioner Myers. Uh, other than uh, some of the grants that are in the packet and the uh, purchasing reports, I have no report. I have no report. I have a couple of things this evening. I want to thank the individuals that came out to support me this evening. And I also want to notify everyone that the audit of the fleet management program, as well as the audit of the animal services program, has is complete and will be disseminated to the manager's office, the audit department, as well as the audit committee tomorrow. That's all I have. Um, real quick. Um, actually, this is going to be, well, I want to thank the police department for the innovation in the mental health crisis team. I think Banner Harrow did a wonderful piece on them. I think our police department don't get enough credit for the, the awesome work that they do. So I do want to thank the HEC police department and also our first responders. Um, August 14, August 15th, Sunday, August 15th from 4 to 6 at Winterville Auditorium Community Center. Um, it's Winterville Charter Day, the day they were founded. They're going to celebrate um, their first annual Charter Day. So August 15th from 4 to 6 at the Winterville um, Auditorium. And also I'd like to thank Joanne Snow for her um, decades of service at the Winterville Community Center. She's just recently retired after decades of service. Um, thanks, Juana Johnson, for her, her um, continued um, work in the community. And just want to welcome everybody back to school and to be safe. Um, yeah, I'm. I want to thank everybody for supporting. Oh, I'm here still. So. Oh, sorry. All right. It's all, all good. Right. I know. Um, I uh, so I'll be quick. I uh, wanted to let people know that the Juneteenth celebration in South of Islands March that was scheduled for Juneteenth on the block, aka Triangle Plaza, 585 Pine Street, been rescheduled to this Saturday from 2 to 6 p.m. So stop by, there'll be performers, vendors, and you know, marching for as um, Q and Asia came out and spoke to you, the need for us to collaboratively brainstorm and work together to end uh, gun violence in the community. I also wanted to let people know about the Tease Bluff workshop this Saturday from 9 to 1 at Lake Park. Um, for folks that need help workshopping their proposals for two spots, that deadline's coming up pretty quick, so I'd recommend if you're interested in that <laughs> to take advantage of that opportunity. And then I would also like to request the mayor assigned to LRC um, a li the living wage policy um, so that we can um, have the you know, policy on the books indicating what is living wage here in sport so we can. Um, it, it, each successive budget kind of keep up with inflation, cost of living increases, et cetera, in a, in a um, systematic way. Um, and that's it for me. Uh, thank you all. And appreciate your patience with me tonight as I battle whatever sickness I'm dealing with that uh, has got me feeling a little down. But yeah, that's it. 
Um, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for supporting the mask mandate. And, um, I just want to ask the manager if there's a plan out there for enforcement and, and PR um, to assure that the public knows that this mandate, that this ordinance is in place. Um, we've got, you know, 30-something thousand UGA students that are going to be swarming us in the next few days if they haven't already. And uh, we really need to get the word out to them because there is no mandate on campus, so they're under the belief that they can go naked face everywhere. Well, my understanding is that this is reverting back to the policy that we had before with regards to uh, indoor um, buildings indoors across athens Clark County. Uh, I know in the earlier iteration, uh, for instance, the masks were required social distancing in lines outside. I don't believe that's part of this. Uh, so that, I just want to be clear that that won't be going on. You know, with regards to the university buildings, those are state-owned buildings, and I don't think that our ordinances apply to those. Uh, so uh, we would look to the university to, to provide their own, you know, mass requirements there. Uh, I, I think that the what this version reverts to is, again, what we had before, and that was replete with the governor's constraints on it as far as a $25 fine and a warning and things of that nature. So when that happens, our police will follow those guidelines as he did before. Will there be any outreach to businesses to let them know that we've passed this ordinance and they can can call on the local government to support them in um, enforcing masks in their in their establishments? I mean, we'll, we'll make the uh, announcements through the traditional channels as we have before, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just have a few things to try to be quick. Uh, first is for anyone who might still be watching, uh, there is a District 6 development coming before the Planning Commission this Thursday uh, at an intersection I've had a lot of people write to me about, which is at the Loop. The Q There's a proposed QT going in there on Atlanta Highway. Um, I want to echo Commissioner Parker and reiterate my request of past months to uh, ask the mayor, who hopefully sees this later, that uh, a living wage policy be assigned to our committee, LRC, any committee, but uh, we'll take it. I'm happy to do it. Um, and for that living wage policy to uh, give us an opportunity to take what we, the good work we've done in the budget uh, and you know save us having to do that every year and uh, let us apply a policy that we can roll over year to year, tying what we're paying as a base wage to something like the MIT living wage calculator for all employees and also exploring how that can apply to contractors and other agencies that we partner with. Um, and to, at the same time, uh, build in some of the HR uh, considerations that I know many of us are interested in, such as parental leave. Um, and a second assignment I would like to request of the mayor, echoing my request of last month as well, is for us to explore impact fees. Uh, it's something that hasn't been looked at for, I think, a, about a decade or more, uh, but is something we can legally do. It's a way to get money from developers to provide community benefits in a way that might make more sense for the community rather than stuffing it into their own individual lots in ways that may not really actually provide as much community benefit. Um, and and uh, the last thing, I, I just feel compelled to respond to many of the folks who spoke tonight. I know there's been a lot of dialogue in the community and it's it's weird to be in the position we're in as commissioners and, and be silent uh, on a matter that's uh, of deep concern for good reason to a lot of people. And um, there's no real good way to elaborate on an investigation that's still not complete. And I honestly feel like it's uh, unethical and certainly, you know, the legal advice is clear that we can't speak to personnel matters surrounding, surrounding you know, the terms of someone's contract. Um, it's really for the benefit of everybody, including the person under the contract. Uh, that said, I, I hear you know, this desire for a restorative approach, and I do hope that there is a way that we can move forward in that fashion. Um, I think that requires a dialogue that probably can't happen as fully as it needs to until the investigation is complete, and I hope that that'll be very soon. Um, and, and from there, uh, I hope that we really can find a meaningful way to, to dialogue about something more substantive than me just kind of speaking vaguely right here. Um, I, I appreciate the concerns that y'all are sharing. I think if I were in your position, you know, where I've been for many years before getting back here, I'd have a lot of question marks and exclamation points floating around my head in the cloud around what the heck is going on. And unfortunately, uh, 
you know, I, I also appreciate Audrey Maddox speaking publicly. Um, you know, I think that that's a, a good exercise of one's rights. Uh, I think, unfortunately, it just doesn't change the position that I and my colleagues are in around what we can say at this time. Um, but I do support the obvious need for us to re-examine how the auditor's office is, is structured to make sure that we're more functional moving forward as a government in a way that is transparent and beneficial to the community. And, uh, and I'm sorry to the community and to everyone, including Auditor Maddox, for how long this has taken for us to get to the next step. Um, with that said, the last thing I want to say is there's no way to hold our colleagues accountable besides each other, uh, but I find it quite disrespectful that four people left the room during public comment. We had people stay here through our entire meeting to share thoughts and to think that we couldn't afford an extra 20 minutes to hear them is frankly insulting uh, to them and to the rest of us who stick around. Somebody on this body needs to be here. We don't, we don't even have a quorum right now, y'all. So, I mean, they're not even here to hear it, but uh, maybe they'll watch this later or hear about it. I think that that's shameful, the, the early departure during people's comment, so. Um, thanks uh, to the folks who uh, came tonight and, and, and it's like we got all the, the mask wearing responsible folks out there. <laughs> Closing it down with us, and uh, I, I appreciate your thoughtfulness because you know being in this small chamber, you know we we certainly were nervous, you know, as the meeting opened and all of these folks without masks came in. So you know, thank you to the folks who who did wear a mask and and do recognize that this is a a serious virus that is dangerous. With that in mind, um, school starts tomorrow. My son's going to be in second grade at. Barrow Elementary and uh, let's all lift up our hearts and wish for a safe school year for all our kids and a meaningful education experience. Uh, I was really happy to see the Clark County School District mandate masks for everyone. That definitely gave me a sense of security and safety knowing that uh, my son would be uh, protected. Uh, as much as possible. So I, I really want to salute the school district for taking taking the right step, being courageous, following the science, following public health. You know, they're unique in that regard when looking at some of the surrounding school districts. I know I made the right choice to send my child to Clark County Schools. So <coughs> let's uh, let's hope the best for all the kids to have a great school year. Thanks so much, everybody. And uh, I'll follow up by wishing all those uh, kids uh, a happy first day. Well, I'm also wishing one of my constituents a happy birthday to Natalie Tony on her 95th birthday. Her, her uh, neighbors reached out to me. And I'd ask anyone else, especially the mayor, to sign this card that I'm going to hand deliver to her. Um, later this week. I also want to tell all of those, um, I, I sort of want to echo um, Commissioner Houle's comments and uh, really basically say that all of you who did come out to speak about your concerns about the auditor and the auditor's office, that I hear what you're saying, I'm thinking about it and I'm reflecting on it with all everything else that I'm hearing. Um, I was really thrilled to hear about the, the audits coming out as well. That was really good. Um, I also want to comment and say special thanks to, to Crystal Colbrin and Sayla Gardner and the Inclusion Office for the equity uh, retreat that we had last week. Um, and, and I do want to explain that it was put on the schedule fairly late. And so um, I know and I hope, <laughs> I know that many of my fellow commissioners would have liked to have been there for the two days and I encourage them um, as we move forward to get involved with these discussions. Um, I was a little bit, you know, I was a little bit, you know, wondering how uh, fuzzy it would be. Um, I was very convinced by the end that it was very worthwhile um, of experience and, and really grounded me in the work that we want to do going forth. Um, for those who are there, will this will bring a smile to your face, perhaps uh, to me. Uh, but that the closing the gap, or maybe it's Crystal who will bring a smile to her face, that that we really emphasized.
the importance in this community of working to close the gap on inequities. That was a phrase she wanted us to have and that we all agreed on in our community in a just and fair way. Um, and, I, and I think to kind of wrap that up with listening to all of you, we had some, we had some uh, big pieces of paper on the wall with things that were really important. And one of them, what that was one of the most important things is to think about who we're listening to and what populations are impacted by decisions we're making. Um, so I, for the public comment to me is really important. Um, I was really happy that Chorus and, and Asia came out and spoke about the youth development work. I know that um, Mayor Gertz has also worked with, talked some with our uh, the school district that we want to be discussing that and how we can uh, work together on that. Um, anyway, that's that's sort of it, and I guess I'm the last one, so I can make a to motion adjourn. to adjourn. Could, or maybe I should talk. Oh, it's after 12. So okay, let's make the, the motion to adjourn. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Myers, second from yeah. Commissioner Edwards. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. All right. <laughs>